taught me how to do tap. I was not convinced. And so I was not doing it. The only problem is uh, whatever they said, keeping umbilical, doing a tap. And uh, some, there are limitations, low place umbilical, scar tissues, recurrent hernias, large reducible hernias, difficult to work on uh, here. So I shifted my camera to the empicastic port. Then I found that it gives a wider view of the lower abdomen, including pelvis. So extended groin dissection possible. And uh, so that means any type of hernia, one can make it up uh, easily dissecting it. Because it is a triangulation, gives a two-hand technique to work on. Now you can look at, this is, uh, I think the, I, will, I will go, this is not the, this particular thing. And I will go next one. Ah. So but personal experience is started, I moved on like this. And uh, this is where bilateral trocar uh, tip when I moved. And uh, my current technique, I was not convinced. Do look also with the various needle, I'm not happy about it. It's technically difficult to do. And uh, over three years, when I was doing a tap, I learned the anatomy well, so that I started a tip approach uh, from 95 onwards, placing the trocar between the rectus muscle and the post rectus sheath by open approach. And uh, this, uh, again, uh, bilateral trocars. It gives a triangulation effect, similar to tap approach, I, I could treat any type of um, groin hernia. It is a large irreducible hernia or uh, difficult or recurrent or femoral hernia, anything I can deal well, and even including a side a sliding hernias. So that one gave me a more confidence to work on. And uh, I did not uh, name it as a tab. In this uh, e tab, and in fact, keeping a subumbilical trucker and uh, camera working, I can go working both myopectal orifice from anterior right side to left side, entire thing, anteriorly, arcuate level, posteriorly, whatever the dissection want to do, I can do. And uh, see, th this is a way something gives a very extended groin dissection. Many times I have demonstrated, in fact, a couple of weeks also, I shown this how to be done. Entire groin, that means primary groin hernia, entire thing can be dissected and the camera is at the umbilicus. And further extension also feasible, you want to go laterally, I can go, including genitus fascia and so on. And uh, <clears throat> this is where here, the limitations, the difficulty, it was there in the tap, which here, no problem. I can all the type of low place umbilicus, or respective recurrent hernias, no problem, we can go ahead. And uh, now, uh, people who are doing the midline subumbilical trocar, like mm -hmm. McCarnan, they were finding difficult in these circumstances. They considered limitations. So one group like me going with a tap with a key, keeping epigastric trocar and two working trocars, no problem. No, but here, tap when I moved, keeping umbilicus and the trocar, but lateral trocars. So triangulation. I maintain I could do it. Midline trocars, there was difficult. Many people in the Western were doing this. Then finally they found and uh, George Dees describe the extended you know, heat type approach for a ground hernia keeping the camera high up more than more uh, higher level and uh, any hernia if you treat one needs a maximum horizontally 18 centimeters even a large and vertically 12 centimeters that is uh, approachable by my own technique and here let me go for uh, this and uh, two hand technique i published uh, long and he published uh, george this here and between him and these, here the camera in the higher level, entry and <coughs> open technique, balloon dissection, rectus space dissection, and the same side, uh, initially he make it a same side trocars, and difficult to handle. Subsequently, opposite side, he puts one more trocar doing it, fourth one. E-tip groin dissection is better than tip with the subumbilical midline trocars, no doubt about it. But ETEP currently is very popular among the hernia group, but still this number of people adopted, I'm finding is still lesser. And compare my personal technique and the George D's here, initially, of course, open technique, I don't use a balloon. It is extra facial dissection. And normally peritoneal rent or this never happens here, no bleeding because controlled vision, we see like. So ports are triangulation, straight away I'm putting it working trocar either side. So all type of hernia I can do, I can do extended dissection, mesh, whatever the size one needs a groin, irrespective size, up to 18 one can use. Easier technique, general surgeons can learn easily, cost effective, cheaper, no balloon, no, no disposal trocars. So it is another form of ETEP, 
and this I have been doing since '95. I didn't name it a ETAP, and it, it is a, another form of uh, surgery can be there. So this is uh, before going. I want to say, putting a trocar. These are all the uh, now wiring a cost. Now you can see my tro camera. See tip lying between the rectus sheath and rectus muscle. See this is a post rectus sheath, and uh, this is uh, it is. Subsequently, see you can see the tro working trocar. I'm making it at the linear semilunaris, then working it. Similarly, the uh, the other side also, I'm making a trocar and uh, I'm placing the mesh. You can see my two hand working it. One can work well, complete, want to suture or not. See, this is left hand and the right hand one can do like a bilateral also can go anyway. And now I'll let me go. And this two hand technique also, we published our technique a long time. I call it two hand in, uh, rather than each. Time. So, abdominal corn hernia, the current concept is there are sometimes primary ground hernias or umbilical hernia and can come. I will recommend ETEP is the best way, like uh, George Dees who described that particular one. But primary hernias, I recommend the camera at the umbilicus. And midline uh, hernias, suprabibic, perumbilical, epigastric, all can be dealt. ETEP is the best. And the large size, one may need a tar. Lateral wall hernias, posterior hernias, all can be done ETEP day. That means almost all abdominal wall. Here, the most important anatomy of the wall. It is muscular layers at differential origin and insertion. Neovascular bundles insertion allows division of one or two muscles at ascendant points without injuring the neurovascular bundles. And in the abdominal wall, there are certain areas, differential fat distribution. And we know the facial attachments making into compartmentalization by breaking the uh, 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 facial attachments one uh, one space to another space we can reach uh, like in like uh, space of red seas you can reach the space of bograss from the bograss we can reach the other areas like you now i'll be showing it when it is so transient spatial between the peritone and muscular wall is preferred for mesh placement and uh, as far as possible we should not be a pre-peritoneal it should be extra facial transient spatial and uh, that plane if we keep it the trend and the peritoneum can be avoided easier uh, wherever it is a retromuscular plane is the for uh, this one. And uh, ETEP, uh, we described uh, the suturing at the roof. People consider this a little difficult, but now everybody learned they can do it without any problem. And uh, port placement tailored according to the hernial type. Anatomy is more important. I think this is where lapro suturing hernia personal experience. And from the beginning in 92 onwards, we had started closing for all the cases. So when we moved to a tab, I was closing the peritoneal flap, fixing the mesh against suture. Similarly, AVR, reconstruction of the post rectal sheath uh, or linear alba and suturing is uh, more effectively can be done. So this is where people to be trained, you know. And uh, this I think in a while I will go for it. Mm. And uh, this is IPOM plus, which we described, had shown that suturing defect is more important. See, this is where uh, IPOM plus, for example, and uh, I use, you know, like open surgery, I was using a loop with the lung and uh, making it. And finally, this is the same type of suturing, only we are going to use it. Subsequently, over which we can place a mesh. And midline hernias, uh, defect closure, I and uh, it is described and shown very life and operation textbook also described. We published this and hernia journals. And Cook later appreciated this so much and he named it I plus. And uh, that has become the standard of care for uh, ETEP. And the linear alba, divarication, recti, if it is there, need to be correct in order to improve the abdominal wall function and also to prevent the recurrence. And uh, here, I will just to show how this is uh, uh, done. But here we take, including the peritoneum, we take it uh, multiple sutures, right to left and uh, uh, left, right. Finally, full, it approximates linear alba, narrowed, and finally, we place a mesh. And the, those days with I was using regular uh, non-absorbed sutures. Now we have a very good you know, barbed sutures. You can see multiple way it is nicely holding it. And uh, 15 centimeters defect one can. It was a live demonstration done. And the same plication only we take it for a ETEP also. See now in the final approximate it's nice suture for a purpose. And uh, diastasis recti, which I've shown, published also this. 
And now I'll come for a talk today's uh, extraperitoneal repair each for ventral hernia. And this is one of the largest series, 254 cases we published our series. And uh, the anatomy, most important things we understand, this differential fat distribution. And the midline, always between the peritoneum and the linear alba, you can have some amount of peritoneum except umbilicus. If you go uh, zipoid process, uh, here it will be a, what we call a fatty triangle of cords. And uh, here, space of rhizius, and uh, here there will be a, a intermediate fascia separating this from Bogra space. This A space you can work on laterally as much as possible, but again, diaphragm will be attached. And uh, this is where the lemur semulinaris attachment we know, so that any one bottom up goes, both dissection have come to this, tar can be done very well, or we can make it a tar cutting it. I will show the video I have. And here again, you can appreciate this uh, post active formation. Posterior it is a fibrous. Laterally, again, the nerve uh, installment will be at the line itself. But as it goes, the nerve comes in between 0.5 centimeters medially. As it goes, when the muscle comes, almost comes in the middle of this. But during dissection, we will be identifying the nerve bundles. We don't cut. But matter modification described here in order to avoid it now. That also uh, accepted. We can do it. Now, now look at here. This is the original description cutting the muscular component of the post rectal sheath. But here you can see the nerve enters the rectus uh, muscle uh, well away. This is the transverse abdominal muscle, transverse abdominal fascia, post rectal sheath. So you should not go and endure and take it half a centimeter, cut this fascia and come to this plane, then tar can be done well. So modif madrid modification is in order to avoid nerve injury, goes here. Uh, all the time we post sheath without dividing the muscular. But now we can divide the muscle, nothing harm, provided we see the nerve bundles, don't cut it, it is easily visible, eh? no problem. And we published our series comparison of diapoem plus ETEP, and uh, I'm in favor of ETEP. But of course, both are standard, and this is where description will go for video. And uh, so here. And uh, there are two types bottom up, uh, up, down and technically demanding, that's why many surgeons still struggling and uh, because no triangulation effect many times. And uh, see, each tip, midline hernia, lateral ports, I'm going to describe that the video I will show, then appreciation. Now you look at this uh, video and uh, I'm showing the marking point. Eh? This is initial entry and Excel trocar, I'm using it. I use a zero degree telescope, putting it to and under visible guidance, and nicely splits the uh, fatty, then anterior sheath, the rectus muscle. The post rectus sheath is nice, visible by glazing appearance. Don't push it a little more fast, it goes in the peripheral cavity. Then by turning this direction of this, and uh, so you can aerial tissues nicely. Then it is zero telescope, blunt this forward, backward, some separation. Then I'm uh, making a 5 mm trocar, and this is a camera trocar going to be there. One can use any energy source, their own convenience. And the bipolar also can be used, ligature, harmonic. See, now you can appreciate, I reached the pubic uh, ramus there. And now I'm working the lower port. I change it to 10 mm camera. And the low, lower working trocar. Now you can see post the sheet. And, um, and this towards the costal margin. If it needs to be done up to the point, you can do it. This triangulation effect gives you entire midline can be approached. Now you can see post sheath muscular component. Eh? Now I'm starting. This is a point is 0.5 centimeters away from the linear somewhere it is better. If you go more, we go, you will go into the peritoneal cavity. If you more and close to the muscle, then you go to the subcutaneous plane. So one make a one neck and see the muscle, then continue division. If you see subcutaneous fat, then uh, cut a different place. Don't go on cutting it. Now this is, you can appreciate the other side of the post rectal sheets. We are taking it using a hook. Hook is a very good instrument working it or any joints can go. So we reach the right lateral linear semilunaris. Now we go and the epigastric trocar, I'm using it the ligature or energy source and other talk will work on. Now you can see most of the time, I'll be working with the two hand with the triangulation effect. That's why inside bowel uh, irreducible hernia or not, we can reduce it, we can take the momentum, everything. Now you see there is irreducible component. And in fact, which I was showing uh, uh, last time on a uh, life surgery, 
and that uh, great momentum where the contents was not coming and uh, finally we are able to make it uh, cutting really and able to reduce it now you can see this external uh, fat tissues momentum has to be taken out uh, otherwise uh, necrosis and uh, seroma infection is a uh, possible so this was a uh, surgery i think you all remember would have seen in the online and i showed uh, a massive lens eh? and i think uh, gandhi was there uh, jignesh was there time we also see so now I'm going down, taking the posterior right and left rectus sheath from the linea alba. And we try to avoid uh, cutting the linea alba and uh, then go up to the, this one. Now you can see the dropping of this uh, lower component of the, the wall from separating. Now we reach almost uh, sympathesis with PB center ramus. So after this dissection, we reconstruct the posterior wall. This is a view some surgeon says necessary, some surgeon not necessary. And uh, surgeon since uh, they want to close only the peritoneum. And peritoneal rent alone switching it, it is a problem during straining calf and they can rupture and uh, hernia can recur. And post exercise is always I'll do it. If I can't switch the post exercise approximation, I'll go for tar. Now you can look at, I'm reaching the upper and this is a B-lock absorbable and uh, same suture approximating it and now just uh, finishing it at the anterior abdominal wall and at this stage we cut and remove this that first excel trocar which i'm using it i only use it for removal of the suture or placing suture mesh everything now reconstruction in alba we go with the ppt non-absorbable very very nice a strata fix also johnson johnson available now three four companies have started making and this and this is a very strong needle nice way one can do approximating and here we correct the defect hernial defect also a divarication we plug it and there are 45 centimeters length it easily comes most now you can see the linea alba it is wider and we'll go here So now finally, after reconstruction of the linea alba, we go, we will fold the mesh like this, then take a two stitch so that we can unfold easily inside. Uh, particularly when we take a 30 centimeter length and taking inside is difficult. Now this type of uh, tie on either side makes a difference. So now we can appreciate this drainage not necessary because it was shown, uh, just I mentioned it. Now this is a camera trocar. Uh, this is a fine end, right hand. This is left hand. This is the first trocar which I made it. And we passed through this working trocar. This is only a uh, marked one. It's not a trocar place. Trocar was here and here, here. And this is just ink marking which I made it. Through this trocar, I passed drainage. And bottom up, you want to right handed, uh, left handed surgeons can stand on the right side. Similar port can be made. They work on like it all depends on the surgeons. And this is a triangulation I found more comfortable. And um, thin dubbed abdominal wall uh, where a uh, defect closure divarication is uh, very important. And uh, that gives a uh, tension in the muscle that uh, it is uh, not a um, abnormal tension, it is a physiological tension. Then the, initially when I started showing a defect closure in the 98, 99, 2000, everybody said, oh, this is a tension free repair, this is wrong way of suturing the defect. I you know when open surgery, when we're doing the same, that's why I adapted finally, and Japanese people studied it, it, this physiological tension improves the function of the abdominal wall, even by growth of the lateral wall. There is where and the component separation made when it is a the capacity is less. External component separation with eye pump, uh, we can do it composite mesh, and uh, here. Uh, external component separation, post sheet you can release additionally. Again, we can place a composite mesh. It is like a only a pump plus. But when we go retract this um, tar, then uh, we, you know, like a pump plus standard way, but we can use a polypropyl mesh by switching defect. And uh, external component separation is uh, various type has been described open all, but uh, there are two different techniques endoscopic they describe. I'm going to show the external component separation with personal approach. And um, see, look at this again, I showed the live that day. And uh, you can see 
costal margin above 4 5 centimeters and you can appreciate that is more and now you can see look at and the same way what i do i send excel trocar only i'm using it and i'm making incision and i my dissection goes between the scarpus fascia and the uh, external oblique aponeurosis see look at and then we remove the operator and uh, pass the scope we even can change it to a so far i was doing as 10 and a zero degree now you can change it to zero at 30 degree now you can see i'm just hooking it and you don't see subcutaneous fat huh? most of these people all describe subcutaneous fat huh? subcutaneous fat if you go seroma more and that's why no need so now we can widely dissect here laterally as much and go if you see any nose bundle and don't cut it leave it after all we need only see now we're starting dividing the external oblique aponeurosis and with the same hook now you can see if you see rectus muscle that means you are more medial and uh, and laterally, it is always between the internal oblique, external oblique, the fibro fatty tissues. You can see nicely. See now, and uh, this, we can continue this division up to uh, inguinal ligament. The complete uh, division can be done well. And uh, see now. No, and I, I think it is. Uh, so now, again, subcutaneous and this is scarpus fascia and this, externally you can go laterally well. And you have both dissection on either side of the external oblique of neurosis. That is possible by this approach. So wider um, uh, no, uh, component separation, we are creating it. And see, now it's almost a small segment is there completely. And now, laterally also and over the costal margin, then go inside, you have the space and you can reduce the contents and uh, uh, close it, then finally place a mesh. Eh? And uh, this is actually life surgery I showed last time. Okay, then placing a mesh here. This is I from like so. And now I'm come to the final and uh, we do a okay, this. This is part of posterior partial compound separation. Eh? This. And loss of domain, and we need injection Botox or uh, Nemo Protonium, Botox injection better. I classify in the lateral abdominal walls depending on the type 2, type 3 or not. That means the defect, whether it is the involving the linear lemma similaris or not. Second thing, posterior lumbar. Port placement varies accordingly. And I will show here, this is any defect involving the linear lumbar opposite, go to the opposite side, take the uh, midline go to this side that is better this is an nephrectomy done in that particular case you can see here and uh, i'll go to this see now i'm i'm performing a tar i'm reaching the, at the site of the defect now that defect has to be open now see i'm releasing it and the sac outside is there if it could be excised you can excise it eh? then finally Posterior, uh, we, we close this uh, with the absorbable. Uh, now, anterior also, no, I think the defect, uh, anterior also closed, then placing the mesh here. See, you can see there, it is I closed that. Subsequently, I found some weakness, so I placating the muscle again using the sutures here. And this repair was done with, before uh, barbed suture came in. And we are using regular proline PATS and uh, here you can see here. And that means the bulge will not be there. The another type is if it is a lateral and away from linear similarities, need not go make it here, make it a port uh, closer to the midline but uh, away so that we can make a tar, one side tar, we can go make it up and a small video clip. And if it is a posterior, then we can change or accordingly go. Now you can see this one uh, posterior lumbar hernia just to show. Actually, the traumatic bone graft has been done and uh, bowel injury, peritonitis was there at that time. Then uh, the patient came here. It is one of the doctors and you can see the defect. This is the most difficult one that also can be done. Now you can see we are going laterally. That fat distribution helps here to take it up. I'm going bottom up, so taking down. You can see here.
and see now i will be reaching the defect now you can appreciate here one side down is a bone the other side is a muscle and we have to take it down upper quadrate lumborum dine soas ilius must be exposed completely see now posterior and uh, that dissection must be complete otherwise mesh you cannot lie and complete now the defect i'm taking the periosteum and the muscle and with using a bar suture non absorbable and then you can see the mesh placing it then one or two sutures not necessary but still just shown so this where so now it is uh, all types of uh, abdominal wall uh, e tip can be done well but only thing question it comes whether laparoscopic robotic some group of surgeons promoting robotic american brought a book on robotic hernia surgery every chapter in robotic if anybody sees that book then everybody is say robotic is the best way and both are uh, good te technology laparoscopic robotic but there's very common problem poor people and uh, today and any type of hernia laparoscopy can be done well there is no doubt about it only port placement and how we have to learn and that way doing it it is fine and the cost will be lesser in laparoscope and widely can be done and the training if a proper that is fine and uh, accordingly technology can make i don't want to talk more about even our friends there of some of you are more in favor of robotic and uh, i do robotic no doubt i will be doing it but hernia i will promote more of a laparoscopy this is the fourth edition of book i brought out i also written a chapter on robotics all operations has been described how i do it with the video clip each chapter at the end if you scan uh, then you can get it so both the tar to tap the trip tricks everything has been described i think this book will have guide for a uh, youngsters and uh, thank you and uh, that way dc and this carnival is going to come in march 15 16 till uh, you can look at the website and be part of the program we have to have more of uh, this type of master video session and discuss all and uh, thank you finally to conclude saying each step has got the extra advantages over a uh, ipom plus technical difficult no doubt always surgeon has put little effort to know for which one needs to have a thorough knowledge on anatomy and suturing skill and uh, depending on the location of the anatomy one has to adapt port placement there to learn and it is outcome is same laparoscopic i already discussed surgeon commitment skill is more important just like a fast cutting it is no step by step one has to learn and uh, if any surgeon skill can repair a hernia without recurrence and that is i consider it's a great service to our people and our community thank you very much uh, and any any questions i would like to take it up thank you hello can i gandhi uh, prasanna hello pk yeah uh, pali can you hear us yeah yeah you can take it up yeah hey, pali that was a wonderful and very very ill status uh, lecture you yeah. covered entire abdominal wall and you have mm. given all the steps and all the tips and tricks i don't mm -hmm. think anybody will have many questions here at all actually full full good uh, no you take it out uh. this is big it bring it out this stop no yeah okay yes prasanna what do you said no no you 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 given us such a wonderful talk uh -huh. with all the video clips backing and the tips and tricks of the whole of the entire mm -hmm. abdominal wall i in a such an illustrative manner i don't think anybody will have many questions to ask you but oh. our, anyway i think uh, some questions will be there from the audience it will be nice actually if you can answer dr ramana uh, thank you for joining from melbourne yeah. so ramana uh, i see in his uh, picture now hey he is from australia or from india he is in melbourne sir ramana melbourne, sir is in okay, mute okay. mode <laughs> wish to hear from you sir yeah sir please unmute yourself i'm actually in a public place and it's Uh, quite noisy i don't know if you can uh, hear it or not if it's not too noisy uh, then it's fine otherwise i'll mute myself again i prefer to listen rather than say anything ramana sir you're loud and audible here so you can continue talking ramana you can talk sir uh, excellent talk really very comprehensive and I, uh, there is no doubt that a skilled 
surgeon such as yourself in fact the word skilled is not quite appropriate for describing someone like you but whatever a skilled surgeon like you who has a uh, knowledge of the abdominal wall anatomy there is no doubt that etep is a platform that can be used to repair pretty much any kind of uh, abdominal wall defect the question for those of us who have been doing it for a long time has to go beyond mere technicality today i think one of the things we need to do is think of standardizing the steps of the operation such that those who are beginning to do it do not damage the abdominal wall unfortunately this is something we don't see too often we do see unsafe procedures being done widely and i think this is going to be an important focus for all of us in the years to come to repair these patients and the other thing i think is we need to focus on the outcomes of the procedure and how we can improve on these outcomes thank you very much yeah. ramna thank you and uh, prasanna pk my flight time is uh, uh, getting it i have reached airport and this can discussion will continue no doubt about it uh, thank you very much for giving the opportunity and i'll take leave uh, thank, you, say, thank you sir thank you sir thank you for joining in spite of your schedule sir we all in thank you very much uh, persons you can close this let us give a big applause for dr palnivelu thank you thank you thank you bye <laughs> sir stay with me oh one second how is the australian doing now ramana 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 are you hearing I'm sorry. It's very noisy here. I'll try to log in after some time when okay, it is quieter. Okay. No, I'm, it's very I'm noisy. Just, I can't hear anything. I'm just mentioning that the India misses you, Ramana. No, sir, I'm unable to hear anything. I'll uh, try to log in after a while. Thank you. So the chat persons will stay. now we move on to the next session again uh, this is an invited talk by professor jignesh gandhi professor jignesh gandhi has been very early uh, adapter of uh, advanced uh, hernia procedures more so uh, he is one of the most avid hernia publishers in this part of the world and uh, he has the honor of being regularly invited to various courses both in ahs and ehs the most recent one was the ehs cadaver course you won't believe almost 30 nationals attended his cadaver live uh, cadaver course on awr and he almost does every month on cadaver course at the km hospital where he has very clear robust model he has a system from morning to evening so somebody gets to learn and gain enough confidence for people who are not into abdominal wall repair so ladies and gentlemen uh, we have the honor of uh, having dr jignesh thank you uh, dr kanegwel good morning everybody so this part of my talk is going to be focused on uh, etep inguinal safe access so i have no conflicts of interest but i am indebted to this gentleman uh, whom we met couple of years back in delhi professor horhe dais who is from colombia and he came out with this uh, landmark publication almost a decade back and if you look at this publication what it clearly mentioned in the conclusion was that this procedure almost has no conversions there are no major complications and the functional results of this procedure are excellent and he felt at that time that there is a place for this procedure in the armamentarium and today we are almost a decade later we are still discussing about this as a master course in this course so the e stands for an extended or an enhanced view and professor horhe felt that when you go a little back because every anatomy in patient is different from the way the distance between the pubic symphysis and the umbilicus is so if you step back a little bit you will have a wider view about what's happening 
So this was a conventional TEP approach where we had midline ports. But what was the Achilles heel was the distance which was between the umbilicus and the pubic symphysis. And as Indians, we know that our tummies are a little bit pear-shaped. And that's the reason our distance is always sometimes small. The umbilical tends to be a little bit down. And that's the reason uh, the limited space dissection is what helps you know, creates a problem. So for an expert, he can still do this dissection. But if your mesh doesn't go fairly beyond there, and if you remember in the morning, I had said that the center of the mesh has to be the center of the defect. And that's where this flexible port placements of ETEP approach, where you move slightly away and try to create a triangulation. Look at that. What happens? Now you have suddenly a large view, which is getting exposed and your dissection becomes easy. So you have a bigger platform, a bigger way in which you're going to dissect out the complete area. Case selection wise, you should always start with a unilateral hernia whenever you're doing a laparoscopic repair, then mature yourself to a bilateral one, then slowly pick up cases with an inguinoscotal with a mentor, and then take up irreducible cases and obstructed. Yes, we can do it. We have done in certain situations, but it is not uh, the standard of care. Let's start with the patient position. So it's very, very crucial, which I had learned earlier on, that when you give a little 30 degree head low position, uh, what happens is that your content starts taking going up and then you have a little bit more space here because your peritoneum doesn't stick in there. Uh, and that's something which I learned earlier in my practice in TEP, which now even adopt to an ETEP. And strapping the patient is very, very important because sometimes in an obese patient, you can have problems. And I tend to also make a tilt. So if I'm standing on the left side of the patient, I'll tilt the patient slightly onto my side because then ergonomically, my triangulation becomes much more easier. Port placement, Jorge Dias is very, very clear. These are portable post placements. So in port placements, if you can see here, this is a right-sided hernia. This is courtesy of Professor Jorge Dias. So these are the port placements where you have the first port, which is 12 millimeters, which is usually 5 centimeters lateral and 3 centimeters caudal cranial. Why 5 centimeters lateral? Because in an Indian male or an average male, the rectus abdominis width is between 5 to 6 centimeters. So you need to be in the rectus abdominis. And this is again the port placement for the left side. So you can have an ipsilateral approach to this hernia or you can have a contralateral approach to this hernia. So depending on your case to case basis, you will decide. The only technical challenge comes up is that if you have done this side from this approach and now the patient comes back after a couple of years with a hernia on the same side, that's the left side, it is a challenge. Having said that, in the afternoon, I'll share you some video where I've done an ETEP in another previous ETEP case. So this is a right-sided hernia. The way the port placements are is your first port will be 5 centimeters lateral and upwards. This is where you put your first camera port. I tend to put in a 12 millimeter because it becomes easy for my mesh to go inside. Because when you use a 10, the inside diameter is about 9.5. And that's where I've seen people struggling with the mesh. They push it. They try to shove it inside. It goes blindly and then you create a trouble. The second port usually is along the linear seminaris, which comes downwards, which is somewhere between this point and the pubic symphysis. This is where you will put your 5 millimeter. Where to put it? It depends on case-to-case -case basis where you have infrapagastic arteries. So sometimes you can be on lateral aspect or you can be on the medial aspect of the infrapagastic. The third placement would usually be at the umbilicus. But as I told you, it can be even skewing the umbilicus. So there is nothing like a golden rule. And that's the reason when Dr. Prem showed in the morning, the cutting of the linear seminar is the, the arcuate line over here, the post vector sheet. If your distance is good enough, then your port will come in there. But if you have a struggle, your arcuate line is coming lower down, then you need to cut this part and then you put the port there. And once you do that, what you achieve is a triangulation. So the aim of the procedure is to achieve a triangulation. How you are going to do it, depending on your stature, because sometimes people are six feet, huge obese people, you know, who are operating surgeons, then they will require more triangulation because their hand has to go out more. So it all depends on your body habitus of how you're going to do it. So change it from patient to patient. This is Professor Lal, courtesy him. So he clearly mentions the differentiation. So if you see a TEP, this is a space which you get, and this are your port placements. But the moment you put your ports, in an ETEP space, this is your camera, look at the space. You get a huge space which is getting, getting covered around. So that's a very nice depiction on a differentiation between an ETEP and a TEP approach. There are open entry steps, thanks to Rahul, because we are writing a chapter together. So in an open entry, you will make a same incision there, about 12 millimeters. Then you go through your fascia of camphor, fascia of scarpas. And once you make in the incision under scarpas, then you reach the uh, anterior sheath. 
once you have made an incision there it is important that you see the vertical fibers and most important is your assistant who is holding the retractors he has to be steady from top to bottom quite often it happens that he wants to see the procedure so he will tend to pull and then you enter into the external oblique and it has happened sometimes that you have cut the skin and subcute up to the scarpas in the layer but because of an over enthusiastic assistant he tends to pull the retractor and then suddenly you find that the muscle fibers are oblique and you are in trouble so they have to be vertical once you have done that you will see the glistening white fascia which is a posterior tear sheath and once you have entered into that particular plane that is where you will be putting in your port if you have a 12 mm or a 10 mm see to it that the bevel is facing downwards and why downwards is because if you face it upwards the sharp end can sometimes endanger the vessels which i'm going to talk about the brick's artery or the thompson's artery which runs from the inferior epigastric to the umbilicus so this is one of the achilles heel of people people have when they start they tell me suddenly there was a lot of bleeding i think i have injured the inferior epigastric no you have injured the branch which goes from the inferior epigastric to the umbilicus these are the optical entry steps which i use in my practice so the way we do it is the first step is we go straight down into that particular port where i told you so we go up to the anterior sheet muscle and then we go down i'll show you a video about it and once you get into that particular area now the moment you see the prs you need to turn the angle and you need to go about 45 degree if you keep continuing going straight you will make a hole in the prs and then you will enter the peritoneal cavity once you have done that you tend to enter into that particular area and now you will be sliding downwards so this is a way plane in which you will be going now so on the roof you will see fibers of transversalis fascia which i was talking in the morning so try to remain below those fibers and between the two layers of fascia transversalis do not try to go very very flush to the muscle because here also you will have tissues and you will find white area but it starts bleeding as you start going down towards the pelvis and the moment of the telescope once you have put in this should be going straight raising your elbow and going downwards i have seen people making straight movements this is where they tend to hit the pubic symphysis because they have been always told that look at the lighthouse so in looking at that lighthouse they make everything red so don't do that you go straight lift up your hand because if you see the pelvis it tends to turn downwards so it's very very important to move your hand up and then go downwards once you have done that particular step you can see how you slowly advance into that particular area so this is how we enter into our uh, patient so i attach the co2 remember the settings on the insufflator should be set at 12 with a flow of 3 if you have a previous hysterectomy done by a gynecologist he must have kept at 14 and 20 you will just tell your ashok who is a technician start the gas and suddenly you will find that you have a pneumoperitoneum so set it at 12 and 3 because you want slow insufflation inside and once you are inside look at the monitor and watch your pulse because stretching of the peritoneum in the extrapeditoneal space can cause severe bradycardia by the time your atropine will act it takes 30 seconds which is a very dangerous time for the patient so watch that when you're doing it once you have done that you have attached the assembly so this is a zero degree telescope attached to this once everything is assembled there this is the way the assembly which is ready now this is the way i will be going in the beginning i will engage the scope so my incision will be skin subcute camphor and scarpa and now i will engage it inside once i have engaged inside you can see that i will be now making rotatory movements so my left hand is coming up there right hand is coming up there you can see at the back the entire trolley has been arranged so well by my staff and once we do that we enter into this particular space and slowly just wait for things to go up there so this is how the things will be going up once you have entered there so this is a video to show you how things are going sir so that's a skin and the subcute the scarpas that's an anterior rectus sheath once we have gone beyond that little anterior rectus sheath slowly keep wait wait for a few seconds you know i have seen people in a rush to you know finish of the procedure i don't know why they want to go after that once you have done that you can now see the anterior rectus sheath the rectus muscle and the posterior rectus sheath here once you have entered the anterior rectus sheath lift up your cannula once you have lifted up your cannula now you will see that you will see the fleshy fibers and you can beautifully see why i use this particular trocar is it has got this wings which is like a drone and once i'm inside my drone does my dissection look at this i'm i'm actually sweeping it as if i am kind of flying there and this is exactly what all of you can do just stay in that white so if you see here i am absolutely in the white this is the rectus muscle look at that my muscle is not bare at all 
this is where you will have your Achilles heel. If you succeed in doing this, your success is done because initial entry and the look of the area is what is very, very important. So stay in that particular area. And you can see here only with the drone dissection, I can complete and completely go around in that area and dissect with my cannula. This is what is very, very important. And if you can observe here, as I come back there, this is where you will have your bricks artery coming in, which I'll be showing in the subsequent session. So it goes from the infibagastix, which is here. So this is the entry from the left side of the patient with the right hernia. And this vessel goes in here. So you tend to remain below that. Once you have done that, you have made up that plane. Then you do your telescopic dissection. And as I told you, the dissection should be straight and facing downwards. Do not keep going straight and try to demonstrate the lighthouse or the white house. But are we always lucky? And the answer is no. So this is again in one of our patients where I told one of my uh, trainees that uh, just show me how you're going to demonstrate. And this is where, you know, you go layer by layer. Everything is cured because probably the white balance was not adequate. And you can see here now the posterior sheet is already breached. And what you can see below is that if we have already gone into the periperitoneal plane. So what do we do? Do we get frustrated? Do we stop the procedure? Do open? No. So what you can do is you can just come out completely, remove all the gas which has been there, and now redirect your things and try to put your cannula beyond that hole. The moment you do that, you are in game. Or you can even put a small stitch if required and again establish the same space which I'm talking about. So it's not always recommended that you stop the procedure, but you can still do that. So this is where you can see going inside, going inside. Now posterior rectus sheet is already cut and you can see this. So this is one of the Achilles heel in an optical trocar. So how much of pressure to apply, what direction to go is very, very important. This is a balloon entry, another entry which you can do. This is courtesy Professor Hore. So I was telling him we are doing a master course. So he was very happy to share this video, uh, which uh, shows how he does this particular procedure. So this is a video which is available on his channel. So this is where you can see he's showing the hernia, which is there on the left side. Typically what they do is they will infiltrate uh, medially and above, as you can see here. So this patient had a previous open appendicectomy. So you make an infiltration there. Uh, we try to give a preemptive anesthesia in all our patients. So I try to infiltrate with local because I've seen that the pain significantly goes down. So here you can see how it goes in. After that, you make an incision there. Uh, then you use the PDP balloon, which me and even my colleague, Dr. Rahul, we've been using it fairly frequently. He tends to go with the dissection because I can tell and you know swear that this is the golden finger, but all of us are not blessed. Even at least I'm not blessed with that golden finger to go inside. Some of the seniors here may be to understand the plane. So once you have done that and you put in your retractor, this is what I was talking about. You can see it is steady. Everything is in one line. Otherwise, there's a tendency to pull up and down or sideways. And this is where you will lose your plane. Once he has done that, he makes an incision on the anterior sheet. Now he will dissect between the muscles. Go inside there again. He will dissect that. So you can always do with this is a gauze piece dissection. Go in very comfortably. Skirt your finger gently below. And then once you have made that little pocket, now he will be inserting this balloon. With his experience, he can demonstrate and put the balloon without injuring the bricks artery. But it's not always possible by all of us. But yes, you need to engage it. So you can see here that he's going vertical and then immediately turns his hand this way. So once you have turned your hand this way, you tend to go along the arcuate. Once you have done that, now the direction is going towards the side of the hernia. And once you are towards the side of the hernia, you have confirmed that you're on the opposite side, you will start insufflating the balloon. When you start insufflating the balloon, it's important to give a compression onto the opposite side because you do not want the balloon to dissect the contralateral side. You need to keep it on the ipsilateral side. So these balloons are available. People have done indigenous balloons. Yes, you can use them. The principle remains the same. Whatever is important is the safety. So this is where you will keep your hand. And now he, he keeps their hand because he doesn't want the uh, air to get displayed there. And through this, you can actually put in a telescope. So we have not have an endo view, but from here, you can actually see with the balloon expanding that area and keeping this hand, you can see now there's a nice bulge over there. Again, when you're watching this, look at the screen and watch out that there should not be any bradycardia because that can endanger the patient and create a trouble. Once you have done this, then you will remove your balloon, replace it with a 10 or a 12. If you're using in a 12, remember to seal that opening well, because when you're doing a TEP repair or an ETAP repair, you don't want any leakage of carbon dioxide. And for that, so you can see here now the space has been created nicely with the balloon. Infrapagastics have gone up. 
And now you remove that, desufflate the balloon. And once you have desufflated the balloon, you can replace it with the cannula, which you want, whatever you are comfortable. Again, when you put in the cannula, remember that the bevel should not be pointing upwards. It should be pointing downwards. Because if the bevel is pointing downwards and you can go very safely, here you can see that he's going with the trocar and cannula assembly. You can just put in the cannula comfortably. Once you have done that, now you are in the space. So what are the rules of the game? Follow the white, you will be right. I, I, This is, was my statement many years back and we are using this is because when I had asked one of the senior surgeons a couple of years back that how do you get into that plane? His response was, it just happens. And that was not what I was happy with. So I went into the search, read the literature, went abroad, learned from experts. And that's where I came to know that you need to be in that plane to understand what's happening. So what are the white structures you need to follow when you're doing an ETEP? The first white structure is a posterior sheath. Obviously, the anterior sheath and the posterior sheath. The next white structure would be the transversal fascia. So you need to be rem remaining below that. And you then you're in the right plane. The third white structure is the pubic symphysis. Uh, this is where you will be seeing... Try to see that your fascia transversalis, which is overlying the pubic symphysis, remains intact. Otherwise, you can endanger the corona mortis. So remain in that layer. The next white would be your arcuate line because you need to then know that I need to remain below that layer so that I can remain in that particular plane. The next white would be your white glistening sac. The next white would be the vast difference because these are anatomical landmarks. And then the next white would be the Cooper's ligament where you'll be going to tag the sac. So try to remember all these white structures. If you remember these white structures, you'll never ever falter wrong. And then you have done your checklist in the entire procedure. So just a last comparison between the two techniques in terms of the balloon and the optical trocar. Balloon technique is expensive. Uh, it is universal. You need to have the balloon to do that. But yes, you can do it with an indigenous balloon yourself. Learning curve, you need to be in the right plane. We saw Professor Hore going in with the finger and the trocar very comfortably. But once you develop that expertise, you can do that as well. Complication-wise, yes, in a balloon, you can injure the vessels there. I told you because it is blind. Uh, so you need to be really uh, doing it pretty, pretty well. And the space creation is large. So the balloon gives you a larger space much earlier on. So you don't struggle. But I can tell you if you're doing a telescopic dissection and gradually going up and making up that space, you will be much better off. This is a publication which came up as a systematic uh, review. So they said that balloon has advantage. Uh, so it's not beneficial in a bilateral uh, TEP. So they have done a comparison between using the balloon versus no balloon. So what are the safe excess safe rules? Uh, just to conclude my talk, uh, go for an open technique, then gradually graduate to an optical technique and use balloon optional if you are expert. Stay below the fascia transversalis. Do not bear the muscle. That is one point which you will all learn and go back today. So you're not going to make the muscle bear on the roof. You're going to stay below that. Spend those initial 30 seconds, one minute, and you will do it well. Be careful with the bricks artery. You will see more of this in my uh, next session. Follow the white. You will be right. I have told you all the white structures which we need to follow. Go from medial dissection. So finish your medial dissection first. Do your lateral dissection and then come to the sac. In trying to handle the sac much earlier on, you can make a rent. And once you have made a rent there, then it becomes difficult for you with that peritoneum uh, opening up over there. And port placements are flexible. This is not me. This is Professor Jorge. So try to do the triangulation and ergonomics as per your convenience so that you are very, very comfortable. I would urge all of you, these are the two upcoming meetings, which is coming of one, which is happening in Goa next year, which is like a mid summit with the young Turks. So I'll be very happy for you all to participate. And you guys are doing this massive mammoth meeting in 2025. And I'm sure it will be a huge success here in uh, Chennai. Uh, so I'm sure Deepak and Prem and Kanagwil, Kumar and everyone is going to be looking forward to this mammoth meeting. So I urge you to come for that. And that's my last video, which I always show up in all my talks is this is how, you know, what happens if you're a very fast surgeon and you want everything fast in life. So this is what is happening. This uh, lady is getting delivered. That's a child. And uh, the husband is more, you know, eating the Doritos. So this is a surgeon who, is, who, who wants everything very, very fast. You know, so the lady is looking at that and the child, every time he's doing that, you can see the child is also interested in taking up the Doritos. Yeah, so you can see that. This is what happens when you want everything very fast. And the wife is not happy with that. And you can see what's happened. Yeah, the child has also come out. So don't try to be fast. I always say go slow. You will reach fast. Thank you very much.
professor jignesh it's yeah. a fantastic talk yes sir. not everyone of us has the luxury of using a balloon or an optical trocar i think most of the boys here and the surgeons will use a metal trocar there is a little bit of difference when you use the metal trocar yes i would like you to so so uh, sir thank you for raising that question i am a professor of surgery at km for last 25 years we still using metal trocars over there and i train all my residents in using the metal trocars so as i told you just follow the steps which i am talking about and absolutely right we may not have the luxury of doing that having said that i think it's time that we come up with the technology because the view which they give it the optical trocar it will give them that confidence to learn the anatomy faster so maybe out of 10 we can choose one patient which is a nice thin limb patient to understand your anatomical planes well that would be my advice thank you <clears throat> yes sir it's a very nice way and uh, one of the interesting things all the posterior should know is the dissection which you showed it has to be through the fascia rather than the bearing the rectus muscle that's one of the most important things sir so actually there is no postgraduate sir everybody is a practicing surgeon so we didn't allow the postgraduate join so anyway so no problem no, there, there are postgraduates here also. some people may be attend in zoom yeah. the no, no here also there are postgraduates yeah, yeah. in minimal you, access surgery and in fact my four mean minimal access surgery fellow sir here in fact sir i still feel myself as a postgraduate when i come to meeting <laughs> like this you will see my one of my disclaimers that i'm still learning etap yeah after so many cases i'm still learning so i'm also a postgraduate i think you have made a very valid point understand the anatomy well because this was my achilles heel i took time i had to go abroad to meet people because when i heard that statement from that surgeon it happens on its own i i, I was just aghast and i said i will now make an attempt learn it and then go to every possible centers in india to teach people so that they don't have to go and learn the hard way which i did yeah thank you sir and then other thing is the you were stressing on the 12 mm port what is the significance of it Jake? so so that so the 12 mm optical port what happens is that suppose if you need to put in your gauze piece for any kind of hemostasis is you need to put in a patty inside you put it in a mesh inside the 10 mm port sir if you see and open up the cannula the inside diameter comes to around 9.2 in most of the instruments now 9.2 if you are using in a extra large or a big mesh inside sometimes there is a struggle and what happens is the patient surgeon then forces it inside i have seen the mesh getting disappeared in different planes i have seen the mesh injuring the infibiasic artery so every possible things have happened just making that 10 to 12 makes your life so comfortable i'll be more comfortable using it in view of safety other thing is the balloon versus the telescopic dissection balloon dissection is always much easier and you get a nice big space as you mentioned in your yeah. talk also what i started doing you do the dilate the balloon twice okay. one nearer to the pubis one come up to the umbilicus and into it you get Excellent. a nice big space and your dissection becomes much easier that's a good very good point to do it at both the spaces inside and then outside so you get a good space thank you very much sir for that comment any other questions sir, otherwise yes sir so how costly are that does can your balloon you noise? noise reduction at the back those i think those are tp and tapp surgeons they can be out yeah yeah uh, i'm dr manikwela professor yeah. here from asia i would like to ask uh, what's the cost of the balloon uh, this thing So, so the PDP balloon, I think, uh, yeah, comes to somewhere between six to eight k. Rahul, yeah, yeah, it is free of it, uh, reusable. So, the, so, so there are indigenous balloons made by a surgeon from Gujarat, which are very, very cheap. People even use a glove, a double tip of the yeah. glove. But if you need to know the cost of the PDP balloon, I think Rahul is the right person to answer that question. Thank you. The PDP balloon is the only uh, maker is a Medtronic, and the cost of balloon MRP is twelve thousand five hundred. But for the hospital, you can get it about ten thousand five hundred or something. I think okay. we have a question so from a, one young surgeon but, there. But but thing is, this is a only single time use. Try to understand. This is a single time use. But as Indians, you know the jugar things and all. So we use it in multiple cases. But see to it that the balloon is not ruptured. It should be etio sterilized, washed properly. That is the key of that particular thing. Otherwise, this is a hernia. You will get after three years, 
the infection, a typical type of infection and something like that. Because even for the washing, what uh, what water you are using, that causes the problem. So that is the most uh, dreaded complication what in hernia surgery, what now Thanks. we are uh, saying. Thanks a lot. Yes. Yeah. Oh, thank you, sir, for your excellent yeah. talk. At the max, five times you can use. Yeah. But uh, I want to comment on uh, VK Reddy, sir's uh, comment. Yeah. Sir, sir, you asked for uh, 12 mm trocar. Why you are using Taylor and Taylor. Sir, this is my request to you. Now, when you go from tomorrow morning, while you are doing a laparoscopy, any laparoscopic surgery, just put your 10 mm trocar from inside you see how it looks. It never looks clean. And that is the reason, you know, we get the infection in mesh because we are putting mesh through these trocars. And if you are using a disposable 12 mm trocar, the mesh never, uh, you know, get friction to the wall of that particular thing because it goes very easily. And that's why many a times we get this atypical infections later on after three years, after five years of the hernia surgery. So that is the reason, one of the reason that we started using the disposable and new every time. Only sheets are available now and that is costing just 800 or 900 rupees. So it is just 900 rupees for one patient. It hardly makes any difference. Thanks, it thanks. makes a hell lot of difference for the patient and surgeon for that matter. Because your complicated patient never comes to you. It goes to some other surgeon. And he roams around many different surgeons and your name and fame and everything will go. So that is how it goes. Just the last question yeah. from the Just young man. Question, yeah. Yeah. So initially earlier when you talked about crossing over to the other side, cutting the linear alpha, uh, have you in your experience seen any loss in the integrity because of that? Should the priority be always the space creation and the triangulation of the boards? If you're able to you know, uh, salvage you know, without entering the other side of the abdomen, and able to give the same outcome, would that be preferred first or the triangulation, the space creation, so, the priority? Good, good, good. So, so, so first of all, let me rephrase your question. We don't cut the linea alba, we cut the posterior sheath. So we never cut the linea alba and we should not even cut it. If you cut it in Turkey, you will be in jail for seven years. Anyway, so you cut the posterior sheath and as I told you, you just cut in case if you have your accurate so line sweeping down, downwards and you feel that you are second working port is not going to create a triangulation. Sometimes in such patients, I've even given a little bit more head low and my space comes in very comfortably. Just cutting that one or two centimeters of posterior sheath is not going to endanger the integrity of the linea alba because it is just about one or two centimeters. Prem had a different case where he showed about four or five centimeters of cutting of PRS. It is an exceptional case which we don't do every time. So it's just one or two and that too, if required, if not, so the trick is head low, wait for the CO to go inside, do the lateral dissection and automatically you'll find the space there. Okay. Thank I you. think we'll conclude here Thanks. because we have the president of AWR Society, Professor uh, Pramod Chinde sir here come in and I think he's going to have the next talk, right? Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, we really enjoyed your talk. Um, you are running short of time. We will Thank close you, the session. Thank you very much for the opportunity, sir. Thank you. thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, friends, there is going to be a little uh, change in the schedule. Now that we have completed uh, basics of ETEP, there have been always people who are intending, are already a very highly skilled open surgeon would like to move to TAR and other advanced procedures. So we have the honor of having Dr. Pramod Shinde to give his talk on open eat uh, like TAR. So that for that, let me have the honor of having Dr. Saravanan Girishwari Hospital to come up to the stage, please. Dr. Raghumani, sir. Dr. Christopher. Dr. Balamurgan. So we always believe equal opportunity for seniors and youngsters. So we are happy to have them on the board. In the meantime, Dr. Shinde is the serving president on the AWRSC and has been teaching abdominal core health surgeries for the past 20 years and is known for his quite calm what may come. So let us listen to that. Chairpersons, please take.
just one request from the uh, organizers, please. People who are having tea, coffee, perfectly fine. That's the reason it is there. Can we keep the noise level down, please? Because sometimes it's very difficult to difficult for us to follow what is going on here. I think Dr. Balamurugan is not here. Is he around? Dr. Balamurugan? Okay. It's okay. So, Bhaiya, please come up to the stage, please. In fact, uh, Subhaya, Subhaya is uh, happened to be my teacher's grandson, Professor T.S. Subhaya. And uh, Subhaya, Professor T.S. Subhaya used to be a very great teacher for all of us. I'm sure all the seniors here will vouch for us. It is indeed a proud privilege to have grandson of Professor T.S. Subhaya, himself being a surgeon. And he's associated with the Apollo Institute of uh, Excellence of Hernia Surgery with Dr. Prem. Please sit down. Please carry on. Thank you, Dr. Kanagvel. Thank you, all Team Chennai. And it's indeed an honor to be here amongst our young colleagues and some of our very senior surgeons, colleagues, and friends. Dr. P.K. Reddy was just here on the dais. And I have an, a very young and dynamic panel here. So the topic or the mandate given to me is open to the state of the art in AWR. So it's a big topic. I'll try and cover some of the basics of it. So actually Carbonell had first proposed the posterior component separation, but he had proposed it between the internal oblique and the transverse abdominis. So Yuri Novitsky, as we all know, was the first person to have discovered this procedure and this anatomy, which led him to discovery and creation of this star, which today has revolutionized the world of hernia surgery. So the indications are large defects, recurrent hernias, lateral hernias, hernias associated with stoma, loss of domain. And obviously, if the ACST anterior component separation has been done, and if it fails and recurs, then posterior component separation is going to be the best option. Although it is one of the best options in almost all recurrent hernias, except when that space has been violated. So preoperative workup includes clinical workup, looking at all the comorbidities, the cardiac status, the respiratory status is very important. Uh, and CT scan of the abdomen is mandatory because the very fact that we are trying, planning to do a transverse abdominis release, that means it's not a small primary umbilical hernia, which does not need a CT scan. So when we are thinking of TAR, a, transfer, a CT scan abdomen will be necessary. And I believe that we'll have a separate talk on this, but we must look at the abdominal anatomy, the location of the hernia, the sac, the contents, the width, what are the margins formed by, is there a previous mesh there? What is the volumetry? Because if this patient has got loss of domain, then the entire management will change preoperatively. Status of the abdominal muscles, whether they are atrophic, they're contracted, and other pathologies if they are in. So, most importantly, preoperative optimization for this kind of surgery is absolutely mandatory. We must control all the comorbidities. Obesity, the BMI cutoff is 40 in most centers, but 35 is a desirable one. Smoking needs to be stopped for four weeks. Respiratory optimization is very important because respiratory compromise is starts right on the table when we start closing the midline. So that optimization is important. And in fact, weight loss has been shown to improve uh, uh, the SSOPI and SSIs in a recent paper, uh, which I'll quote a little later on. So even some amount of weight loss will reduce the rate of SSIs and SSOPIs. So to understand open tar, we need to understand the anatomical basis of the tar. And basically, we all know that all the nerves travel between the transverses abdominis, the innermost layer and the internal oblique. And then these neurovascular bundles enter the retrorectus plane at the linear seminaris. If you look at the transverse abdominis, it almost forms a corset uh, like this. And therefore, the, the, forms a hoop tension. But it originates from the lower six costal uh, cartilages, from the lumbar fascia, from the anterior two-thirds of the inner lip of iliac crest. And the lateral one third of the inguinal ligament. But more importantly, its insertion is what, where all the magic of this surgery happens. So 
traditional concept of the linear semilunaris formation or the rectus sheath formation was that most textbooks showed that all these three muscles meet at a common area or a common point which then forms the linear semilunaris. But if you look at these pictures here, you can see that the transversus abdominis muscle is not straight like this. It is creeping onto the posterior rectus sheath in the epigastric region and then going away and forming an aponeurosis here. So obviously, and this is shown very well, and this is what gave rise to this magic where Yuri Novitsky discovered this fact. Because previously, although this fact was being seen, but what the mind does not know, the eye does not see. So this medial insertion is much more medial into the epigastrium. And what he described then was that the internal oblique has got the divided into an anterior lamina, which goes on to the anterior rectus sheath. Then it has got a posterior lamina, which goes on to the posterior rectus sheath. And if you were to incise this posterior lamina of the internal oblique, you will actually be able to see actual fibers of transverse abdominis, which can then be divided. And then we can go into a plane below the transverse abdominis muscle. So obviously, in order to access this star plane, the first step is going to be the plane in the retrorectus plane. So we have to first do a retrorectus dissection. So we have to open the rectus sheath medially, lift up the rectus muscle, and we can see the neurovascular bundles arching here. And that's the, the posterior rectus sheath is covered by the posterior lamella of the internal oblique. So once we incise the posterior lamella of the internal oblique, then the transverse abdominis muscle is seen going all the way down. Now these fibers can be picked up on a mixture and they can be divided. And once they are divided, then this peritoneum along with the transverse alis fascia can be dissected off the transverse abdominis muscle and the muscle stays on top and the peritoneum along with the transverse alis fascia can be dissected all the way into the retroperitoneum to the lateral border of the trans uh, psoas. So again, another wonderful uh, demonstration or a picture from the Michael Rosen's textbook where we can see that the transverse abdominis fibers are not visible unless you divide the posterior lamella of the internal oblique. And once that is done, then these fibers can be divided very nicely. And then you can put in a, a large mesh right up till the posterior retroperitoneum. So when we approach to doing this procedure of TAR, and that's the linear semilunaris, and commonest way to approach it and easiest way to approach it, although today in today's uh, anybody who's familiar, familiar with bottoms up might say that that's even easier than that. But in the epigastrium, when you can see that these fibers are fleshy, they are very well seen. And sometimes the posterior lamella of internal oblique is so thin that you can actually see these fibers right there. So it becomes very easy to divide these fibers at their insertion in the epigastrium. So all those who would like to begin a transverse abdominis relief, this is a good place to begin uh, this procedure. So this is how this procedure is begin when it is done top down. But obviously we can do it as a bottoms up approach also, which we will discuss a little later. And we, if possible, we can see a video also that. And then there is something known as a reverse star, which we may not go in so much into details as of for this talk, as far as this talk is concerned. So let us look at a short video, which is so So now this is a retrorectus dissection. You can see the rectus muscle being dissected of the posterior rectus sheath. Okay. And the posterior rectus sheath is looking all plain and white. Okay. Now this dissection should be done by holding the posterior rectus sheath in your hands. And we can see the neurovascular bundles there. And we can almost see the transverse abdominis fibers. So now once we incise the posterior level of the internal oblique, Okay, we will actually be able to see the transverse abdominis fibers. As we go down, it is going to become more and more aponeurotic, but it is the epigastric region where you can see the fleshy fibers. Okay, 
So now these fibers then can be actually picked up on a mixer, like we saw in the illustration, and they can be divided. So this is the insertion of the transverse abdominis being divided. So this needs to be done step by step. So there is thin peritoneum and some amount of transversalis fascia on top of it. We need to protect the intestines before starting this procedure by putting large towels, which I have not shown in this video. So once that is done, then we can start lifting up this, these fibers and then go into a plane below the transverse uh, abdominis muscle. So now the divided end is lifted up and we start dissecting off the transverse abdominis muscle and we can use variety of instruments but a kitner or a peanut works very well and the force is applied more towards the transverse abdominis muscle. Okay. And as we go laterally then the retroperitoneal flap uh, fat comes to our rescue and the dissection becomes easier. And this way, we can go all the way down posteriorly to the retroperitoneum. We can see the fat coming into view now. So the dissection becomes much easier in this plane. And we have to remember that there is no muscle down. It's only the peritoneum and transversalis fascia and all the muscles have to be up. If we see any muscle down, then that means the plane is not right. Okay. And this dissection can go all the way from the costal margin towards the space of Bogros, towards the inguinal region and towards the pelvic. Here you can see the cave of Redzi is also dissected. And once that is done, then we can close the midline, the posterior rectus sheath. And then we can place a large 30 by 30 mesh. And once that is done, then the midline will come close together very nicely and the midline can be closed. Now here traditionally, two meshes have been used and we put them in a home plate configuration. But what we were talking about and we saw Dr. Palani Velusar also mentioning this, that understanding the fatty distribution helps us because the peritoneum is deeply, densely adherent to the posterior rectus sheath in this regions, whereas in the center you have the fatty triangle, the falciform ligament, the bladder flap, the red flap and laterally to the linear seminaris. This fat gives you a good plane of dissection. So this makes uh, this approaching the sub plane even easier from the space of Bogros also. So when we talk about bottom sub tar, where the same thing can be done from below upwards, what we make use of this is this, there's a falciform ligament, this is peritoneal bladder flap in the, and then we have the space of Bogros, and then we have this continuous laterally as this fatty plane. So we can literally go up like this and then divide the posterior rectus sheet and the transverses. Uh, abdominis aponeurotic fibers in this direction without injuring the linea seminaris where all the three muscles are going to be attached except for transverse abdominis where the insertion will be now divided. So this is the basis of how bottom sub tar can be done. So in when our, whenever we are talking about the bottom sub tar, we go along the posterior rectus sheath, we go into the pelvis and then identify this is the arcuate line. And as we have just seen that this fatty region is continuous from the inguinal pelvic region laterally into the retroperitoneum. 
So let's have a look at a short video of how this looks like. So that's the posterior rectus sheath. That's the rectus muscle being retracted up. So we are using a peanut or a kidner. And that's the space of Bogros being dissected. And then we are going below and lateral to the arcuate line here. So we are pushing down all the peritoneum below. And that's the Cooper's ligament that you can see. This is what we do in an inguinal hernia dissection also, but not that far above. That's the Cooper's ligament. That's the cave of Redzius. Okay. So we need to go laterally. So we have kept the posterior rectus sheet intact. Okay. And we are just dissecting off the peritoneum. And once, as we go on pushing the peritoneum down, we start dividing the arcuate line. And these are the transversus abdominis fibers. Okay. So this is how we approach the plane below the transversus abdominis from below up. Now from here, you can go all the way up to the costal margin, depending upon how much of uh, width of the incision that you have dissected. So you can literally push off the peritoneum with your hand and then divide this combination of the posterior rectus sheath with the posterior lamella. And that will essentially unite these two spaces and that will be a bottom subtar. So here you can see that we are away from the linear seminaris and all the neurovascular abundance are lateral. So we are almost one centimeter medial to the linear seminaris because we don't want these neurovascular bundles to get damaged. And we are always below the plane of transverse abdominis. So this is how a bottom subtar can be done. This green towel that we see, which is protecting, offers us also the views of any peritoneal holes that we might create, and they need to be closed then and there. Madrid modification was from the Madrid group where they felt that we need not go in a straight line because these, and they're more favoring the bottoms up approach. Whereas instead of going right across like the Yuri Novitsky technique of dividing the transverse abdominis fibers, they would then turn their incision medially towards the sub space. And this, because these neurovascular bundles, they tend to come in closer and closer towards the midline as we go higher up. So that's why the Madrid modification is just uh, another way of doing this transverse abdominis uh, dissection, uh, tar surgery, except that instead of going straight across and dividing these fibers, we turn medially and go towards the sub space. So another area this transverse abdominis offers for us is for all the lateral hernias. So whenever we have a lateral hernia like this, we will need to go beyond the linear seminaris and place a mesh right from here till here. Now this hernia is close to the linear seminaris. So we will need to have the mesh crossing both the retrorectus plane and going laterally for an adequate cover. But if the hernia is away from the linear seminaris, then we need not disturb this retrorectus plane we could do a unilateral tar like this and just have the mesh go from one retrorectus plane towards the lateral border of the psoas. But if we have a posterior hernia, then sometimes we can not, we may not even go into the retrorectus plane at all. We might just be able to do uh, it lateral to the linear seminaris and place the mesh without going into the retrorectus plane. Sometimes, if especially in a hernia like a subcostal hernia or lateral hernia, if the hernia is a large hernia like this and we need the mesh coverage to come right up till here, then we will need to do a reverse tar. And this is done by approaching the retrorectus plane from a reverse manner. This is technically demanding and therefore a little more advanced when we get to hold, know the anatomy better. Only then we should start attempting a reverse tar like this. So TAR is not a very straightforward procedure. We could have difficulties right from the beginning because many times these are multiply recurrent hernias. So adhesive lysis can cause enteric injuries, enteric entrotomies. A previous mesh can be quite difficult and could be adherent to bowel as well as the sac. We might lose our planes, but we have to be on our guard 
if we lose a plane for a centimeter or so, it doesn't matter. But if we are completely lost, then we might as well go on devastating and the linear seminaris. Buttonholes can cause tremendous tearing of peritoneum. There could be inadequate release because initially we may not be so familiar and we may not go all the way down into the sub and ends, epigastric place and laterally up to the lateral border of soas. When I have not really, it's difficult to touch upon all areas like sub dissection, we are liable to do a diaphragmatic injury. And sometimes the posterior rectus sheath, we may not be able to close it because of previous scar, previous mesh, and we might need to use omentum or a vicryl mesh or an absorbable mesh. And obviously, sometimes the anterior rectus sheath also, we may not be able to close fully. And uh, we might need to recreate the linea alba, leaving a small gap when it will be called as a bridging repair. Although we have put in a large, maybe one or two meshes, but a part of it, if it is not able to be closed, then we need to suture the edges of the unclosed sheath to the mesh so that it becomes a bridge repair because we would not like to have raised intra-abdominal pressure. Postoperatively, DVT prophylaxis, wound care, and complications, managing complications is very important. There's a huge list of complications, but hemorrhages, hematoma, surgical site occurrences, and posterior rectus sheath rupture with intestinal obstructions are all known. And we have to be aware that if the patient is not doing well on the first and second day, then you need to be vigilant. You can't say that this is just a paralytic ileus, the patient will respond. You have to immediately take steps because the patient could as well be having an intestinal obstruction because of posterior rectus sheath rupture. The outcomes, there are there's a huge amount of data here. And obviously, TAR has become the main force where complicated hernias are known, but all of the complication rates are still there, SSO, SSOPIs, SSIs, recurrence, hematomas, every known complication is associated with this and most devastating is injury to the linea alba. So my friends, we all know that uh, uh, this community is growing well, you've already seen it and we will be having our DI search 2025. So I would invite you to join the community. And obviously, all of us will be part of this great meeting that is this time to happen in 2025. Thank you. So very nice uh, description and uh, applied anatomy, the understanding of the fat distribution and uh, transverse abdominal insertion and uh, component separation, sir. Uh, Postgraduates, if you are asking any question, please go ahead. Sir, one comment and a question. Comment is, we have consciously included this open tar uh, talk in amongst the ETEP because unless we get this anatomy right, ventral honey repairs using ETEP technique is almost impossible. That is the reason we requested sir to talk on the open uh, repair. Question is, sir, when you put in a mesh, uh, you said two meshes, sometimes, sometimes you have big enough meshes which may be sufficient. The trouble is the space you create is very variable. You can't, how do you measure these? Uh, how, how do you actually size the mesh? Because transversely, vertically also, transversely, especially the width changes from the bottom up, right? So True. how do you actually size the mesh and how do you make sure it doesn't, it kind of sits comfortably? True. See, most of the times when we have a proper transverse abdominis dissection, like if we have a lower abdominal predominant hernia, then the dissection is from the ziphoid, the costal margins and going all the way down into the pelvis. Okay. And in that case, we know that the main hernia is from M3, M4, M5 region. We need not go into the subdiaphragmatic region. And that time we generally put a mesh in a diaphragm, in a uh, kind of a diamond shape configuration where it's the corner is up and it follows the costal margin and then it goes down. But then that that corners going down like this into the pelvis, they don't carry cover the lateral edge. So therefore, the second mesh has to be placed onto the pelvis. It has to be rolled up onto the space of Bogros like we do for inguinal hernias. Because inguinal hernias, one mesh is going onto the posterior abdominal wall and then curving up. So that transverse mesh, the next mesh has to be placed horizontally, although it's a square, it's not di diagonally opposite. So that we have two meshes, but the second mesh is more onto the lower abdomen covering the inguinopelvic region. 
when we are dealing with the upper abdomen hernia, then we have to go for dissection all the way into the subdiaphragmatic space. And then we will need two meshes, but the mesh, the upper mesh will have to be, the second mesh will have to be placed more onto the subdiaphragmatic region coming down. As far as measurement of the thing is concerned, if we have done an adequate tar in a normal size patient, 30 by 30 meshes would cover. We would rarely need to trim at, at the most the two corners, which go laterally. But many times if the patient is a large stature patient, even a 30 by 30 mesh will not be sufficient. And today we have a few companies producing meshes of 50 by 50 centimeters. So when we are doing a large patient with a large hernia, we have to be aware that a 30 by 30, even two meshes will not be sufficient. So we need to place more meshes. Obviously measurement is the key. Although we know that only 30 by 30 is available, but we always measure with a scale. Uh, by using uh, ribbon tape or whatever it is in both the directions and generally do not trim the meshes as far as possible. Unless it is not fitting well, it is curving and that curved mesh might give rise to a recurrence at that age. Only then we trim that edge. Otherwise, most of the times the space could be slightly larger than the mesh is what are about. It's a large space all to be filled with mesh. So do you anchor both the meshes together or do the meshes kind of independently stay there? Generally, fixation is done to the Cooper's ligaments. Other fixation is not required unless we have not been able to close the midline. If we have not been able to close the midline, then the meshes need to be fixed laterally. And to that area where the linea alba remains open, that area has to be fixed to the mesh because it will separate and the mesh will bulge. So fixation will be required when there is a bridging repair. But customarily, pubic Cooper's ligament, two fixation switches are put. Otherwise, the other fixation is not required. And amongst the meshes which you're using, assuming you use two meshes, do we need to anchor the meshes together is my question. We don't need to anchor the meshes together. We only anchor the first mesh to the Cooper's ligament. The second mesh just stays on top of it because it will not be able to move such a large mesh and large, such a large space. Depends on the overlap also, overlap mesh. Correct. If it's more than uh, 5 cm, you don't have to fix it. The huge overlap prevents it from getting displaced. That's right. Uh, uh, anything else? Yeah, anything yeah, I have yeah, yeah. in... Uh, I have one question. Yes. See, when we do a reef stopa, generally drains are not required. Now, there have been papers from our own group and community, Rahul is part of it, where drains or no drains has been a paper. In transversus abdominis release, my personal preference is because of the extensive dissection, I do put drains in transversus abdominis release patients. But they can be done away with because it's an absorptive surface and drains are not necessary is what many papers have shown. After oh. dissecting so much of spaces, it's better to put a mesh, I mean, a drain. Creating oh. a space, no? So, better to put a drain. I have a question. Can I ask that? Dr. Shinde, very good uh, videos which I saw you. And I am also doing this procedure quite frequently. But the main pitfall remains the rents in the peritoneum, especially in the upper part where there is no uh, 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 thick transverse fascias to support the sutures. So the more you try to suture it, the more the gap increases. How you tackle this? I absolutely agree. The subcostal region, the peritoneum becomes thin. And once it starts tearing, no amount of suturing, the more you suture it tries to fail. So you have to release it in other areas first. Okay, so that will make life easy. So whenever there is a tear, large tear here, we have to leave that area go in safer areas which are away from it and release that area, then some amount of suturing will be possible. But most of the times in that difficult areas, there are two things that come to our help. One is the omentum itself and the other is we always keep an absorbable mesh in the theater always available. We have a vicryl mesh which is available, which I know. I know it's not easily available. So at the moment, we don't have any other very good mesh substitutes, but Omentum is a very good way of securely closing that using Omentum 
without disconnecting the omental apron. So that because, but it's an open abdomen. So that that is a difficult thing when you are doing an eat aptar. But in an open surgery, obviously, you'll have to first look at the omentum, protect it very nicely, and you have to be away from the transverse colon where the omentum gets attached. Sir, one goes. Can I, yes. uh, can I just Dignesh respond to your... Uh, yeah. yeah. So, if you remember in the morning, I talked about the two layers of balloon, the peritoneum and the fascia. So, in scenarios like this, when you are at fascia diaphragmatica, where the peritoneum is very thin, step out. What we call it now with Miguel and everyone is step out. So you go out and take a part of that diaphragmatic fascia and put it onto the peritoneum. So wherever you have got a thin peritoneum, step out, take that fascia, come down, again go in that plane. The moment you find the peritoneum is good, again step in. So step in and step out is something which you can do number one. Today, we have an advent of Sepra film. If you remember, our gynecologist colleagues used to use Sepra film. So we have now started using this Sepra film in the areas where you have this peritoneum. Just slap it onto that area. It sticks so well that you feel in some time that it's like a peritoneum which is formed. There are also reports now where if we can use composite mesh in select cases in a big hole like this, where you may not have an momentum in all the scenarios. Sure. And today, there are publications of using a biosynthetic mesh called Phasix in a scenario like this, which is very, very good. I have personally used it in many of my cases and it works very well. So you've got four options and you can select, but the best is step out and go into that endo abdominal fascia. That is where you will help. And that is where the cadaver dissection, if you attend that course, you will know how you have to go out and in. Yeah. Thank you. We sir. need sir, to keep point. the transversalis fascia down the peritoneum. Absolutely. And sir, the muscle sir. should be bare. Absolutely. So I'm fine. When you have a difficulty in closing the anterior uh, compartment, anterior rectus sheath, do you give a release on the anterior rectus sheath release and close it? Or is it mandatory to release, uh, suture always the anterior rectus sheath? See now, when we have done a posterior rectus sheath, posterior component separation, we would not want to do any other release procedure at that moment because we have already divided one muscle. In fact, there is a dictum that anterior and posterior component separation. I, I know that you are talking about anterior it's rectus like sheath. It is anterior. not external oblique. Yes. I know that. But anterior already the posterior rectus sheath is separated from the linear seminaris. It has gone down. So it is only the anterior rectus sheath which is transmitting that force to the lateral two and again three muscles. Okay. So in that case, any release, whether it's on the rectus sheath or on the external oblique, external is not advocated. You would rather keep it partly open, leave it as a bridge repair and fix it, but release will uh, not work. In fact, it will be deleterious. Finally, one simple question. Whenever we are placing the mesh, what is this, uh, what exactly the stretchability, whether you put the stretchability of the mesh laterally or vertically? The mesh will be stretchable on one side, one angle, either it will be lateral side or vertical side. When you are placing the mesh like this, when the stretchability should be on the lateral side, on the vertical side. No, I didn't understand. So, so you're talking about the anisotropic of the stretch. So the okay. vertical side, should vertical. it should be cranial cordal. Because vertical. linear alba is cranial cordal, so put it cranial cordal. And Morning, you side, said it is on the transfer side. So that's for... No, no, no. That I talked about the groin hernia. Groin, groin hernia. hernia. Because the groin hernia, anisotropy is this way. Yes. The abdomen, it is vertical. Vertical, yeah. Okay. That's and please refer to the paper called Decalogue of TAR, which is published in Polish Journal of Surgery. We have broken down this into 10 steps. It's a beautiful paper with nice drawings done by my residents. In fact, all these pictures which you're seeing, and I can see even a young lady here, you know, she's got fantastic drawing skills. So pick up someone from your team to do that and depict and try to demonstrate these pictures. You know, I really congratulate you. We will make you a part of the DI soon. Yeah. Thank you very thank much. You, thank you. Yeah. Sir, one comment with your permission. Please. Sir. Uh, sir, one comment with your permission. So uh, I see most of the audience are my young colleagues here. So one uh, rescue option before doing TAR is hernia sac preservation. So it is uh, our instinct as young surgeons to blitz the sac away while performing dissection. So try first to preserve the hernia sac, close it, use it as a posterior layer. And in case you're not still able to do that or the hernia sac is also very thin, then do TAR. As uh, all the seniors mentioned, uh, TAR is probably not the first procedure you should be starting out as a, as a junior surgeon. Uh, attend a workshop, go for a cadaveric course, have somebody senior who has experience doing this, that with you because there has been a lot of 
um, heat that we are facing on international circles because of unsupervised uh, surgeons performing advanced procedures. So this is just a word of caution as your junior colleague and friend. Thank you. Yeah. Now That's what? A what? Very what? Important what point yeah. Actually, in, preservation in, of the flaps. Yeah, you want to say something? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Preservation of sac is important, but this is true mainly in case of you are doing a laparoscopic repair so, or you are doing agreed. TAM or ETEP, but not true for the open repair. Okay. Open repair. Yes, you can you utilize the sac and everything. But the most important part is why we are using this sac is not to prevent only tar. The most important part is the defect size and how much lateral coverage of the mesh you are getting after reconstruction. Okay. And that is most important thing. We have seen utilization of the sac for eight by eight centimeter defect and they have used 15 by 15 centimeter mesh. This is not justified. Why? Because he has just dissected only a, uh, the RS plane. In open, I'm talking about. This is not justified. If you are dealing with a defect of eight by eight centimeter, your uh, the mesh size should be at least you can understand it should be at least twenty by twenty centimeter, at least. So that is how it goes. Definitely, okay. sir. Agreed. Thank you, sir. Any other question? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jignesh. Thank you, Chairpersons. Now, as a matter of fact, we are going to have a very brief inauguration. Uh, give us five minutes. It's going to be a brief one. As being a matter of uh, ASA protocol, we'd like to have a very brief inauguration. Can we have the chair set up? And uh, the way things are going, I think we'll be cutting short the lunchtime also. Kumaran is very firm in that all the talks should be given appropriate time. And happy, the discussions are robust. And we have close to 200 people online watching us at uh, various parts of the country and out of the country as well. So we'll have a very brief inauguration. TNSI uh, is planning for sequence of skin enhancement courses. So we have planned up robust programs every three months. It is uh, not going to be a, a regular conference event, which will happen in midterm and the state chapter annual meetings. But this will be like a single theme where you have one theme being discussed in full so that it is more practice based. So practicing surgeons have a robust uh, benefit of uh, coming to this course. So that's being curated. Uh, can I have the honor of having the uh, pleasure of calling up Dr. M. Elangovan, sir, the chairman of the Tamil Nadu chapter of the Association of Surgeons of India. Dr. Sundramoti, sir, the chairman elect of Tamil Nadu ASA chapter. Dr. Govindraj, sir, the immediate past chairman who did a stellar show of the annual uh, congress at the Trichy Marriott. And we have the honor of having Dr. Pramod Shinde, the president of the AWRSC group. And we have the honor of having Dr. Prem Kumar Balachandran, the boss of uh, they don't call us chairman or anything. They call the boss of uh, Chennai Hanya Society. Come up to the stage, please. Uh, I have the honor of calling upon the Joint Secretary, Dr. Ravindran Kumaran, to conquer the president, chairman. It has been a unique program and I could see the response from morning. We could see people arriving here at as early as 8.30. Uh, we in fact wanted to do a live program because of some clarity issues from the national ASI, we could not plan. But I'm sure I think now that ASI has come with very clear ideologies 
who and how the lives should be done. Subsequent programs we can have because we had a lot of restrictions and the chairman was very uh, like warning us, sir, let us go as per the norms. So ASI has now come up with robust uh, clarity about that. So with that few words, uh, can I have the honor of inviting the dignitaries to traditionally light the Kutu Velaka and uh, declare the... Can we have Zamir, sir? Is he here? Sir, please come up to the stage. And I think uh, I would call upon Shanti, ma'am. Satyapriya, ma'am. AWRSC. Madam, please come up to the stage. AWRC Tamil Nadu AC believes very strongly women should be put there in the right place. And please join us in such a way. Man. I could see Palia was there. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so this is not a protocol uh, based inauguration. So we'd like to have a quick blessings from each one of you. Can I have the honor of having the calling upon the immediate past chairman to give us his blessings, Dr. Govinda. Uh, on behalf of uh, the ASI Tamil Nadu, I should congratulate the Chennai team, particularly uh, Kumaran, Kanagavel, Prem, uh, Deepak, uh, Naveen, who have all been a part of this uh, new developing a AVR team. And uh, it's a wonderful thing, beginning for uh, the ASI to club with this a new group which is coming up called the AVR, AWR, sorry. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, so much of crowd in this kind of a meeting is uh, very rare in an ASI nowadays. And I'm so happy that the, the AWR team is bringing back the crowd which the ASI has been longing for some time. So I should congratulate the ASI team to do more programs like this. I think uh, this will be a uh, pioneer, this one of the, the mentor initiative. kind of programs for this. And thank you for inviting me. Thank you, sir. Uh, Chairman-elect, Dr. Sundar sir. Good morning to all. So uh, uh, when the Kumaran asked me about the inaugural function, I, I told that it's uh, only five minutes. So we don't want to waste the time. We are very much interested in learning things. So that's why we have made it as a very formal one. And of course, everything is coming, the single theme, as the Kanayal rightly told. Uh, the specialty becomes a super specialty, it becomes subspecialty like that. So when we hear about uh, laparoscopy, uh, hernia can be done in a laparoscopy, we are we, uh, surprised. Now it becomes E tap. In, uh, after a few days, a few, few years, it can become a S tap, super, uh, super uh, tap. Like that, it, it is going to be there. So, so you want to learn instead of uh, uh, saying uh, so many things, talking incompletely. This is a very good thing, single theme uh, approach. I congratulate uh, Dr. Kumaran and Kanagavil for the wonderful uh, I mean, uh, uh, efforts. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, that's where the wisdom from the current chairman of the Tamil Nadu ASI, Professor M. Melangovan, sir. Can we have the honor of listening to Dr. Sundara said the incoming chairman. Uh, they all, they all the surgical colleagues, seniors and youngsters. It's a wonderful program from the kindergarten level, even up to the master level. Wonderfully uh, plans have uh, they crafted the program. I am sure you all will get benefited to the maximum. Thanks to Kanagavel and uh, Dr. Kumaran. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, now we welcome the boss. Dr. Prem to bless us. Thank you, sir.
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Chennai Hernia Society, I'd like to thank uh, Ravindra and all the others of the Tamil Nadu ASI. Uh, I'm really glad and I really, really, really am so thankful to Dr. Pramod, Dr. Jignesh and Dr. Rahul, my good friends from the AWR, who have taken time. Dr. Rahul landed at 4 o'clock in the morning. And so, Dr. Jignesh, Dr. Pramod, really thank you for coming here. And uh, I think the proceedings are going very well. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Prem. Can I have the honor of listening to Dr. Shinde, the current president of the AWRSC International Group? Seniors and friends, I am really very happy to be here. And I, we are very happy to have these kind of programs for our young surgeons, juniors, seniors. We are all learning in the process. Whenever we go out, we ourselves learn listening to others also. As far as the Association of Surgeons of India is concerned, we are very proud to be members of that. In fact, in my own home state, we are conducting our Maharashtra state meeting of ASI in February 2024, where we'll be having a big AWR program also. And we as a community, we want every surgeon to learn and adopt. We have great initiatives like the Center of Excellence, which Rahul Mahadar is leading. We are developing a registry which we believe that every surgeon can contribute to the Indian data. So I'm very happy to be here and thank you once again. We look for, thank you, sir. We definitely look up on AWRSE for more uh, robust academic collaborations in the upcoming future. And uh, AWRSE has blessed uh, Tamil Nadu and Chennai with a very important responsibility, the deep impact surge. Deep impact was a runaway success in Delhi. Those who have attended will vouch for it. So it's going to be a very robust program planned during 2025, March 6 to 9 at uh, Chennai Trade Center. We look forward to have all of you. Kumaran, in fact, it is his brainchild to have his course. Let us hear from Kumaran what he had in his mind. I think his mission has been fairly successful. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, everybody, for coming along. Special thanks to people who come from Maharashtra. Incidentally, all three are national faculties are from Maharashtra. Shinde Sir, uh, Professor Jignesh Gandhi and Dr. Rahul Mahathakar. Really appreciate your time and effort because all of them happened to be in this Amasi uh, program which was happening in Raipur and they found time. They came in at all sorts of odd hours this morning. So we really appreciate your uh, presence here and you've enlightened us and I'm sure as the day progresses, you'll learn much more. Uh, special thanks to the uh, top uh, uh, leadership of TNASI for having allowed us to do this program here. Uh, we had to stop registrations at one point because we were overrun. Unfortunately, I came up with this idea of having a live transmission, which has actually dampened those people from coming in. So it is my fault that the hall is not completely full. And uh, single theme, uh, hopefully, will be the new buzzword. And if you are able to replicate this in the programs to come in future, I think it will be a runaway success for ASI's efforts to try and involve surgeons. Now, I think I'm I'm sure. Virtually everybody sat here is a practicing surgeon, excepting barring very few postgraduates. We were consciously trying to tell postgraduates not to come, thinking that we'll run out of space. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Kanadwell, for helping me organize this program. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. And uh, I think that is the shortest inauguration any society would have seen. And it's my responsibility to thank the uh, industry who has made this day a possibility. More so the commitment from BARD the makers of uh, the BARD group of meshes, the EcoPS, the 3D Max group of meshes. Thank you, BARD team, for uh, making this day a possibility. Call stores for all the support, academic support, for being staying with us, and the region group of companies. And also thank uh, the uh, Dhanashekar and team for providing a flawless connectivity. And in fact, I should put and record the help from the medical college at Raipur, uh, for uh, providing connectivity to Professor Palanivelu, sir. In fact, he was unsure whether to make it when Kumaran requested, sir, you have to be there. Then he said, okay, fine. He has to catch up a flight at 11.40. So he was here with us at 10.30. I wish he took the flight on time. So that shows the commitment towards the development of science. And we have three departments, four medical college HODs already, past HODs, my teachers, everybody here. And the Chennai Hanya Society is the most vibrant of the entire uh, surgical fraternity across the country. Thank you guys for uh, making it here. 
and uh, that's it and i think we move on to the academics and uh, we have very illuminated uh, uh, faculty dr patta neelamegam sir balashanmugam i don't want to miss out on any names we have another 4 hours to 5 hours of robust academics waiting for you and uh, i would like to uh, call up all the faculty to come up to the stage for a quick photo then we move on to the next session the panel by dr jignesh can we have all the faculty here uh, patta sir neela sir nandakishor chennai hania society team all of us we'll have a quick photo zameer sir ashanti ma'am satyapriya ma'am and who else if i'm missing dr <coughs> sahayam sir sindhul pandi are you around here the office bearers of chennai isi vijay rangan sir please join please join come on guys we'll have chandraladan sir johnson sir please come up F feel free <laughs> ramesh sir please sit down sir oh navin is here thank you i didn't see you are coming when suddenly is appearing great that's a pleasure of navin you can see him cycling all days and he cheers all the day morning with the blah. somewhere in chennai highlighted over the cycle much and uh, now uh, we move on to the next academic activity uh, friends i would request all of you to keep the mobile phones in silent modes it definitely disturbs our flow if you have by accident kept it on please ensure yours are in silent mode now we move on to the next panel discussion can we have the honor of calling upon again dr jignesh for making this program so we have two important panels uh one is a panel on inguinal hernia etep then we have uh inguinal hernia panel initially then we have panel on ventral hernia and we have few other important talks coming up uh can i have kumaran to call up the names of the panelists to come up to the stage ah it's there i'm sorry i think uh, dr kumaran himself dr tarun i think dr tarun sorry for the spelling mistake it's tarun chitrambalam and then uh, dr parimuthu kumar dr yes balashanmugam nilamegam sir and i think it is uh, i have requested dr jignesh to keep it lively so that we have floor participation it is only an index discussion will be have from that this is going to be sort of a open house model i requested dr jignesh and then i will definitely ask and uh, request dr jignesh to ask or allow 5 minutes of a uh, 10 minutes of time at the end so that if you have had any challenges can i have a quick voting how many of you are already doing it up can you please raise your hands both inguinal or ventral i could see hardly 15 20 people i think i am going to give the responsibility to dr jignesh to in thank you sir to inspire each one of you to get into it up i am sure in chennai at least 10 or 15 centers are robustly into it i am sure faculty will who are already doing etep will not mind you having for their cases etep is one very unique thing one should is very easily to be mastered but it opens up a huge world of hernia to you ladies and gentlemen dr jignesh you please thank you uh, so much so before the lunch uh, let's quickly go for this panel discussion with this eminent experts sitting here so what we're going to do is we're going to have some case scenarios and uh, we can just randomly decide who wants to get into that particular question and deep dive into it okay so maybe we will start from kumaran so i have no conflicts of interest but 
let me confess that I'm still learning it. I'm still learning even today. Every day I do a case, there is something which I find different and I, I share it, I copy it and then I want people to understand it better. So thank you very much, uh, the Chennai Society, Kanakbal, Kumaran. Both of them were actually uh, like a drone, you know, they were chasing me from Mumbai, you know, to the airport and then to, till the time I reached the room. In fact, when I reached the room at night, Kumaran actually sent me even the Wi-Fi password. He said, now go off to sleep, don't be on the Wi-Fi. So I can see the passion, you know, it was like a drone. I said, Kumaran drone in, Kanakbal drone after me. So let's go to the case scenarios. Uh, so we discussed it earlier, but quickly, do you want to run up on the position and the CO2 pressures? Kumaran, how would you like to keep in an ETEP or any groin hernia surgery, barring TAPP? Okay, so, Extra peritoneal repairs. So a position would be head down as you elicited earlier. Correct. Uh, I, I personally have a question. I'm learning in the process as well. So if you have an extremely obese patient with yeah. a huge tummy, then I think kind of having a curvature on the patient makes it easier when they are still head down. Am I right or wrong on this? Yeah, so so it all depends on the belly of the patient. So if the belly of the patient is pretty huge, uh, even giving in a head low position and we strap it, it works pretty well. Because sometimes uh, in a very pendulous belly, getting your trocar in and getting that angle, you will exhaust the entire length of the cannula. So if you give a little head low, at times even it has happened that I have strapped the abdomen and I've pulled it to the head end of the patient to make it flat. So that is something which you can do, a very loose strap, and that helps very well. What about the pressures, CO2 pressures? Uh, pressures, normally 12. Yeah. But then something which I learned from you is to start off with the low insufflation yeah. flow rate. Correct. Uh, normally, I wouldn't do that. But then, you know. So start always with uh, low flow, as Kumaran mentioned. Keep it on three. Uh, check it, because you may have a gynae before that who has a hysterectomy. They keep to tend to keep it at 20. So we need to do that. And early dissection of the zone. So a uh, doctor the next person uh, any dissection pattern when you're doing a groin hernia how will you approach which areas you will go in one i talked about always uh, follow the white stay in between the layers of uh, fascia transversalis see the coopers zone one dissection correct <clears throat> so 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 this is a paper uh, which came in very recently uh, keep clicking pictures as you want so what it clearly mentions as you rightly said is zone. that uh, we need to first tackle the zone one and two. Yes. Okay. So if you make more space here in the middle compartment and the lateral compartment, then when you come to zone three, which is a central area, your life becomes easy because in case if you are holding the peritoneum there, trying to twist it, trying to dissect it, and if you make a hole, at least these two zones will allow you some immunity in that area. Keep the name of, name of Absolutely. So, so that's very, very important. So these are the zones. So remember in which zones you're going to dissect. And by rule, not to hold the peritoneum for more than 20 to 30 seconds. So if you're dissecting, just keep it there and try to not hold it and squeeze it for more. Because the more you hold it, there are very high chance that your instrument itself can create a rent into the peritoneum. So, sir, uh, let's move to the next gentleman. So, uh, ETEP in a right inguinal with a previous history of open appendectomy. So, any precautions? Um, I'm not debating here that whether you can do a TAPP or a TAP. We are assuming this is a case and you want to do an ETEP. What are the precautions you will take? The bowel preparation I will do. Fine. Okay. okay. The other precaution is here probably will start a little more, more medial dissection comes to the lateral one. Okay. So you will do more of the zone. Uh, zone 2 first and then approach the zone 1. Correct. Cautious, so you... cautious while doing zone 1. Especially so... because previous scarring, that plane might have been lost. So, so chance of having a nerve damage, you should be very, very cautious about this. So in a scenario like this, uh, the problems anticipated are that you will have the peritoneum stuck in there because obviously the patient has undergone an open appendectomy. You have a very high chance that you can make a rent in the peritoneum there. So you create more medial space and you have to be prepared that there is a likely possibility. So more sharper dissection going more towards the roof. Uh, try to remain around that. And at one point in time, somewhere you might find a sac uh, which is going in there. So this is uh, how it goes in. So this was a patient with that dissection. As you can see here, uh, you can see I've kept the fascia transversal is on the roof intact. And I'm just trying to be between the two layers. But somewhere you will have a pinch of peritoneum, which usually would be caught in that area. And there's a likely possibility. But you can see here that I've already made a big pocket over there. I've made some pocket over there. And now I'm going into this area where there is a likely possibility of the adhesions coming in. And you can see here that, you know, it's, it's, it's inevitable that you may have and you will have a rent. So rule number two, cold dissection. 
So I will not use any energy here because I don't know what is sneaking in from below. Is it a loop of the bowel? And as you can see here, that this was a pinch of the loop which was stuck in there. And that's the reason this is happening. So you can see in spite of this rent, we are not losing the space. This is the biggest advantage of ETEP that the space is not lost and you can continue in the dissection. And as you can see here, there's a rent which I'm going to close in, but because I have done the zone one and two dissection now, you know, slowly you can see here, I'm now going towards a sac, which is adherent in that area. So these things are possible in a TAPP also, I'm not debating that, but ETEP is also possible because you can create larger pockets. Idea is try to remain and you can see a scissor dissection all the time, I will try and not to use a monopolar, a bipolar, even a harmonic in this area. And then just keep dissecting that area. Once you have dissected that area, you can see that you can deliver the sac completely. So this is where you will be doing. That's the dulux fascia, which we were talking about laterally and preserving those nerves in this particular area. So, sir, uh, any special precautions when you are doing an ETEP inguinal because patient is on a blood thinner or... We've seen a lot of patients now in the COVID era, they had started with some decoction to save their life. And all of them had combined, you know, a couple of herbs from different parts of the world, uh, which now are acting in our, and you must have seen patients become very oozy. So any special precautions in such scenario? Actually, you know, we have to get an opinion from cardiologists. There are different blood thinners are available. Some are very, very cause aggressive bleeding, like Brillanta is one drag, which can cause even after stopping five or six days. You can see a lot of bleeding from the muscle. That's a lateral compartment sometimes. So, get into so, the any, muscle. Any, so any precautions you will take in drop, any gadgets you would like to yeah, use? Yeah, we will take a bipolar and a ligature or harmonic. I think I believe in ligature, which gives a complete so, atmospheric approach. Correct. So, so and so if you're at the right plane, yeah, the bleeding is less. Only the lateral where the muscles are coming, that's where you have to be a little careful. If you puncture the muscle, probably you'll have more bleeding. So, uh, as you rightly mentioned, uh, meticulous use and spend more time on hemostasis because these are the patients who can give you trouble later on. On the table, they may look fine, but here you can see that I'm making those small dissections. Uh, this is one of the spatulas which has been designed by uh, me with one of the companies, which has got an angle of about 35 to 40 degree. What it does is the sharp end helps in dissection and the flat end helps you to kind of push things away. And you can see here, I have barely touched <clears throat> a few tissues here but you can still see that the blood has got accumulated. This is, if you see this scenario, that means either your patient is alcoholic, which is hiding the history. He's taking some herbal medications. He's on some kind of alternative medications. And these patients, if you do not achieve a good hemostasis, as rightly mentioned with a unipolar or a bipolar, then you can be in trouble. So uh, try to do that all the time. Uh, the second thing is, if you can see when we are dissecting and I'm using in a, a molopondar, you will see that the gas is not is getting escaped very fast. So the trick for this is uh, increase the flow from 3 to 10 or 15. And what I do is keep one of the 5 millimeters partially open. So this will now create an exchange phenomena. So a lot of time people ask, you know, when we are inside, why it is looking so foggy? So the trick is increase the flow, open one of the 5 millimeters, and you will find the moment you will touch a monopolar or a bipolar, whatever is a smoke will escape out soon because at the same speed the gas is coming in. So this is one of the tricks which you can do. <clears throat> ETEP inguinal, uh, any comments, sir, on the BRICS or the Thompson artery approach and strategy? So basically, uh, you know, arterial thing is once you put the port, you have to be careful. Yes. As you said, you know, if the bevel is going to not look up, Correct. and if it's going to be lower down, and right. you're going to push it, basically you can injure the artery. Correct. And if you're going to injure the artery, then you should know where to ligate it. Either you ligate, ligate it low rather than in the middle. That saves you the uh, no so, problem. So I will talk about it. Uh, you have made it a very valid point is that infrapagastric artery bleeding. I was talking about BRICS artery, which goes from the infrapagastric to the umbilicus. But this is the only artery in the body where the blood comes towards the heart. That means that when it bleeds, you need to have a control more proximally rather than you know controlling at the same level. So I've seen people kind of clipping it up and down. Don't do that. Go below. Just put in a clip at that area and you will suddenly find that the pressure in the blood has gone down. So this is again a video to show. This is uh, how the BRICS artery is. So this is I'm going layer by layer. In fact, when you're doing an optical entry itself, uh, it's very easy for you to identify the BRICS artery. So you can see here that I'm doing the dissection. And in a moment, uh, you will see a structure which will be running on the roof over there. 
Uh, this is again by the optical technique. So go very, very slow. The moment you find that there is a vessel, try to stay below that. Because the moment you stay below that, you can see this, how I changed my angle. This is my brick's artery there. So this is very, very important because if you don't do that, you can see here, the moment I've done that, I've gone into the perfect white plane. But if you keep continuing without understanding, so usually it is at the level of umbilicus. So when you're doing an optical entry, look from outside that at the level of umbilicus, now I will go slow and I will dip down so that I can cruise into that layer very, very comfortably. And this is where you continue with it. So this is uh, uh, this, this is how it is. Look at it. It pulsates pretty fairly well. It's a large vessel. This is your left side of the patient. That's the midline here. And once you have a bleeding in this particular area, sometimes you can have small twigs here. You can see how I'm trying to use in a bipolar and trying to coagulate that particular area. Just do that and then proceed. Because if you don't take care of this particular twig, which is the Briggs artery or the Thompson's artery, then you can have a lot of bleeding which is coming in. Quite often it has happened, you have finished the case and the bleeding continues and then you're in the trouble. So this is the way you will handle that. How many of you uh, has used Kumaran? Any use of patty? Anyone in the audience use the patty? Patty is something which is used by neurosurgeons. It looks like this. And one day when I was observing my neurosurgeon because my patient was getting induced, I just pipped in there and I just found it was a phenomenal material. It's also known as cottonoid in the language and it has got a fantastic absorbent capacity. The best advantage of it is that it can go through a 10 or a 12 and it can come out through a 5. The problem is when you put in a gauze piece with a RO, Creating it out is a challenge because it cannot come out through a five millimeter, but this one comes out very easily. So, sir, you you have an experience of using a patty? No, sir, but I always use a gauze piece. Make it into half, not a full gauze. Yeah. Make it into half. It goes in easily and comes out. So, next time I would probably recommend. So, this is one of the cases where you can see I'm using in a patty. They are available in different lengths. Cost. 60 to 70 rupees. That's it. So why can't we spend that amount? And you can see here, what it does is all the small spots which you have in the bleeding, it takes care of it very, very well. So you can see here, I'm using in a bipolar, using in a patty. And the best part is that it absorbs the fluid pretty well. It doesn't leave any shreds or any fibers coming out from the gauze pieces. And it works very well in that area. So this is one of the indications of using in a patty, also known as a cottonoid, in your dissection when you're doing an ETEP case. Let's come to this interesting case. Kumaran, I'll start with you. Uh, a happy new year case for me. So this was a patient which I had operated, uh, I think, 2020-21 or 22, uh, on 20th of December, ETEP inguinal. So we do an ETEP inguinal for him. <clears throat> and I'm like all set with the family. 31st is coming soon. Let's party. It's going to be the first 31st after the all uh, drama of uh, COVID. So watch this video. So this is when I'm completing the procedure. Okay. Uh, Kuvarin, do you smell anything? Do you think something is wrong? I have done kind of a brutal dissection. Was where there is there a bloodbath? How many in the audience you feel that there is a bloodbath? How many of you are happy with the dissection that, you know, it's fairly good and achievable hemostasis? I think most of you are on my side, isn't it? Looks fine. Yes, Kumaran. So anything you feel is different here? So this is where I do the desufflation, insufflation test. Okay. And uh, the patient uh, merrily goes home. And then what happens is after that is uh, I get a phone call saying that, uh, 31st, I'm about to leave. Uh, we already reached the venue where we are going to have the party time. And Kumaran, you get a call from the emergency saying that uh, the patient has come to the casualty and uh, he is collapsed. Wow. So they try to revive him. Collapse, I mean to say he was hypotensive, feeling giddy, and the blood pressure is around 70 to 80 millimeters of mercury. Yes, Kumaran, your approach. That, that is... Sorry? So this was at, at the, just above at the Coopers. Coopers. Do you have a lateral tack as well? No, there are no lateral tacks. So I don't put lateral tackers. I will talk about that in the next scenario. Yeah. Bladder injury. The, I always catheterize the patient. So that is one thing which you should go. The incidence of corti is more when the catheter is in for more than 72 hours. In 24 hours, there is no problem. So stay away from that Western world culture. I don't put catheter. I don't put catheter. Yes, sir. No, this is corona mortis is there, sir. This is the left side of the patient. That's the, this is your triangle of doom. 
This is my all me here, nothing. In free pegastrics, so I did a CT scan on this patient, in free pegastric artery intact. Lower what of the mesh is too low, so you have to go two centimeters below. That is enough. Yes, Was Kumar. there a hidden injury to the iliacs, which you were not aware of? Iliacs, I, I, I would probably, probably it would manifest. It will not go from 28, 29, 30 and 31st when I just no, about if, to if open my if beer the bottle. If there injury to the vein and it giving off after some time. Or... So three days is too much, isn't it? And you could, you'll pick it up on a CT angio. CT angio was okay. CT angio just said, sir, there's a big clot there. The hemoglobin dropped by two gram person. Anyone in the audience? Venous bleed from where? <clears throat> so rectal veins. Okay, fine. So, so that could be one possibility, but as you can see here, that's the reason I have put up this thing. This, sorry, distal sac. No. So there was, so it, it was a direct hernia anyway. So it continued. And then I was also as anxious as you were uh, to see where the blood was. So when you go in uh, Kumaran and uh, you see a scenario like this, uh, what are you actually looking at? Is there any pattern which any surgeon will observe when you see a clot in a TEP space? Anyone? Kumar? You do get the scenario where you have a hematoma and when you go back, then you don't find the bleeder, right? Okay. No, but what would you, looking at the hematoma pattern, would it give you any scenario? What's happening? Some, some article. So most important learning point is when you get a hematoma, see whether the hematoma is in the front of the mesh or behind the mesh. If it is behind the mesh, that means the culprit vessel is at the back. So you will now think that something is coming from the surface of the abdominal wall and corona mortis. But if I get the bleeding from the front of the mesh, as you can see here, that means there is something which has happened around the peritoneal dissection, which I have done. So this is one thing which all of us as surgeons should see whether the mesh is floating or the mesh is on the roof. Here the mesh is on the roof and the clot is on the floor. So now, anyone, sir, what is happening? Vesicle veins, no. So uh, when, when I finish, I'll just complete of uh, this video. Clots everywhere. No, Infrepigastics were absolutely intact. Bricks are... Just clots everywhere. And uh, then I achieve a hemostasis, uh, a metrogel wash. I take out that mesh. Uh, I'm happy with the hemostasis. The blood pressure is fine. And now I think that I should probably replace this mesh because I didn't want a mesh which was with the clots to be there. It was tough, but I removed it and I put it again because it was on an infected mesh. But I just wanted to be sure that the patient has got a good outcome. So we did that. And then there was an extensive debate about what's happening. I had sleepless nights for the first, second and third of January, thinking what's happening, what's happening. The hemat person is in my team. So any guess what's happened, sir? Was he on blood thinners? Any blood thinners? No, he was not on blood thinners. I would have told you upright. So to cut short the story, uh, this patient had a post-op pain. And then on discharge, he was given diclofenac sodium. Diclofenac sodium is a very interesting drug. What it does is in select patients, it causes thromboasthenia. So it interferes with the platelet aggregation, one of the most dangerous drugs, which I just don't like giving most of the times. So remember guys, don't give it right, left and center. This was diclofenac induced thromboasthenia. So the primary hemostasis never happened in this patient. And because a platelet plugged in form, this guy was already in a party mode on the 30th because 31st is coming. He was jolting. So after the curse, everything was done. He said, sir, I'm sorry, but actually I danced at home. And then suddenly I felt giddy and then I fell down. So all those things happened. Remember, so this was a thromboisinia case, which you have another variety called Glansmus thromboisinia, which we have just published in JMAS. You will see the article soon. The platelet aggregation was a problem. And that's the reason this happened. Okay. So devil certificate. How did he actually prove that that was the So we did all the other tests and this was a diagnosis of exclusion. So my hematologist did everything possible, factor 7, factor 8, because this was a very VIP patient. We did everything possible and then he came to a conclusion, this is a primary hemostasis and not the secondary hemostasis. So, so it was not evidence-based, right? So Correct. the reason I'm saying this yeah. is I am somebody who is a big proponent of using diclofenac. I use it left, right, center for every patient unless they go renal failure or extremely poor. So I will tell you another I... case in the lunch break. You will stop using it from tomorrow. I will tell you another case of a laparoscopic uh, cholecystectomy in this part of India. A friend of mine given diclofenac sodium intramuscular of lap coli on the fifth day, a young lady of 32 died. It's a Sorry, court case. In. Died. She died. And I will, I will deal with anyone who is interested in that case. We'll have a chai pe charcha in the afternoon. Again, diclofenac induced. Okay. So we'll talk about Sorry. it.
sorry the platelet counts were normal sir the problem is not the counts it is the stickiness of the platelets which is affected okay so it's a stickiness so remember i am not against diclofenac sodium that is the case do you have issues with the bleeding and clotting time no everything remains normal they are just lazy it's that's the reason it is known as thromboasthenia okay given oral or IM, sir? nothing this was so this was his first encounter luckily it was me on 31st of december i was about to open my corona beer and i said no i can't i have to go to the hospital yeah so let's go to the next scenario uh uh, ETEP inguinal large indirect sac. Any yeah. strategy? Yeah. Large indirect. We discussed in the morning. Yes, sir. Large indirect always uh, we try to dissect the sac as much as possible and at one point of time where it is very close or uh, to the. Uh, so, would you, we would try you try to abandon the sac at that point? So, you will leave the distal sac? Yes. How many of you would go ahead and make an attempt to dissect the sac? So, I will also make an attempt to dissect the sac. Obviously, not endangering the vital vast difference. Correct. The problem is this. This is the distal sac. When people talk to me about that, I have left the distal sac. I don't know whether they cut it here or they cut it here or they cut it here. And this is what makes the difference. Because if I'm going to cut it over here, I'm leaving in a large piece of uh, sac inside. And now I'm telling this patient because he will keep coming to you with a seroma. Then you will give him an explanation that this is just a fluid. Then from me, he will, I have operated, he will come to Chennai to go to Kumaran. Then he will go to Kanagwell, he will go to Kannan. And all of them will say, no, 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 it will absorb, it will absorb. Finally, he will develop a hydrocele. So he is made me famous all over South India coming from Mumbai. This is the problem which I have seen. So yes, safety is important. Leave the distal sac, but the cut where you are making is very, very important. So don't try to preserve 70 to 80 percent sac just because you want to leave the distal sac. It has to be transacted as distal as possible, as much is as something which is very, very important to understand. What to do with the distal sac? I have even gone ahead and done a hybrid. So we will discuss that where we make a small incision and do that. So this is again a scenario for you to see that. This is where you can see the sac. Uh, you will always see me using this spatula, which goes by my initials, the Jack spatula. And I just like it. Look at the way it helps you to dissect. Uh, I'm not trying to market you, but what I'm trying to tell you is that there is a product. This is something which helps you because in the pelvis, the dissection always happens along the dome and in the curves. When you use in a spatula, you use like this. The settings on the electrosurgery, I would usually keep the settings at 30 and I will use a tapping current of cutting and not coagulation or a blend mode. And it works very well. And here you can see that you keep on tapping, keep on tapping, and you will see that your dissection continues. Try to see the edge of the mesh. Now, this is again a very, very important approach. Just stay to one plane. I have seen people going this side, again, this side, this side, this side. And in that, what happens is you tend to lose the plane. Stick to one plane, as you can see here. Once you stick to one plane, you will see that the dissection happens fairly smoothly. And then you can take the edge of the mesh, dissect out completely. And once you have done that, you will see that the sac comes in very, very comfortably and you can take this. So this is again a short burst of current. So now I'm at the proximal end of the fundus. What I'm using is a short blend of cutting current. Guys, we are told in laparoscopy not to use cutting. This is one of the indications where cutting works beautifully well. And just it should be short burst because cutting what it gives you is it gives you a depth cutting. It goes in the depth and it doesn't go have a lateral spread. Look at the same patient. I have kept on holding there. This is where your vas is coming in. And then just going step by step, step by step. And then you can just dissect out that area. Now, slowly you will see the fundus. I can tell you with experience that it takes additional 10 or 12 or 15 minutes. It was very easy for me to snap out the sac there. But what I've done is I've made all the attempt just to see that I can take out that entire thing. And what I did now, before you take the last strand, release the sac inside. Because sometimes you can make a vessel taut. And then you snap it. You will find some bleeding at the fundus, but the major bleeder has gone inside. So what I'm doing now is before I snap it off, here you can see that I put it and I take it out again. When I take it out again, if I don't find any blood over here, that means it was not a major vessel. So try doing this before you snap it out because it works very well. And then your chances of scrotal hematoma also will go down. Inguinoscrotal, sir, strategy, big inguinoscrotal. We are not debating TAPP versus everything we are talking about in ETEP, inguinoscrotal. Definitely, I'll uh, again I'll emphasis on bowel preparation. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I'll always make sure I'll put the patient on liquid diet because it's a large inguinoscrotal. So, any strategies intraoperatively? 
So one is reduction of contents under GA, isn't it? You will always try to reduce the contents under GA. Uh, if you can, you are lucky, you will get away with that, isn't it? Uh, what else, sir? Here you will require extra hand from outside. The external pressure will... Uh, external pressure would external be required, but reduce. usually, yeah. So I would do all that thing before I put my drapes because after putting in a drape, I don't want someone going and munching with the scrotum of the patient, isn't it? Because it makes the whole feel unsterile. Having said that, you can do through the drapes. Wider dissection, so all the zones, the lateral zones. dissection and the medial dissection should be more, more and then approach the sac there. Open the sac and reduce the contents if required. And then a hybrid approach should always be kept in mind. So watch this particular video. So this is again a patient with a large inguinoscotal as you can see here. So I'm dissecting out everything. Uh, if I decide that I'm going to have an inguinoscotal approach, what I will do is I may open up the sac even midway because I know that I'm going to remove the distal part of the sac. And this is where you can see now, look at that. When I, when I was doing this step, the omentum just kept on coming. So it reminded me of that scene from Mahabharata, you know, it just kept coming, coming, coming like a Krishna. And I said, who's feeding the momentum from the top? Because it was just coming forever. And here you can see, you can reduce the entire momentum. And this is possible because it's an ETEP approach. If it was a TEP, you would have been in trouble. So you can see here, you're dissecting at all well. Yes, you can have a TAPP reduce and again come in a TEP plane. So I'm not debating that. But what I'm trying to tell you is that ETEP approach, it is possible to do that. So you get everything there. Once you have done all that, remember omental hemostasis. So for the postgraduates, this is my favorite question. Why omental hemostasis is so important? Omentum does not have any muscle fibers. So if it bleeds inside in an omentum, which has gone inside the abdomen, it will form a huge hematoma. So omentum does not have natural hemostatic mechanisms. So bring in all that. And once you have brought all that omentum down, which was a couple of kgs, now, because we have done an ETEP approach, the sac is open. It is very, very, so you can see here, meticulous omentostasis. I call this as omentostasis. So I've done that and I'm putting everything very, very comfortably inside. It goes in all well. And then we, we, can, we can easily finish off the case and do a hybrid approach. So you can see there how everything goes in very, very easily. So this is possible. This is possible because this is an ETEP approach. And look at the space which we have dissected. Now the entire thing is your way and you can do things comfortably. This is again another uh, quick case. Uh, I will just uh, go through that video very quickly just to show you. Look at that. Look at the amount of momentum which I have removed from the right side and then it all goes inside. Okay, so this is all possible. Not in every case it does go in so easily. So, <laughs> yes. So, you if it all depends on the chronicity, how much of the adhesions you have at the top. So, in such a case, what you use is a case where you will slice the momentum at a particular level meticulous hemostasis and the rest of the bit will take it out from the hybrid, hybrid. approach. You're absolutely right. right. Yes, sir. Uh, next case, ETEP inguinal, yes. ETEP inguinal done. And a patient is complaining of severe post-operative pain along the distribution of ilioinguinal nerve. What's so, happening, sir? So just review the video, whether okay. you have gone, put any taker or suture over that area. Where? Where is that area? On the lateral. Lateral aspects, any yeah. landmarks, anyone? Yeah. Yeah. Not Sabri. Yeah. Any landmarks? Okay. Sabri, you don't keep on answering, isn't it? Yeah. So this is what I call it, you know, so these are those tacky surgeons of the hernia world, you know, with right and left hand, they are just tacking, tuck, 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 everywhere. Yeah. So these are the, I should not use the word Rambo, but the, these are the tacky surgeons of the hernia world. And then they just don't think, give me the tacker and let me shoot everywhere. The problem is, remember, these, this is anatomy, neuroanatomy of the groin. In the upper abdomen, at the level of the ASIS, iliohypogastric, ilioinguinal, they become turn about 1.5 to 2 centimeters medial to the ASIS and then they go into the groin. You can watch it very beautifully. 30% of the patients, they commit as a common trunk. So you will not see them as two, you will see them as one. If you put any tack in this area, which is 1.5 centimeters medial. So as a learning, what we do is this. So whenever I'm in coming in that area, so here you can see that I would mark out where my ASIS is. And then once I know where my ASIS is, then as a learning point, what we do is we try to put in a spinal needle and we can just kind of mark out that area that, okay, this is my ASIS. You can see the nerves just below that sheet, that thin layer of sheet is uh, preserved. And once we have done that, this is where we mark out that area. So you can see here, I have put the needle there. I know. I will not go on that side. This is the right side of the patient. 
put a needle there. You know that I'm in the safety zone. I will not put any tag beyond that. And then as you learn, you will get experience of this is my area where I should be away. Because when you have put in a mesh, after putting in the mesh, you will just right and left and keep on tacking and accidentally you can trap that nerve. I've had two patients like that. And then we had to do a retroperitoneal ETEP excess and a neurectomy. And then the patient was relieved. But this is something which is avoidable and can be practiced. Yes, sir. ETEP after a previous ETEP. That means you have done an ETEP approach. I'll give you the scenario. Right-sided groin hernia done with the left-sided approach. Now, after six months, patient comes with a hernia on the same side of your optical trocar. That means on the left side. Same thing. So we are not debating open Lekenstein, TAPP. Is it possible? Can we do it or should we not do it? Or when we should do it? You can still do it, sir. The first, the approach on the other side and okay. then go towards the uh, recurrent side because he's got bilateral hernia, as you said. So I would first tackle the other side with the ETEP, see what is the uh, problem down there. And then I will go ahead and... So, so one of the things, uh, as you rightly mentioned, what I will do is I will mark out my area where I have done the previous dissection. I have gone from this side, I have dissected on that side and the right side. So I will take a marker and fairly remember that these are the areas where it's going to be very sticky and my muscle is going to be very, very adherent there. So you can see here, uh, I go from the opposite side, create that space there. And once we create that space where as we will keep coming a little bit more downwards, you will see that things get more and more sticky. But you have a limited space there on that side. So this is our re tap axis. So now you can see this is where is the mesh of the left side. I have now patient has come back with a hernia on the right side. So this is my previous mesh. And now I have made a little bit space here. I know that this is all going to be frozen. So now I start approaching slowly. So again, zone dissection, do the medial dissection first, because if I make a hole or accidentally, you know, pneumoperitoneum, I'm happy. Now you can see here, because I had approached from this side for the left sided hernia, this is going to be sticky. So now I will change my energy device to a bipolar and I will slowly keep on going and see to it that the muscle starts going onto the roof. In this cases, even recently I had done, so I've got a good series of patients, ETEP with ETEP. Infrared epigastics sometimes can be a trouble. So you need to clip them with a five millimeter hemlock. So here you can see now, I'm using in a bipolar cutting effect. So this is where you can use a bipolar, keep on dissecting that and slowly you start creating that plane. Sometimes you can even have a small uh, peritoneal rent. Don't worry about it. It all settles down. So now slowly layer by layer, you keep on dissecting that space and you can approach the right side space. Moment you approach the right side space, the lateral part. So this is a rent in the peritoneum, which is subsequently closed, but it's very easy. And I will start using in a cold dissection with the scissors. So now you can see here, I have done all the right-sided dissection very, very comfortably. Once I've done all that right-sided dissection, this is my sac. I will twist the sac. I will put in my loop there. So I usually use in a Vicryl, a 2-0. I make a loop of my own. I don't use the endolope with a cat gut. I don't feel that a cat gut should be used. But again, that is debatable. This is again the mesh from the previous side. There's a good fibrosis. I will just try to kind of put in a mesh there. This is a small rent, which you had seen earlier. And then... This is my uh, go-to go mesh, which is a three-dimensional mesh. Why I use it? Because it covers all the three defects and the deployment is very easy. And again, the principle is center of the mesh is the center of the defect. Any word about mini ETEP? Anyone has done a mini ETEP, sir? Or you have heard about it for the first time today? Yeah, mini ETEP. Only Melissa's technique, P ETEP? No, no, no. no. Uh, he this puts is mini ETEP. Uh, so this is quotes in the similar. Okay, so this is mini ETEP. I, I can't, you know, think about replicating his technique. Kumaran, mini tip. Okay. So uh, not to advertise again, but there's a beautiful instrument available by uh, Teleflex guys. I don't know how many of you have seen. They've got a fantastic gamut of instruments today. And they have this three millimeter instrument, which you can put in through easily. You can see that instrument over there. It just requires a stab knife. So there is no port now. It is just a stab on the skin and my instrument goes inside. And you can see here, it has got this spatula. And look at that, how beautifully that spatula works. So I have been using this in cases where I suspect that it's going to be a direct hernia, a thin limb patient, but practically you can resemble reduce port, reduce pain. That's what is the idea. It's not to show that something is fancy, 
But what I'm trying to tell you is that this is one of the ways that you can use this instrument. The best part is that this angle part of the metal which is coming out, you can as a surgeon decide and you can see there's a nice insulation there. So actually it is only this much part which works. And you can even put this in and out and you can just expose a part of the tip. So this is something uh, which we've been doing now called the mini ETEP. That means a reduced port. Uh, we can also have a similar instrument which they have it on the left side. So you can have two 3 millimeter port, one 12 millimeter, and your job is done. So this is something which you can do. And this is, you can see the end of the procedure. That's a 5 millimeter. And look at that. This is just a dot. This is my marking. But actually, I had to use it. It's just one dot there. And this patient had a fairly good recovery. So the idea is using the technology for the benefit what we are doing. How would you prevent Kumaran a mesh folding? In an ETEP, you, because mesh folding is a perfect recipe for meshoma. When we have a meshoma, why it happens? A, because you do not catheterize the patient. You are into that Western world of thought. Your bladder gets filled up postoperatively in the recovery. The medial part of the mesh rolls. The medial rolls, and now it's going to roll like a Swiss roll. This patient will develop a meshoma. So your points. I think the key is to have extensive dissection so okay. that you know the Good so adequate size meshes okay. will be placed. Okay. I think always the largest possible mesh goes in. I think the extra large and in, you know, especially okay. in 3D max. Okay. And uh, you know, you when you keep the mesh in place, obviously it shouldn't be folded. You make sure that the peritoneum is well below. Yes. And then you do this test where you let the pneumo out. Absolutely. Make sure it doesn't fold. Then again, reintroduce the pneumo. Make sure it is in the same position before Perfect. you eventually come out. So, so we always do this. So look at this. This is a dissection done on both the sides. That's my 3D mesh on both the sides. Uh, I hold and I call them as jags buttocks. You know, so they look like heels buttock. We are publishing a paper on this as well. So both the buttocks are coming up. And here you can see I am disufflating. And when I'm insufflating it again, I will see that is there any mesh which was folded on the upper part, lower part. If you do not look at this, you will have a patient sure with a problem with MTI or with a meshoma formation. So you then re-insufflate. And when I'm re-insufflating, my end points are that my lower edge of the mesh is uh, peritoneum is not going behind the mesh. And on all the sides, I'm not having any folding of the mesh. So the center of the mesh is the center of the defect. You have an overlap of the mesh in the midline. And most important is no folding of the mesh. If there is a folding of the mesh, I have seen in some of the workshops also, people just kind of patch it up and do it. Let's not do that. Let's make that extra pocket laterally. And this is what happens when you're doing a TEP. Because in the midline ports, your medial placement of the mesh over the midline is little suffering. And then you have a chopstick effect where you can fold the mesh. So be very, very careful about that. This is an ETEP Anna case. Uh, yeah, so anyone Anna here from you know, Chennai Anna who wants to take up this? Anyone who wants to take up this for an ETEP? This was given to me in a workshop. Yeah. So plan and, uh, you know, so how will you plan? Anyone? Hybrid. Hybrid. So let's have a quick pull. Open, open. Open. Sir wants open. Open. Hybrid approach. Okay. Kumaran, Anna case. You are the Anna of this place. No? Kannan, Kanna Gwell, anyone wants to do this? I'm not asking Rahul because he can do everything. Yeah. Hybrid way approach. So uh, I don't want to go to the video, but yes, this patient was given to me uh, in a workshop. Uh, what is important in such patient is to know the loss of domain phenomena. So you, again, you will do a CT scan because sometimes this patient, so the way it works is uh, beautifully in uh, this particular paper. So you have all these options available as everyone said. And the last option is referred to a dear friend in Mumbai, which is also a good option, which you can do. But this is a paper which talks about these giant hernias and the way this they have done is they have classified into type 1, type 2 and type 3. So when you have anything which is type 3, look into the loss of domain. That means again, if you are 20% of the contents, they are out, then this patient may need some strategy of Botox and then you will do it. Uh, this case which was offered to me, we did a reef stopas repair from the right side with a paramedian incision. The important part, always remember in such patient is do not excise the sac too much. Why? Because this sac remains your immunity that suppose if you put everything inside and now the patient develops a compartment syndrome and you open up, where will you put those contents? So a part of the sac is kept in such a cases when you deal with cases like this. Do not snap off the entire sac. So that is one of the learnings which you should do from this case. Having said that, a type 1 or a type 2 is doable where I can go inside, reduce all the contents, come in the TEP plane again and do an ETEP. 
So yes, we are all right. We can do a safe, a hybrid approach in a patient like this. So let's, these are the last slides, uh, critical anatomical landmarks where uh, Kumaran, you will tell trespassers will be prosecuted in an ETEP where you don't want, don't go there. Can you just enumerate? In an ETEP inguinal anatomy. No, obviously, don't kind of go past the posterior uh, rectus sheath when you're kind of accessing. Okay, that is number one. Then number next, one. let's keep shifting the mic. Then I'll go through all of them. Where you should not go, trespassers, you'll be yeah, chopped. Dissect up to the uh, level where was difference takes a turn. Or okay, the fine. Was different takes a turn. <clears throat> then lateral dissection, don't bear the muscles. Okay, sir. We see all the white. White structures, fantastic. Okay. So let's go to very quickly uh, things where you should not go Corona mortis. Yeah. Try not to be very aggressive there. Try to keep a little bit of fascia over it intact because you know this can create a problem. The next landmark is no excessive dissection in obturate canal. Sometimes I've seen people hunting for it. Hey, last time Jignesh had shown one obturator hernia. Let me just dig in and see whether it's there. It's not there. If it's not there unnecessarily, don't try to go there. If you have a bleeding there, God forbid, you will be in serious trouble. So try to be very, very careful when you are there because you can injure the next thing is what you should see is for this particular line which Sabri showed in the morning the iliopubic tract once I know this landmark no tax over here everything above it I will not even look below it and try to even put and be that silver switch stallion over there the next landmark which all of us as surgeons should look out as you rightly said are the infrepicastic vessels always try to keep a little sheath intact over the vessels don't try to make it bare and that is possible when you remain in the right plane if you remain with the fascia transversalis below that you will never, never endanger that so this is something which you should not the next landmark as someone rightly said is the vast efference do not touch it try to stay away from there and do your dissection till the vas goes down the next point which you're looking at is the triangle of doom. We don't want to go there. And finally, the bladder and the prostate, someone pointed out, sometimes in elderly patients, this can be nasty. In patients who's got recurrent prostatitis, elderly patient, even a little bit of touch in that area, you can be in serious bleeding. I can tell you, just be very careful, bipolar, even if you require some kind of surgery cell, uh, tissue, but just kind of stop that. And obviously the lateral part. So finally, uh, I would just like all of you to bring out to this classification, which we have recently published in Hernia Journal. This is the first mesh explantation classification in the world. And I'm proud that all of us as Indians are going to lead the world. So this, what we have done is because when I see a patient coming with a mesh infection, there is only one line written mesh explantation done, but where, which. So what we have done is we have made a very beautiful TNM classification. What this classification does is it brings a standardization. So you know that you are removing the mesh from which plane. Have you removed the tackers, not removed the catters, whether there's a fistula. So try adopting this classification. So next time you have explanted a mesh, you can write down, it can be E0 or E1, T1, N0, M1. I think once we start using this more and more, it's going to be very helpful. So this is my plea to all of you over here to adopt this classification. Uh, this was a patient again where an ETEP inguinal was done and the mesh got infected. So Kumaran, very quickly, last case scenario, approach. ETEP inguinal patient is a young boy uh, done in the east of India and then he starts getting fever at around two to three months. Right. Obviously, uh, some kind of imaging to see what is happening. Yeah, so the, the CT imaging was showing us collection, three centimeter by three centimeter, aspirated once, ultrasound guided, and the patient is saying that he was put on clathrozomycin, fever went away for one week, again fever started. And little dull aching pain, fever of 9900. I think mesh has to come out. Mesh has to come out, sir. Mesh has to come out or continue Look with for medical. atypical mycobacterial infection. Sorry? Look for atypical mycobacterial infection. No, no. What about the or mesh? Try... What about the mesh? Mesh, uh, wait for some time, six months. You want to wait for six months with that young boy who is doing his final year engineering with a fever of every day, 99 to 100. You want to wait for him for six months, sir? Explant. <clears throat> Explant. 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 So how many in the audience want to wait? How many want to explant? So again, remember, when you get a mesh infection, it gives you a very small window period. The moment the mesh gets infected, form there to form a biofilm is just a couple of days. The moment you have a biofilm and that to a biofilm formed by an organism called staph. Staph is notorious because it forms a multi-layered biofilm. No amount of debridement, washes, aspiration is going to work. This mesh has to come out. Today, how do you diagnose a biofilm? Once you have explanted the mesh, you can send a part of it to study for a PCR test and a fish test. So these are the two tests available today to know the biofilm so that you can understand it better. So this particular boy, 
the plant was expl exp uh, explanting. How do you explant? Upon or laparoscopic approach, you look at the epicenter. That means you look at where the collection is pointing towards. If the collection is pointing towards the peritoneum, I will go intraperitoneal. If the collection is pointing subcute, because mother nature beautifully tells you which way is going to be the way out. So follow the epicenter of the collection. It will tell you this is where you will be doing that. Any precautions, sir, when you are explanting the mesh in an ETEP, how will you prepare? I'm just saying a very quick, important See, point. Make sure it's already whether the tracker is done. Whether the mesh has been tackled before. No, okay, that... I, I told you, na, e tap done. That was one liner. See, if it's done a CT, probably say, absorb, say, absorbable tacker is a different scenario. If it's a non absorbable tacker, it will be seen in the CT. So you will keep a C arm ready, number one. You'll keep a C arm ready. Why? Because intraoperatively, there are tackers. You can see it on the C arm. You'll keep your vascular guy ready. Just call him up and say, hey, guy, just be around. Yes. Why? <clears throat> We don't know how far this, uh, suppose it is done by some outside person. We don't know how far, whether they Absolutely. kept the fascia so there. The important thing is I've seen people getting off because they say that, you know, you have to take off the fat in the fascia over the psoas, expose the psoas, or they even take away all the fat over the ilex. And if your muscle, if mesh is bare over there, so look at the CT scan. If my mesh is close to the ilex, I'll call up my CVTS guys and I'll tell him just be around because I may be requiring you intraoperatively. So that is second preparation. Third so let's watch this video. So whenever you explant this kind of meshes, you can see here, this is where you can see the momentum was stuck. The epicenter was there. So I decided to raise the flap, go into that area. You can see the tax coming out. Now what's important you can see there is I have parked my bag earlier on. So you put in a small retrieval bag inside. So whatever is a muck coming out immediately goes in that. Otherwise, what can happen is you can lose that material somewhere along that enthusiasm of doing it. It will go and stick somewhere and it can develop a small abscess. So park in a bag over there, be ready to clip your infipec aesthetics if required, keep your vascular person on standby. And then you can see here, I'll just move it because of the lack of time. You can see here, layer by layer, layer by layer, entire mesh coming out. And every time I will use a C arm, see if I can see some tags. And you can beautifully see the tags. If they are non-absorbable, you can pick it up. And here you can see the entire mesh coming out, layer by layer. Then you identify your anatomy. What was important was for me, if you can see it very carefully, is that's where his vast deferens and everything is. So because he was a young unmarried boy, I had to be very, very careful. In case if it was stuck to that, I would have probably gone and kept the mesh intact over there. So this is again something where the vital structures, the whites where we are, the mesh is going to be, try to be very, very careful. So this is where you uh, remove everything. And, uh, and then the entire mesh comes out, as you can see here, everything just goes in the back below. So park your back below and these are the last pieces of mesh. So energy device is a key and then everything is going in the back. Metrogel wash, do not close this flap. This flap does not, it will epithelize very, very well. So you keep it open, give a good wash with Metrogel. Metrogel has got a good use in a, a typical, so I'm using in a Metrogel there, washing it out, a flat suction drain, and then the entire thing goes for the biofilm. I actually go and watch and see the slides. It's beautiful to see those slides of how the mesh and the implantation looks like. You can make out the cell pattern, what has gone inside that. And there you can see from one of the ports, the entire specimen comes out. The price this boy has to pay, he required one year of clarithromycin, linezolid, and moxifloxacin. Guys, there is nothing like two weeks, three weeks, four weeks of a GP treatment. Please do not do that. Involve an ID specialist, I involve a chest specialist and I give treatment for the time. Usually we have to give it from nine months up to a year. Three months, four months, five months doesn't work. Yes, Kumaran. So two things. So when you extract the mesh, I think yeah. you should always send it for culture. Absolutely. So you send right. it for the mesh itself culture. goes for culture. Bacterial culture, mesh goes for the culture because a supernatant fluid will always show some klebsiella and you will be guided in a false way. So send it for a TB PCR, gene expert, the mesh itself along with the collection. And, and if you have a good lab, then the atypical tuberculosis always grows. Always and, do that. Your atypical will grow. The only problem is, sorry? Illa, sir. Illa, we sir. will get it, sir. For sir but what happens is, atypical uh, load is important. If the load is low, because the load usually is about 15 to 20%. So one in five patients, you may lose it. So my go-to thing is, I send it for a histopathology. The moment they say granulomatous inflammation seen, it is confirmed that it is atypical. Because they will never comment as TB, it is a granulomatous inflammation. And this is my thought process. If you have an infected collection, and if yes. you're fairly certain, should we even bother aspirating? Because when the mesh is nicely floating, is it not easier to expand the mesh rather than kind of create, let it allow to kind of create more scar tissue? 
and many a times i've also seen in a floating mesh with a collection the people will take the supernatant fluid the supernatant fluid will be showing you klebsiella they start with the treatment for klebsiella but the bug is a atypical which is deep down there which needs to come out because it's a very slow so sometimes you can have a synergistic infections we've got a fairly large series which we are going to publish soon so again few publications coming up from there so so to conclude in an ete pinguinal guys you've been an excellent panel bleeding from the brick artery and in free pegastic is something which you should watch out for nemoperitoneum how to avoid earlier on is to do the dissection in zone 1 and 3 and go to the sac low pressures and slow insufflation is the key neuralgia please do not try to expose the lateral fascia and stay 2 cm away from the asis because that is where the nerves go into the groin so do not dissect there and the center of the mesh should be the center of the defect because people always ask me what size you use i use a three dimensional but if i'm using in a flat mesh i will be doing the anisotropy in an anisotropy in the abdominal wall it is vertical placement in the groin it is lateral placement so remember that stretch the mesh and put it in the right way so that your patients are comfortable uh, i don't know whether we have time just to watch yes. the last video yeah so i can just show you this is a step by step approach uh, on the etep a last video this is a voice over done so let's watch can we have the voice on this Uh, ETEP or enhanced view totally extra peritoneal technique for bilateral inguinal hernia repair. ETEP access to five is a set of maneuvers and strategies undertaken to enhance a usable extra peritoneal space for the repair of inguinal, ventral, and lumbar hernias. And those maneuvers are remote access, the flexible port setup, and the division of natural boundaries by the system. The first port, a 12 millimeter telescope, is generally put five centimeters laterally to the umbilicus, as the course of the inferior and gastric artery is usually four to four point five centimeters from the midline and three centimeters cranially to allow for a larger field of vision. There are ten goal limiting uses mentioned in this article for safe laparoscopic anal hernia repair that must be followed. The first rule for TEP is the dissection of the initial space with the telescope or optical entry. We go layer by layer, dissecting using the blade of the telescope. We can see the skin, subcutaneous tissue, the anterior rectus sheath, the rectus muscle, and the posterior rectus sheath. Once we reach the posterior rectus sheath, we change the direction of the push of lead carbon dioxide. And the second rule of the 10 golden rules is that the next section should follow the prepared anal plane. That is, follow the Y, and you'll always be right. The plane that exposes the muscle should be avoided in order to prevent damage of inferior of gastric vessels or injury of nerves. Once the inferior of gastric artery has been identified, a second five millimeter working port is inserted, either laterally or immediately to the inferior of gastric artery. A spinal needle is first inserted as a guide. Once a working port has been established, dissection is extended laterally beyond the leaving of seven units into the preperitoneal plane. Dissection is done by creating small nicks in the tissue and allowing carbon dioxide to form planes by new dissection. Another rule to keep in mind here is that the fat belongs to the parietes. This ensures the vessels and nerves are protected. Once lateral dissection is done, continue immediately for the second working port placement. The arcuate line is cut to open up the space for second port. To avoid a new perineum, the perineum is dissected away from the posterior rectus sheath, and then the arcuate line is cut using a blend mode of third. Here, a jagged ceramic spatula is used, which has an angle that helps with the dissection. The second port is placed near the umbilicus, using a spinal needle as a guide, and thus triangulation is achieved. Dissection is then continued along the preperitoneal space in the direction of the head. Here also, the rules to keep in mind are follow the one, and fat belongs to the parietes. Counter traction by the left hand instrument is also important. Sometimes in a thin peritoneum, Handling with instruments can create a small ramp, which may not lead to any loss of space because of the wider attempt dissection performed. Suturing was then performed by Sabo's technique. It is important to rotate the marilyn as seen here so that the thread does not get stuck. The tip of the marilyn is being used at a blend mode of 30 to dissect the pseudo sac off the hernia, using it as a cutting tool. Rule number three is that the dissection should extend to at least the pubic synthesis and at least two centimeters below the pubis in order to create sufficient space to accommodate an adequately sized mesh that overlaps the rectum and femoral triangles by at least three to four centimeters and will not be lifted by the distending bladder. The fourth rule is that the visualization for femoral hernia medial to the external iliac vein should be done. Rule five, 
for optimization of the elements of the core is considered sufficient when the parent of the end is dissected inferior till at least the level at which the vast deference crosses the external iliac bay. Rule 6. In margin renguina scrotal hernias, it is recommended to transect and abandon the distal hernia sac within the scrotum. This decision is made to avoid excessive dissection of the cord elements, thus avoiding injury to them. Rule 7. The deep inguinal canal should be explored during cell 3 dissection in surgical of glaucoma of the cord. Only if all anatomical elements have been recognized and the steps of dissection described above have been completed and hemostasis achieved should the surgeon proceed with mesh placement. Before placing the mesh, the pseudosac is tacked to the anterior abdominal wall with two to three point fixation horizontally to create a good landing space for the mesh to lie upon, enhancing the mesh tissue integration and to prevent sailing and wind phenomena, which can lead to migration of the mesh into the hernia defect. A third working board is placed on the right side to repair the left hernia. Dissection of the left lateral space is done, keeping in mind the rules. The left arcuate line is cut to allow for a larger field of vision. Rule 8, a large mesh, usually at least 10 centimeters brachiocaudally and 15 centimeters medial laterally may be placed covering the myopectineal orifice with overlap, at least 3 to 4 centimeters. Before inserting the mesh, the cannula is advanced towards the direction of hernia. Mesh should reach medially at least the pubic symphysis and laterally the ASIS and iliosos must. Medially, the mesh should be positioned between the pubic bone and the bladder into the retinous space and laterally. It should lie next to the iliosos muscle. The mesh should be placed without wrinkles or folds and should not be split in order to avoid chronic pain or recurrence. The left side mesh is also placed, keeping it behind the steps mentioned before. Rule 9. Mesh fixation is not necessary, especially in tap. Mesh fixation is recommended in large inguinal hernias. If mesh fixation is decided, some pointers to keep in mind are to avoid bone structures and inferior gastric vessels, avoid traumatic fixation below iliacuban tract, and five to six point fixation is sufficient. Rule 10 Deflation under direct visualization. The abdomen is deflated and inflated again to check that the mesh stays in place. Thank you for watching this video. So, uh, this particular video was made by uh, one of a very smart uh, intern of mine called Arsh. And you must have seen there was an accent to the video. It is not me. But uh, he suddenly discovered that there is a software where any video which I can, I have to type, it can convert into about 100 languages across the world. So, we are doing this as a resource for other countries. You can put Spanish into that and whatever you have typed, the person will start talking in Spanish. So this is something which is learning for the younger ones of how to make good presentations. So you can use this software. So this was a British accent which I had used because we were using it for the European candidates because then they can understand things better. I have always admired this video and have always had this doubt. So nice. So, amazing. Thank you so, much. Has to go so my last slide to all of you, five of you. Yeah. So this is uh, Chennai airport and this is me landing last night. Watch this video and tell me whether I should go back with the same pilot to Mumbai today. Yeah, watch this. So this is me landing yesterday at Chennai airport. One, two, three, and four. Kumaran. Let's start from him. Should I go back with him? Think about it. It's for even the audience. They, they have told me that the same chap is going to take the flight. Do you want to go or you don't want to go? How did you take this video? You are inside the flight. How do you take the video? So someone has recorded for me. Kumaran was doing that. Kumaran was doing that for me. Yes, Kumaran. I told you now he was using a drone yesterday to ch check me. There's a message behind it, Kumaran. Would you go back with him or no? Yes or no? I will say. I, I would. You will go with him. Why? I, he still made it fine. I think. Okay. What about you? He's thinking twice. Yes. Probably I don't know the pilot. So don't know. Okay. No choice. I'll better go by train. Train. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Jignesh. Yeah. Uh, I, I still go with him. I think he knows to fly. Okay. Uh, in Chennai, at least twice, this is at least he's able to land down. Yeah. Aborted landing after touching down, retakeoff. I've experienced two times in Chennai. Chennai has <laughs> very atrocious weather and don't fly by the ATR in Chennai at all. So this is what has happened with me. So anyway, anyone from the audience wants to go back with him? I will, sir. Uh, he is he, grounded well. So, yeah. So, so, so I'll tell you my philosophy and why I'm talking about airline industry. I will go back with him. He started off with a procedure 
took off like an etap he had troubles at the last moment of the surgery some bleeding some peripheral holes but what it did at the end i said watch it till the end there was no wobbling and he came out safe he is an expert pilot he is an expert surgeon i will go with him and why i'm talking about airline industry is have you ever sat in the pilot and asked is captain gandhi today driving or captain mahadar but when we get operated we ask who is the surgeon who is operating because there is a us aviation data 2016 airline industry is the only industry which aims for 100% success rate so you will always see them telling about do dwar idhar se idhar se this that flush pe baji pattiyan because they have vigorous checklist the data said that if they have 99.9% success rate it equals to one crash every week i think probably i'll come by bullock cart next time to kanan yeah so airline industry if they can mimic and do 100% we as surgeons community today with this venture should aim for 100% results and 100% success rate for our patients and i'm very happy let's have a big cheer for kumaran and kanagwell that they have made this effort to make all of us understand it so well that we can mimic this so next time if someone is operating there the patient will not ask whether it's kanagwell kumaran or gandhi like the airline industry and that's the reason i put up this thank you very much all of you for your patient hearing uh, any questions comments criticism i'll be more than happy uh, and again to same highlight that uh, we have got a meeting coming up in uh, goa we have the di search coming up please register early uh, it will be of great help thank you thank you dr jignesh thank you chair persons i think we move on to the next session uh, friends uh, we have a uh, lunch on symposium coming this courtesy is by bard group and uh, we have two great fanned uh, young surgeons coming up for this lunch on symposium so i wish all of you could stay here and we will have a very small break for uh, lunch because i don't want to miss even a minute with the senior faculty here for chairing this session can i have the honor of having dr kannan dr sagai minvesegar pandi are you here pandi uh, dr shanti madam so uh, please come up to the stage satyapriya ma'am please come up to the stage um the the there has been some thoughts from the friends telling you can load your plates and come back to the hall if you are very hungry so probably we'll give 5 minutes or so or by the time they set up they will start that talk so we will give 5 minutes break all of you go pick up your plates and come that will make things easier so chair persons please bear with us 5 minutes so that let them come but you can settle down to the stage please you can in the meantime talk some good things about deepak so deepak maybe you can give a idea about what is happening on the di search and uh, friends can know this being a formal group sir coaching matter na our plenary la ellathu so can you uh, maybe uh, shinde sir also can join you yes. sir can you give us uh, the people what is happening so i mean this is just a quick uh, i mean i think dr jignesh had mentioned that we have couple of meetings coming up uh, one of the meetings that is happening uh, in april is the uh, dr prem if you can join uh, is the uh, young turks summit which is happening in goa um so we'll put up the flyers across for that as well um it's it's a three day program uh, that is going to happen in goa for in april 26 to 28 following which the 2025 we have uh, the big meeting the di search which is happening in chennai and uh, of course uh, request dr shinde to say a few words on both the meetings welcome everyone i would love everyone here and all of our colleagues and friends outside whom we know who may not be here today to be here for these meetings because awrsc basically believes in learning sharing and growing together so all these meetings have 
one thing in mind is what value can we offer to the person who comes and we want that person to join us and grow with us so that the field of hernia becomes better more exciting and safe as jignesh said that we should really should be aiming for a 100% outcome results so that articles like the ones that are floating around will not have much to say okay the young turks meeting is a different meeting because it has been planned executed by all our young surgeons and i must tell you that when we see these young surgeons perform surgeries deliver talks some of them have done it in us at the harvard at the mint also i mean all of us a year and uh, th their contribution and their performance has been exciting and phenomenal it's world class so every surgeon would want to be a part of this because the young turks meeting is also going to be exciting it is going to be a different ball game it's not going to be like the routine conferences although it's in goa and the team is going to see that the goa uh, entertainment part will also rub in but the focus is on the meeting and the learning and growing together for those who have witnessed or even heard of deep impact at delhi which just happened in march it was a phenomenal meeting which had repercussions not just in india but almost 25 countries around whereas the world heard about it what kind of meeting it was and our team in chennai is going to do even better than that so this is going to be a world class meeting and no description is going to describe it it's going to be an experience that one needs to come and witness and experience it can't be described thank you sir thank you so much sir for the kind words I think we'll slowly start this session. And uh, friends, uh, one more request. The AWRSC is having very clear thoughts about creating a surgeon's initiative for young postgraduates, young surgeons. And uh, we have curated courses for ETEP, TAR, conference separation courses. Medical institutions who want to run the courses will help us from our side academically. There are enough faculty from both regional and national pool to come in to help you. So the mission is very clear. We wish all of you to improve upon your surgical skills. I am sure if you are confident about hernia, where 70% of general surgery practice is already done. So hernia is such a huge specialty coming up and a lot of subspeciality procedures are also coming up. AWRC will get you the right connect to learn it properly. Faculty here can come and demonstrate your surgeries. Faculty can get come and talk to you, show their videos. And the testimonials are the talks which has happened already so far and the talks which are going to happen hereafter. So reach any one of us. We are always available over phone call. If you have something very exciting to contribute for the DA search, we want your ideas. Sir, let us have this for the DA search. We are here to listen to you. So it is our meeting. Rather, I'm not going to ask you, sir, please come and do this or that. All of us are here to run the show and keep the Chennai Sprite flying high across the globe. Thank you. And once again, um, Deepak is going to highlight this is this couple of talks. What Dr. Deepak and Dr. Navin is going to speak is little out of box, but they have very strong impetus when you get into some unique problems. They are, they are going to offer solutions for such a type of unique problems that you and me can, at any level of experience, can get it. Chairpersons, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Kanagvel. Uh, as Sir mentioned, this is a, a BD uh, symposium. And uh, firstly, want to thank uh, ASI Chennai chapter uh, for involving Chennai Hernia Society as part of this meeting. And um, uh, Dr. Kumaran especially and Dr. Kanagavel for such a wonderful program. Uh, on, a, on a Sunday. So why not use a mesh that disappears? So we are talking more in terms of the bioreabsorbable mesh that is available in the market. Specifically, we all know about this name, the Phasix mesh. So if you've seen this modified, uh, you know, hernia grading scale, so 
the surgical outcomes is in about in grade one is about 14 percent 27 percent and it keeps increasing as the complexity of the uh, hernia increases as as well as as you look at it the outcomes are also uh, worse when it comes to dirty and clean contaminated cases so with regards to phasics history it was introduced in the year 2013 and uh, what is exactly phasics so phasics has two things it's phasics and phasics st so it is an open monofilament mesh and, and it has a repair strength with poly uh, 4 hydroxybutyrate. So it's biologically derived, it's fully bioreabsorbable, and it achieves healing with the native tissue over a period of 16 to 18 months, is the, what the uh, studies say. So basically, it's launched in 2013, as I mentioned. It has a very rapid tissue in incorporation and organized and functional collagen at the repair site. And it is uh, as and provides good. The best part is it provides the critical strength during the initial healing phase because that is the time when you can have your mesh ruptures and other things, which we'll be see seeing in the next slide, with a rapid amount of tissue in growth and neovascularization. So why monofilament? Uh, because these monofilament meshes are more biocompatible, uh, and uh, multi uh, multifilament may increase the incidence of device infections. So what we want to achieve today is. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to achieve that phasics can promote strength from the start. Okay. So it initially, once you incorporate the mesh into, it could be in the IPOM space, it could be in the onlay space, it could be in the uh, uh, sub sublay space, wherever it is, the, uh, the phasics ST is of course, ideally put in the IPOM space, the rest can be put in the uh, uh, onlay and the sublay space. So it starts strength right from the beginning. And you can see the strength relation with regards to this over time, what happens with other uh, things like a Vicryl or a GTMC suture. Whereas so you look at the phasic strength mesh, it's pretty good even after 24 weeks, it's strong. So phasics also combines the advantages of a synthetic and biological graft. So the advantages being it's easy to use, it has a reduced recurrence rates when compared to a primary closure, can also be used laparoscopically. And um, so again, as I said, the strength uh, repair of the uh, strength over time, durability is pretty good and it's about 12 to 18 months or 16 to 18 months is what the uh, study and the comp uh, studies and the company claims. And as the mesh strength decreases over time, new healthy abdominal wall new strength is regained. So basically, it gets reabsorbed over 18 months, and then you have a much better uh, reabsorption. So I'm going to skip this, and I'll go to a couple of cases which we have done. So one of it was, I'll just go to the background of this. Two of, I have two cases experience with Phasix. Um, so one of this is a 32-year-old female. Now, she had a painful swelling in the abdominal wall for about a month. Now, the, she's a young lady. She's had a history of LSES recently, but she also had a history of laparoscopy for a left ovarian cyst in somewhere abroad. And during the same admission, this person had a bowel perforation and had to go for a laparotomy and a resection anastomosis was done. After this, she underwent the LSES. Now, she came to me at about one year, six months following the LSES with a painful swelling. The tricky part here was we were ready to offer her a ETEP and many other as many other procedures. But what she clearly wanted was she wasn't sure about her. She and her husband were not sure about whether they want to have a second child. So they said they might want to plan. Ideally, in these scenarios, we would ask a patient to complete family and then come for the hernia repair. But here, this was a painful swelling. She wanted the hernia corrected, but she was also not sure about the next pregnancy. So given that choice, this was an indication and we uh, went ahead with the phase six ST. So what I'll do is I'll forward a little bit of this video because it might be a little too long. Um, so you can see a lot of additions we could see because of the previous surgeries. Of course, luckily it was all only omental additions that we actually encountered throughout this. And she had a significant divarication and um, I would just show you the whole step. Yeah, so I'm just starting the defect closure here at about two, two to three centimeter defect here, as you can see. But the, so there was significant amount of divarication, which you will also be seeing uh, in the rest. So what I planned was uh, the laparoscopic plication technique, uh, which for the, for correction of di diastasis recti was performed, and uh, the defect was closed, and we put the phasic ST. Of course, we put a 20 by 15 phasic ST mesh in this case, which I will come to in just a second. So that's the phasic ST. Very simple, simple to use in terms of um, how to use. Very similar to an IPOM mesh, and um, you know, you similarly you, you use your uh, tackers and you fix the mesh and uh, with suture passes. So that's the final outcome. So it's about almost about a year 
I would say about 11 months since I did this surgery. And uh, she's been on regular follow-up with me. And uh, she's very comfortable. There has been no recurrence. There's no post-op pain or anything like that for this particular patient. The next one is another one which I did very recently, just a month back. So this was a 75-year-old female. Uh, she had undergone a ventral hernia elsewhere. And then she had come to me uh, for a recurrent ventral hernia. And there was a mesh fistulization in this particular patient. So this patient had mesh fistulization into the small bowel. And we had to perform, a, uh, the patient also had an intracutaneous fistula through the drain side, the previous drain side, and it was pretty messy. But she wanted the hernia corrected because it was significant for her. And uh, so you can see the CT here. You can see that the intracutaneous fistula is right there. And that's the hernial defect as well. So, sorry. Yeah. So we did a resection and laparotomy and the resection anastomosis and, uh, you know, closure of the fistula. And we put a phase six regular phase six mesh as an on-lay mesh repair in this particular patient. Of course, this is just one month old. She's doing particularly very well. There has been no issues. I will be continuing to follow up on her on these things. Um, so with that, I'll again invite you all to the YT Summit in Goa. And of course, the big meeting in uh, March in Chennai, 2025. And I'll be happy to answer any questions on phase six if there are any. Thank you. Uh, it's a nice uh, talk, Deepak. Thank you, sir. And uh, very informative as well. You dealt with lots of basics also. So, there are any questions in the audience? Deepak, in your experience, do you come across any infections after using this mesh? So, I've used only twice. Those are the two cases. Both these cases have not had any infections. They were all both doing well. One is almost one year close to follow up. The other one is only a month. Uh, the one I put intraperitoneally is, is the one which is one year follow up. She's doing very well. The one which is on lay repair also is she's doing very well. Both of them are doing well. Sir, in your second case, you told intracutaneous fistula. Can you approach through lap or open? No, no, I directly opened. I directly went in for an open surgery and uh, did a laparotomy, uh, corrected the fistula, I mean, uh, removed the fistula uh, tract and did a resection anastomosis. But patient was very clear that she wanted the hernia also corrected in the same sitting. No, so, after resection anastomosis, you kept the mesh also. That is the idea of the mesh. So you can put this mesh in two through three scenarios. One of it is, of course, if the patient wants to pregnant, because it's a fully reabsorbable mesh, like a bio biological mesh. So you can put it in dirty, contaminated cases. So if you're dealing with a strangulated, incarcerated, strangulated ventral hernia, and you have to perform a you know, resection anastomosis, this mesh is a great mesh to put across. So that you, you, you can put this mesh even in dirty conditions is what is the idea. Thank you. So what are the chances of uh, infections in these cases? So I have uh, because, personally speaking... Because it clearly falls over gray, right. class three. Correct, sir. So that's the idea behind the, the phasic mesh itself. That is number one. And number two is, we, I did not experience any infections uh, in this particular, both these patients. So even in the open case, there was no skin or soft tissue. In, I mean, there was no, not even superficial infection or anything that was there. Of course, I had put a, you know, a, a drain in the, in the space, but uh, that, that was removed in the third post-op day and she was comfortable. Because the, uh, the extent of infection is about... 10, 10 to 15 percent in Absolutely. class 3. Absolutely. Dr. Deepak, uh, thank you for uh, bringing us to the knowledge it is doable. Two quick questions. Uh, how do you handle the pre-deployment part of the mesh? For, how do you handle the? How do you handle the pre-deployment component? Because right. still now I could see a lot of hypomers using saline, using it dry and uh, the various meshes advocate Correct. various things. How do we handle the mesh before? You're asking about phasix in particular. Yes, exactly. So phasix is very, very similar to an IPOM mesh. Okay. So first time around, even I had the same question and I had called the company person to actually come into my OR. So the same way, you just use few drops of saline uh, and just just make a little bit of uh, or a sterile sheet and you roll it. Are they robust enough to go into the 11 mm or 12 Absolutely, mm? Absolutely, sir. I, that was a 20 to 15 centimeter mesh. Okay. It easily went into my 11 mm to 11 profile. So do we have sides on it? Yes, there are the sides on it. There so are sides on it. You will, be, the... you will be able to see the. You will be able to feel it when you actually touch it with the gloves. Okay. And one is a, of course, the rougher side goes towards the abdominal wall, and that's where you take the sutures for digging up the. Okay. Pressure. So, what is the company recommendation, especially when you accidentally do an entrotomy or spill? Do you give some form of wash or mop it dry? Uh, what is the recommendation for before deployment? 
assuming we do it for be, a contaminated case yes yes this is good for a contaminated dirty case so even if you have somebody with a gangrenous bowel with a strangulated hernia you can still insert this mesh is what the company's company claims and i have seen studies as well obviously that's why i was able to put it in the intracutaneous fistula patient and i've heard a few talks on phasics particular by a few eminent speakers from abroad who have had much more experience than what i have here just two cases not experience at all but i've had talks by 150 200 uh, case studies with uh, phasics which has done pretty well with very good results the other thing is the, what is the amount of immune reaction the body puts up onto it it's obviously having a porcine or bovine origin am i correct, right? correct correct so do we have allergies or do we need to have any pre testing for that uh technically yes sir i mean if you look at it from a very uh, technical standpoint but I yes think they they say they remove the immune components by repeated washing and some form of cellular decellularization of yes the yes matrix alone goes in yes that is one and second thing is uh, it's very interesting because uh, i was told uh, whether it, it could be used in patients who are uh, allergic to pork and other things. Ha, ha, ha. So uh, that part I have to check with the company. Here, of course, both these patients were not allergic to any food or anything. So I Correct. was able to comfortably put it in. But we didn't do any allergen test per se to identify this. That's great. So how do we fix tackers can be used? Tackers. Or... You can tackers. use tackers, you can use sutures if you're comfortable. Normally. Whichever. It's, it's suture like friendly, doctor. Very, very suture friendly. So... You can even use it in the ETEP space. Oh, really? You can okay. still use it in the sublay space. Um, of course, you know, you will be using a much bigger mesh. The cost of the mesh is one of the negative That's what points. I'm going it. to come in. That's say for a 15 cost 20, what is the cost a patient should be prepared upon? 15 to 20 centimeters. Yes. Sir. I think if it's phase 6 ST, uh, the companies are here, they can tell better. What would it be, Manik? 3.5 lakhs. Yeah. So, that's, that's a huge sum of money. Does insurance uh, cover this up? Sorry, insurance, insurance is covering. Is insurance is covered. Both these patients' insurance covered the mesh. So that and the like... only thing is, they were, the, the insurance asked us a query as to why this particular mesh, why is it so costly? We just had to give an explanation letter saying that we had to use it for this particular reason. I think it was cleared immediately. Should not be. A problem. Thank you very much. Madam, what is your thought, ma'am? You do a lot of uh, easy fistulas and other uh, tough cases. What is your department Usually policy? Usually, we won't keep mesh. You don't keep ah. the mesh. So usually, in this kind of uh, cases, Plus uh, emergencies, yes, especially sir. when there is a strangulation, you have to go for a resection. Absolutely, sir. So, so general teaching and the general uh, consensus is that you should not put a mesh when in an infected, dirty setting. Absolutely, I agree with you. And that goes, no questions asked. Yeah, but... These are exceptional situations where you, if it's a sick patient, you cannot take her up for another surgery or the patients, they want to, you know, kind of want to complete the procedure in the same sitting and they are ready to accept this sort of a mesh. Those are the only situations. This this cannot be given as a point blank, uh, you know, thing to anybody saying anybody with a strangulated, please go and put this mesh. That cannot. That's not the recommendation. Yeah. Can you keep a drain always? Uh, no, no, ma'am. Actually, no. I had kept a drain in the open open case. I had shown because there was a little bit of flap razor. I mean, I did a, raise a little bit of flap for seroma only. I had kept a drain, but not in the other. So because an obstruction, an obstruction and strangulation. Yeah, you have an altered physiology. Yes, the homeostasis changes. Yeah. So that's the reason the classic teaching is you do not keep a mesh. Yeah, but, so you, that is... but you claim uh, success with that. Uh, I'm not claiming. I've not put it in all my strangulated cases, sir. To be frank, no. This is a very exceptional case. I have, In fact, this is not strangulated. This is just an intracranial fistula where we put this mesh in. So, yeah. I, I would still say recommendation is not to put a mesh and come back after six weeks or four weeks or six weeks to insert your prosthesis after the infection. Perhaps process. in elective surgeries you can. This is an elective surgery. I had time to prepare. I informed the mesh availability is another question because it has to be stored in a particular type of temperature. So it is not always available in Chennai. So first time around, I think they flew it from Mumbai. The next time around, I think there was one luckily here. I was able to take it the next day and do it. Well, of course, the patient was willing as well. Of course, the patient was willing for the cost as well as this mesh. Both. Normally, what is the cost of the plastics? Uh, that's what we have Either way, 15 by 20 centimeters, 1.5 lakhs. Actually, previously in the initial days, actually way back to 15 years before we had a biological mesh from the blood. Yeah. yeah. That time it was around 60,000. We used in two patients. In fact, one case of the early obstruction, in that case it got infected. So then we deferred for using of this biological mesh. 
Thank you. Thank Dr. you, Sir Deepak. Thank you. This is a very nice talk. Thank you. What's his name? We will have a next talk by Dr. Navin. This one. Friends, actually, this is a, yet another lunch on symposium uh, where the bard has improvised many. There were a couple of uh, questions in the floor. How about to place the mesh deployment life easier, especially when you are going for huge uh, sized meshes? And then for beginners, especially, and in obese cases, I think they have very clear, robust indications where it is worthwhile okay. using this. And many were uh, questions from the participants telling, how to use this? That is what we requested, Dr. Yeah, Navi. I think he has one of the largest experience of this EcoPS device. So the Bard has requested yeah. him to be an expert speaker yeah. for the yeah. afternoon. Chairpersons, please take over. Over to Dr. Navin, one of the dynamic surgeon, professor of surgery in uh, Sri Ramchandra Medical Institute. Over to Dr. Navin. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chairpersons. Thank you, organizers, for this opportunity. So I've been asked by the company who is doing the entire program today to give us a talk on uh, EcoPS. This is basically the IPOM mesh from the company, which is Ventralite ST. And it comes with what is known as a positioning system. So that is what the PS stands for in EcoPS. So um, I'm just going to show you a small video which shows you how to deploy this mesh as compared to a standard IPOM. So this is basically the uh, reduction of the hernia and a little bit of adhesiolysis going on. And as you are all well aware and already doing all these steps, which is the closure, primary closure of the defect. Here I'm using, of course, a uh, number one barb suture. I don't recall which company that was from. Okay, right. And uh, once we do the closure, it's time for preparing the mesh to be placed. So this is a special kind of mesh which comes with a balloon. And this balloon basically helps us in positioning the mesh correctly, exactly where the defect is. So that green part is the balloon. It is the other surface and it has many parts. So I will show you how this works out. So um, what we do here is we wet the mesh and we roll it with the balloon on the inner aspect. And you can see little blue spirals on the outside. I'll come to, you, come to that a little later. We switch from a 10 mm to a 12 mm port and then we insert it in a, as aseptic uh, way as possible. Okay, right? Once you insert that, the next step is to uh, unroll it on the inner aspect. And here, what I'm gonna do is make a small nick on the surface on the skin, which is bang in the middle of the hernia. So we introduce a suture passer from the skin level there, and it comes in and here you have a little loop which is attached to the mesh, grab that, yank it out and pull it all the way up so that the mesh gets uh, uh, placed against the anterior abdominal wall. So uh, here you can see my assistant is putting a mosquito there and there will be these white lines on that loop. Just cut that. This part of the tube goes into this syringe. So you have a locking mechanism there and you lock it there and here the magic works. So once you start inflating, that green balloon nicely inflates and makes your mesh nicely, um, you know, opposing the anterior abdominal wall. Again, you put the um, mosquito. So there are four windows here, two large windows and two small windows. The company recommends that you place four tackers in the larger windows and two, two tackers in the smaller windows. So that's pretty much what I'm doing right now. Once you finish the window aspect, this is technically the inner crown that you are creating. Okay, right? You All you have to do is remove that mosquito from the outer aspect. Okay, right? And it will deflate. So um, you see that the balloon gets nicely deflated and you have little flaps on this balloon which help you just pull off the um, positioning system away from the mesh. The mesh is sitting there prettily on top while you take off this green part, the green balloon down and you place it there, right? And once you're done with that, use the rest of your tackers to place the mesh beautifully. And this is nicely collapsible. So all you need to do is to pull it out with a grasper through the 5mm port. So 
why do we need this mesh? And uh, that is what I'm going to be talking to you about. This is the standard Ventralite mesh, which has what is known as Sepra film. It works very well as a composite mesh. It's been proven to be very good. It's uh, the standard uh, in many countries uh, for an IPOM. So um, key benefits is, number one, it's useful in both laparoscopy and robotic surgery. And you have a great positioning system, which basically uh, negates one of the biggest drawbacks of IPOM. If you're especially doing it from the lateral aspect, you find that you're not able to position it very easily. So you like to position the mesh correctly. Okay, right? So what's my data from five, six years back? I've been doing this procedure using this kind of mesh, 122 patients, no mesh infections as of date, not to me, it hasn't come back to me. Second thing, no recurrences as of date. Again, I haven't seen the recurrences personally. It might have gone to someone else. Let's be very open about it. Every procedure has its own recurrence rate. So if you look at the variety of hernias, it's pretty much useful in any kind of variety. Okay, right? So uh, data, what I have um, seen from my observation is, these was a little unofficial study that I did comparing the standard Bard's mesh versus the standard Paritex mesh from another company. Okay, right? And we were looking at two major factors. One is the intraoperative time of deployment of the mesh, and the second one was the postoperative pain. Now, why is pain a little less in these patients is one, is that you don't need transfacial according to the company. Okay, so that was one factor. The second thing was intraoperative. Um, period of time from the first touch of the mesh to the final fixation. So if you see the time uh, aspect, it was as low as 14 minutes for an echo PS from the time you, you open the um, uh, sterile cover to the final deployment as compared to the other standard composite mesh. And this is pretty much in line with the data that is available on the um, journals regarding this. Post-operative pain, I followed it up for three months and I found that with the visual and log scale. The first six hours, of course, was very comparable. But if you see at the 30th day, and uh, it was almost zero in the patients that we used only attacker and avoided a transfacial. 90 days, it didn't really make a difference. Everything was the same. So what do I feel regarding this mesh? Centering has become easy. Your doubts about whether it has an adequate overlap of the mesh, they have reduced. Interrupt time definitely has reduced, pain is comparable. My doubts are it's tackers only as compared to what is the standard, which is tackers plus transfacial, the right way to go. And what kind of tackers to use? Now we know that IPOM is supposed to be done with absorbable tackers, but I have found that the uh, permanent tackers since uh, seem to be working better in these situations. So, uh, Conclusion. Now, this is one video where I had to go in back for another uh, indication. This is a patient I've done a mesh um, plasty with and uh, this ventralite. There are some amount of adhesions, but you will find that these adhesions are fairly flimsy and no bowel was involved. It was primarily only omental adhesions and you will see that the uh, mesh sits quite well and the entire uh, momentum was easily removable compared to that. Okay, so this actually patient had a small 5 mm incision on the lateral aspect, which had gone in for an incarcerated epiploic appendage. So, uh, disclaimer I am not getting sponsored by <laughs> this, uh, this talk. So, what I have done is uh, when I use the other company meshes, similarly to what the Echo PS does now, I take a centering stitch to place the mesh in the center. So that's something that I have learned from this product and moved on to others as well. So this is a small video. Uh, I remember if you all, all know this, of course, it's from the very famous movie, right? So there are, to help you out, there are subtitles here. So basically anything that makes our life easier during surgery is welcome. So, and this is something that we need to uh, look at. So this is the reason I put this video. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Just a reminder, 
Uh, Rahul, sir, don't get angry. We are not live with that photo yet. <laughs> it's just a reminder. Okay. So there are two programs that we would like you all to sign up for forget about your age people as old as dr prem are coming for the young turk summit <laughs> okay right but we are welcome to both goa and back in chennai and chennai we need all the help that we can get so please let us know thank you thank you dr ravin it's a fantastic having yes. such a vast experience in 122 cases so what are the technical difficulties you face so far that is the idea sir this one has actually made my life easy so when I'm in a long list of cases and I have three or four IPOMs on that day, that's the day I actually ask for these measures because it really makes my life easy. It's very, very fast. And what is the science behind it? There is less pain when comparing with the... Yes, sir. so there is uh, well, enough data to say that transfacial, especially if it's not in the midline, if you are taking transfacial laterally, tends to be much more painful compared to uh, the midline transfacial. Okay. So now there is as per data it is still suggested that a combination of tackers plus transfacial is the way to go for an ipom but that said that data is not uh, supported very strongly it's recommended that's all thank you sir you remove that balloon through the 20 mm convert uh, the 10 mm port to 20 mm huh? yes, sir what, what is 12 it 12 mm port you'll remove that balloon that huh? balloon is very very collapsible it'll come out through your 5 mm 5 mm easily sir, the, th the key thing is at the end of it, when you've removed it, make sure those four spiral blue things are all removed. That come, It's stuck to the uh, balloon. Make sure at the end of the surgery, they have all been removed. Yes. So what's the advantage you are conveying now Sir, because of this system? Advantage one, number one is um, time. Uh, it's definitely yes. compared to a normal composite mesh, you save at least five to seven minutes, one thing. Second thing is, I would say the key thing here is that central overlapping, centrally placing of the mesh is very, very important. You will find that especially if you're a person who's doing IPOMs from the lateral aspect, you're not able to judge especially where exactly the center is when you are placing your tackers. So transfacials does help, but if you're placing only tackers, uh, a centrally placed stitch or the positioning system matters. Yes. Anyway, very interesting Naveen, uh, talk. Yeah, Naveen, excellent talk. Uh, I have been using EcoPS and the reason uh, why I feel this mesh is good is because you remember since morning we are talking about center of the mesh should be the center of the defect. So in people when you are learning your IPOM plus, this is one of the meshes which will slowly graduate you to know how you have to centralize your mesh because if you have off-centered the mesh and the mesh shrinks, today we know that the meshes can shrink from 20% up to 40%, then you have an entity which is known as a margin hernia. This is again a new word which we learned today. So if you have a center here and if I have off-centered the mesh and the mesh is going to shrink from the sides of it, if I develop a hernia, which is known as a margin hernia. So it is the biggest role of eco PS is center of the mesh, center of the defect. So you just can't go wrong. Yeah. I think more than anything else, this is the way I will look at it as an advantage. Yeah. Thank you. So that picture what is, that? is actually showing you what sir is talking about. So if you don't center it, how it actually moves, so that marginal hernias is a bigger chance and all that. Yeah, the, mechanic, the cost mechanics of abdominal wall, yes, just yes. matters. Regarding the cost factor. Cost factor as compared to your standard composite is around 2,500 to 3,000 more. That's all. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Navin. Right. If there are no questions, we can finish. I think uh, thanks for uh, holding the fort, uh, chairpersons and the speaker. Now we move on to very uh, higher uh, technical stuff. So we have the crossover coming up because it is always a sort of a, a first time experience. I don't want to go anything more. The first time experience of crossover, you all know how is the road is going to be, either you are a mountaineer you're getting married for the first time. First time is always the first time. So I think, uh, so Rahul has been, uh, again, a globally recognized teacher for all the forum. In fact, uh, the AHS has recognized him with almost every year faculty ship. Uh, EHS has recognized him as a regular speaker. 
and more than anything, the Romanian hernia days and the Swiss hernia days, they are the very, very robust uh, teaching programs for which Rahul remains a program. I don't have a count. It is more than 30 lakh views uh, Dr. Rahul's videos have gone through. So Rahul's videos are very, very unique. You will have to, I can announce a price, one lakh, if you get to catch four RBCs, five RBCs during his entire procedure. I need not tell anything more. The point is, he has a system in place. As Dr. Jignesh was showing about a rocky landing, which many times happens in Chennai. You have a system in place, rocky or smooth landing. Your day depends, your case depends. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor of uh, inviting uh, Dr. Satyapriya ma'am to come up to the stage. Dr. M. Vijay Kumar, please come up to the stage. Vijay Kumar, sir, you are the one. I am initial, sorry. And uh, Alagasin, sir, our uh, easy member of the Tamil Nadu ASI. And Paulia, ma'am, please come up to the stage. So we always firmly believe uh, the chair forte is between youngsters and uh, seniors. Palya ma'am, please come up. It's you. We have been asking for you during the inauguration. We missed you at that time. So this is going to be a talk on crossover. Chairpersons, please take over. Please come up to the stage. Rahul, Baya, it's all yours. Okay. At the outset, uh, I thank uh, Kumaran and uh, Kanagwil for giving me this opportunity to come here in front of you. And he has uh, given a specific topic for me saying that you have to deal with the technical aspects of the safe crossover. Now, I'm here to talk about the all technical aspects. I'm not going to the, or the theoretical aspects or how many uh, you know studies are conducted to do this and what all these things I'm not talking about. I'm talking about only technical aspect. So myself, Dr. Rahul Mahadar, today I'm going to talk about a safe crossover in ETEP. Now, to understand that, first year you have to know that on the anterior abdominal wall, there are three spaces that we are dealing with when you are dealing with a ventral hernia repair. First is the preperitoneal space, and then the retrorectal space, and then comes the pre-transversal space. Now, these three spaces we have to deal with in any ventral hernia repair. As the defect go large, you have to dissect laterally, from medial to lateral, all these spaces that has been dealt with in case of an ETEP repair. So preparatal space, what is the importance of preparatal space? It is mainly important for the midline crossover. So when is, this is a linear alba and in, this is in the epigastrium, if you do a midline crossover in the epigastrium or you can do a midline crossover in the hypogastrium. So like this. So these are the two spaces wherein you can do safe midline crossover. And why midline crossover is important? Because we are going to connect the two retrorectal spaces on right side as well as left side. And we have to connect this to do a Reeve Stopa repair. Now Reeve Stopa repair is from lateral border of rectus on one side to lateral rectus or border of the rectus on the other side. So this much space you have to dissect and then that will be reinforced with the help of a mesh. So this much crossover is required. Now for the crossover, now the usual scenario in operation theater is your monitor is here and you're doing the surgery like this and you're seeing in this way, the angle of your neck, this is this will pain a lot. Your shoulders also will pain a lot. Your paraspinous muscles will pain a lot. So most important is your operation theater setup. Now this is most important because what happens is uh, in an enthusiasm, you start doing the ETEP procedure for first two, three cases, you see, yeah, it is okay, but Afterwards, after operation, you cannot do the other operation on the same day or otherwise in the night you will feel that, yeah, my back is spinning like a hell. What to do for this? 
now then comes in your mind is i will start doing a eye palm procedure that is the best way why to go for this particular procedure because this procedure will last more than two and a half hours three hours or so so most importantly the operation theater setup now here if you are dealing with the supra umbilical hernia repair then the surgeon is standing in between the leg the legs has been uh, uh, kept apart shoulders are uh, the arms are tucked to the body one monitor at the one shoulder of the patient other monitor at the leg end of the patient the two monitors are required now another scenario wherein you can see the monitor is here other monitor is here and surgeon is standing here so this is how there are two monitors are required and high definition systems are required for doing this particular procedure the other point is you have to break the table like this this is the most important thing because what happens is when you are dealing with all the hernias in upper abdomen as well as in the lower abdomen upper abdomen and uh, lower abdomen what happens is when patient is lying on this particular broken table what happens is this anterior abdominal wall gets stretched completely that is number one number two is this thighs they won't come in your this thing and the large breast in case of an obese patient obese female patients so that's why what you need to do is when you put a procast in these particular patients just one minute so these when you put this particular trocast and you are suturing or dissecting on the roof then this thigh will not come in your way that's why this is the most important is this is a breaking of the table in between so that is most important while suturing also this gives most important thing so work well begun is half done so most important part for a safe crossover is the port positions so port positions for umbilical and infraumbilical hernias if you see the hernia is from the umbilicus to symphysis pubis now for this you can put a 12 mm trocar here at this particular place now here at just below the costal margin you can put as this patient is an obese patient, large falsibum is expected in this particular patient. So this part position is okay. But otherwise, what to do for each and every patient that I will uh, talk about it in a later, uh, in this talk only in later on. Now this, after putting a 12 mm trocar, you can go into the retro uh, rectus space on the left side. And after that, four fingers are 10, 8 to 10 centimeter Along the lateral border of the rectus, you can put another 5 mm trocar here. Now, the most important thing is the marking. Now, this paper has been presented by me and uh, Dr. A.M. Arora that stating that the 7 cm on either side from the midline, if you draw a vertical line, this will represent the lateral border of the rectus. And 4 cm below the umbilicus, if you draw a horizontal line, this will represent the arcuate line. This is an arbitrary, but we have seen that more than 98% of the patient, it comes to an exact location. Okay, so that is, this is how this marking is done prior to the operation. And then we start putting the trocars like this. Now, after putting the second trocar, we have started dissecting uh, along the left retrorectal space down towards the symphysis pubis. Again, four fingers are eight to 10 centimeters. You can put a, here we are putting a 11 mm trocar because we are taking a 10 mm, 30 degree or 10 mm zero degree scope for the first instance, then convert it into 10 mm 30 degree. Now this 10 mm 30 degree scope, we are going to put here for midline crossover in the upper abdomen that is in the epigastrium. So now we have put a trocar here. We have dissected till the uh, cave of ridges if it is required. If it is not required, then up to symphysis pubis, you can dissect. Now the optics is shifted to this. With these two instruments, we can do a midline crossover in the epigastrium. Again, after doing a midline crossover, we are putting around uh, four fingers or eight to 10 centimeters away from this trocar. On the right side, we are again going to put a 11 mm trocar. Now, why this 11 mm trocar is because we, are, we can use this one, two, and three ports for the optics whenever it is required so that you can maintain the ergonomics throughout the procedure. So this is how we can do it. Now, again, we have shifted this optics here. And with these two instruments, we are dealing with the hernias further. 
So now we are going into directly into left retrorector space. Now this is the open technique is the best way of doing it or otherwise Dr. Jignesh Gandhi has already told you regarding the optical entry, all the details of optical entry has been told to you by Dr. Jignesh Gandhi. Now here, after going into this, you can put an optical trocar entry, but what happens is the most important thing is a target sign is a visible PRS in between. Then you have to change the direction of the scope and go inside. Otherwise, what happens is you can make a rent. Now, if you make this rent, then what happens is you are going into the peritoneum. So there are two th things what you can do. You can withdraw this particular scope. You can suture this and again try to get into that particular space. This is number one chance. Otherwise, still you can, there will be compromised space. So what you can do is go to the opposite side. Go to the opposite side directly. From there, you can put again same trocar you can put and you can come down here. That is one bail bailout solution for this particular thing. The most important thing is you have to understand that here you have started doing the CO2 insufflation. And then what you need to do is this is a posterior rectus sheet. This is a falciform and the peritoneum. You have to cut the peritoneum 0.5 centimeter below the linea alba. That is most important thing. So here you have taken an incision 0.5 centimeter below the linea not at exactly a linear that is the most important thing and then you can go into this preperitoneal space and then you can dissect this preperitoneal space down take the falciform down here you can see the falciform is down this is the cut end of the prs and then you what you can see in between is a linea and the opposite side posterior rectus sheath and then you can reach up to posterior rectus sheath and then you can uh, take an incision on the other side but here most important thing is when you are insufflated this particular posterior rectus space, what we have created or dissected, what happens is the PRS becomes on this side, which was horizontal. Now it has become almost perpendicular. And this is most important thing. One has to understand that because of CO2 insufflation, now this has become almost perpendicular. So your incision should be at a perfect spot so that you cannot cause, uh, while putting a trocar, you cannot injure this particular PRS. You have to be very gentle. You have to give pressure, withdraw the pressure and the rotating movements. Like that, you have to go inside and see that you are not injuring the posterior rectus sheath. So, otherwise what happens is, and if you don't understand that this is a perpendicular, it has become a perpendicular to this particular uh, linea alba, then what happens is you go directly into a subcutaneous space, you are taking the incision wherein you are causing injury to linea alba. So, you need to understand, now here, this is a, a rectus muscle, this is a PRS, this is a linear, but here you can understand. This is from here onwards, this linear has started. Can you understand that? And this is a PRS. You can very well demarcate these two. These are fibers of linear here, and this is a posterior rectus sheath. So I have to take incision five millimeters below this. Okay. And then I can cut it to go into a pre space. And that is most important. But what happens is, this is around seven years back when I started doing uh, ETEP for a complex hernias. What happened is I have to take an incision here. Rather than taking incision here, I have taken incision here just la lateral to this particular uh, rectus muscle, uh, just medial to lateral muscle, rectus muscle. And this is what has happened. You can see this yellow glistening structure. Now this is subcutaneous fat. This is not a falciform ligament. So, most importantly, what happens is you can cause this is a actual hernia and this is linea alba and this is a falciform and this is the iatrogenic rent or injury to linea alba that has been caused by me during this particular operation. Believe me, nothing to worry about. What is needed is you have to suture this. Remember, suturing comes at the latter end of the operation after completion of the dissection. So for till that time, what happens is you just forgot that yeah, I have made an injury or rent to the linea. So that is most important. The most important thing is 
close this particular range and dissect little further here because you need to get at least four or five centimeters of mesh coverage of reinforcement here. So here what happens to the second point is your mesh size will increase because of this. So you need to understand that not only to closure of the range, but you should reinforce it. Reinforcement of this particular range should be done after closure with the help of a mesh and that mesh should go at least four to five centimeters proximal to that. And that is the most important thing. So after crossing this particular, uh, taking down this falciform ligament and peritoneum in the preperitoneal space, now you are dealing with the uh, opposite side PRS. Now here you can see you have to divide this opposite side PRS. Once you divide it, you should see the muscles on opposite side. And that is the most important thing. If you don't see the muscles, then it is a trouble. Now, another thing one has to understand that there is a linea in between. So linea, you, you should understand clinically also, you should see that where there is a diastasis of recta is there. Or otherwise, for every incisional hernias, you, you are doing or you should ask for CT scan abdomen. And there you can measure this linea at the epigastrium, how much thick it is. If it is 1.6 to 2 centimeter, it's a normal. If it is more than 2 or 2.5 centimeters, that much laterally you should go and take a incision over the other side PRS. That is most important. And then you can see this particular muscle and then you can enter. Now for that, another trick is just reduce your monopolar current to 16, 17 and then just a, a small hole that is to be made with the help of a hook. And see that you are seeing muscle. If it is not, then you can change the site of incision. That is number one. Number two, you can with this particular current, which has been lowered down now, it will cause a twitches of the muscles of the opposite side. Now that is where you can take an incision and uh, go into the opposite side, opposite side PRS. So now here is the same patient. Here I try to do but there is no muscles, then I just go laterally uh, around five millimeters laterally and then would take an incision. You can see very well, see now muscles here. So now this is the space where you have to expand this particular space. I extend the incision and you can do this particular procedure. Now this is one of the procedure. What happens is now here in this particular patient, I have shifted this screw car here and I'm doing a midline crossover for this particular hernia. Now I'm putting, this is a neurovascular bundle and just medial to that, just proximal to that, I'm putting this uh, 10 mm trocar. The optics is shifted here and then I'm taking the incision over the PRS. Now here you can understand that this has become almost perpendicular, right? Now five millimeters below this particular a medial border of the rectus on the left side, I'm taking an incision and I'm just cutting only PRS. I'm not taking a deep incision, only taking the PRS and extending it craniocaudally. Slowly, you have to take an incision and extend this particular incision so that you will see the yellow glistening structure that is a falciform ligament. And now you can extend this particular incision down approximately five to six centimeters. Here I'm taking a little bit more. So after doing that, just swiping movement, it will get all the falciform down. And if at all there are small vessels are there that they can, that can bleed that you can take care of. But while doing this in this particular patient, what happens is you can see here, here there is a hernia which has not been even seen on CT scan. There is a small hernia in the epigastrium just below the zip sternum. You can very well see the defect and I have taken the contents down, taken the sac down and now here you can see this particular fibers here is the linea, this is the defect, and this is the linea actually. The linea ends here, but these are the structures. 
which I thought it is a, a PRS of opposite side. And then I started cutting it. So this is because of this particular hernia, this has happened. So while after taking incision, I found that, yes, I opened the peritoneum. So now again, nothing to worry. Just go 0.5 proximal to that or medial to that. And then I have taken incision and I put a left hand trocar into this. So this is the peritoneum I have taken down. And then I can see this opposite side PRS now. And after taking incision over this particular PRS, I can see the muscles. Can you appreciate that? Now this particular space that is expanded. Now the most important part is this particular rent that need to be closed afterwards that you should remember. And then you can do a safe crossover in the epigastrium like this. And after doing, after extending this uh, incision craniocaudally, Now this hernia is still there, just medial to that. I have done a midline crossover and extended this particular space, dissected it. And then I'm going to put a trocar on that side and then the midline uh, dissection is carried out. So port positions for supra umbilical and epigastric hernias. Now here for those, the, these hernias, now ergonomics is most important. Again, here midline crossover in epigastrium becomes difficult many a times. So in those cases, what we can do is, now here you can see this patient is having umbilical hernia as well as epigastric hernia like this. And here the midline crossover becomes quite difficult. Now in these situations, what we can do is, at just above the umbilicus like uh, inguinal hernias, you can go into a, a retrorector space on the left side like this. Sorry. Sorry. So you can go here in this particular space, dissect it, go towards the symphysis pubis at the uh, space of radius, and then lateral to inferior epigastric, you can put a 5mm trocar. With this trocar, you can dissect further, and then you can do a midline crossover here in this particular region, that is a hypogastrium, put another trocar, 11 mm trocar here. The surgeon is now standing in between the legs and the optical, uh, the uh, camera person is also standing just next to the surgeon and then the midline crossover is done. Another trocar can be put lateral to the inferior epigastric 5 mm trocar. And with these three trocars, then you can dissect further in this, uh, in the direction that is what is called as a bottoms of ETEP RS. So this is how we can do for the supra umbilical hernia. Now, while doing so, the most important thing is after coming from the left side into a hypogastric, uh, hypogastric region, here the peritoneum and the, uh, the fat will go down. And you should see the rectus abdominis muscle on both the sides and in between is the linea. This picture should see. But many a times what happens is after doing dissection, you are coming from here, you have put a trocar and you are seeing like this picture. You are not seeing the rectus abdominis here. You, this is the peritoneal fold. This is the misguide for this. If you go into this particular plane, now you are again going into the preperitoneal plane. So you have to go retromuscular plane or retrorectus plane. So the most important thing is don't take this as a, and this cavity for the dissection. You have to dissect further above here at this point and then you can go and see this particular space here. So this is the a trick for this particular hypogastric uh, midline crossover. The most important thing is that patient position and table position should be like this. Now your anesthetist should allow you the going the, giving this position but the most important thing is if you uh, take a proper DBT profile uh, protocol properly then you can put this particular uh, type of a position for the patient like this. Now you can see here what happens is this causes this particular anterior abdominal wall straight and you can carry out the procedure. Now these are the intra pictures. You can see these two trocars. You can utilize this trocar also and you can do a suturing in the uh, on the roof like this. So this is another video showing the 
inferior epigastric uh, sorry uh, hypogastric crossover the midline crossover is the hypogastrium like this i have put a trocar then the optics is shifted to this particular trocar with these two instruments we can dissect in the midline now this is the patient Now this is the patient, optical entry into left retrorectal space, just above the umbilicus of the left side. Then I am doing, again here, you can take down all these uh, transversalis fascia and hypogastrium and preperitoneal dissection is done. After that, as Dr. Jignesh Gandhi has told, there is a division of uh, arcuate line or PRS that is to be done from the with the lateral trocar and then this is the PRS of the opposite side. Now this opposite side PRS also is been cut like this. Now this is the brisk artery that is taken care of so that you will avoid the inadvertent bleeding. And then midline crossover is almost done. You have, now you are going to put a trocar into a supra pubic space here. And now optics will be shifted here in this particular trocar. And then a lateral is now here from below up. We are seeing this is on the left side. Now you can do a retrorectal dissection from below up like this. Now here you can see the neurovascular bundles. This is the end uh, of this uh, for the RS. If you want to go laterally, then you can do a bottom subtar. Now here on the opposite side. Now the ligature is the my favorite instrument. That's why you are seeing ligature, but you can use other instruments as well. So this is how the midline crossover in the hypogastrium is done. Now many times for the midline crossover in the epigastrium, what happens is uh, there are short uh, falciform in many of the patients. So for that matter, there is a supracostal entry into a retrorectal space on the left side. And for that, the tip of the zippy sternum from there, three centimeter down and five centimeter lateral, you can take an incision. Now this is the costal margin. So it is called as a supra costal entry into a, a left retrorectal space. Now here, three centimeter down and five centimeter lateral, you can go and you can Now here I'm showing the entry. Now this is the patient. Because of this, what happens is the trocars are gone up and you can deal with this particular hernia and she was having a hernia in the uh, switches defect in the midline because of the previous operation. Now here you can see always for the supracostal entry, always go by open technique only. Should not be done with the help of an optical entry because that will cause a disastrous problem that I will show you. So we are, after taking a, a skin incision, the fat has been taken care of with the help of artery forceps. You will see the uh, glistening structure, white glistening structure is the anterior rectus sheath. And you can take an incision over the anterior rectus sheath. You can see here and you can see the muscles. Now this muscle, what you have to do is you have to just put a artery forceps and split the muscle. Now what you are going to see here is the peritoneum, not the posterior rectus sheath because at this level, at nine costal cartilage, there is no posterior rectus sheath. Everything is going above, only peritoneum is there and below that is the costal margin. So you have to be very gentle here and then you can go inside with the artery forceps, you can split the muscle and you can you can very well see here the posterior peritoneum here. Now you are entering into directly into a posterior rectus sheath on left side. Now here you can put now trocar. And then you can, after putting a trocar, you can put a gauze piece to uh, prevent the leakage of the gas. And the gas is started. And you can see the uh, distension of the left side of the 
abdomen and then you can go enter into this particular space directly. You can see here, we are dissecting into this particular space and then you can put this particular trocars and do the dissection and then you can do a midline crossover. Now what happens is, now here also while doing midline crossover, if you see the uppermost trocar at this level or above that, I'm cutting this posterior rectus sheath. So that is most important. And here you can see the falciform ligament and the preparatory space. Now here, there are only few fibers that is need to be cut. And then taking down this particular falciform down. And then here you can see the color change. There's a pinkish and here is the white is a linear alpha. Now I am taking an incision over posterior rectus sheath of opposite side and you can see the muscle and then you can carry out the midline crossover. So what happens is in this particular uh, space precostal entry, if you use an optical trocar, what happens is because of this, you can directly enter into a chest cavity and that is the most diff difficult situation. So advantage of this particular technique is make easy midline crossover in the epigastrium, less chances of missing the plane. Even though small falciform ligament is there, one can still enter into preparatal space at falciform level easily without compromising the extra parietal space. High crossover leading to orientation and division of the medical, medial aspect of PRS further down quite comfortable and precostal <coughs> ports can be used as an excellent suturing port for the midline defects and in the, in case of a diastasis of recti, all port positions are shifted upwards, which facilitates suturing very well. There are disadvantages for this. The disadvantages are restricted movements due to large breast in case of a female patient or obese patient and measures to avoid this is the split the table position. Now, to do any ETEP procedure, you have to revisit the knowledge of anterior abdominal wall Hands-on courses on cadaver models are must. Guided mentorship is most important thing for first few cases at least. Pre-operative marking of seminar line and relevant anatomy is most important. And spend time developing proper tricks to accomplish this particular endeavor. Now you can see here, this is one video when you are starting doing an ETEP procedure. Start with small hernias first, then primary hernias first, and then you can start with the incisional hernia. See the mentor is standing aside you and he is encouraging you. You are doing a good steps. She has done this particular thing well. Now you can shift over to large incisional hernias, like seven or eight centimeter defects or something like that. So then again, you have to keep for such cases, for at least first few cases, the mentor, he is encouraging then she can do this particular endeavor very nicely. And now you can start doing the lateral wall hernias. Now the lateral wall hernias, for this, you have already done the midline. So you know all the uh, anatomy structures. Now you have done the lateral wall hernias. Now comes the subcostal hernias or GP sternum hernias after CABG. Now this particular hernias, are most difficult or most challenging hernias and this can be completed with the help of a mentor in your OT. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is a Young Tuck conference that is going to happen in Goa. These are my credentials. You can see more than 120 uh, procedures of hernias, different procedures of hernias. In the group. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rahul. It's a wonderful session. And you started with every each and every step from you know the surgeon's position, table position, split table, port side, and uh, you know drawing prior to the ports, everything very nicely. Yeah, thank you. And uh, the one should know that if it doesn't go well, what will happen? For example, the table position. The table position, if somebody split more, so what will happen? So there are disasters, I believe. If you, if you say anything about it, uh, actually this never happened with me up till now. But see, there are you can see very well clinically also if the abdominal wall is straightened enough, 
then you have to stop at that particular point. Don't give uh, exaggerated positions so that, you know, patient will have a back pain or something like that in a post-operative period. But many a times what we have seen is if you give a proper position and uh, then this endeavor becomes quite easy. Okay. That is how it is. It's a wonderful session. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Next. Any questions from the floor? You shouldn't ask this time duration. But time duration for ETA procedure you are talking about? See, Six these seven. procedures, see, when you start doing ETA procedure, I have started, when I started seven years back, this particular procedure, I took around three and a half hours to four hours for first few cases. After that, once you get accustomed to all this anatomy and your instrument and your staff is getting trained along with you, because the camera person is the most important person in this particular endeavor because many a times he has to take out the laparoscope clean it once again put it inside because it's a compromised space so what happens is after that it got reduced now it requires around one and a half hours to one hour 45 minutes to complete the procedure speed comes with the experience for, for lateral port site hernia what is the best laparoscopic procedure lateral port site hernia now see the most important thing is for the lateral wall hernias, there are different procedures which are available. See, many a times you have to think in terms of how much size of the hernia is. Many a times these port side hernias, lateral hernias are small hernias, around 2 centimeters or 3 centimeters. For those hernias, if the site is not causing uh, uh, trouble for this uh, admin, I mean that the bony structures are not around in a close proximity, then what you can do is you can go ahead and do a tap procedure or even an eye pump procedure for that. Or you can think of the even a small open procedure also that is also is feasible. Many a times for this particular small hernias, three centimeter and down, ETAP procedure becomes a overkill in my opinion, because it's a moreover technically very challenging. See, the expert can do it. The expert like Prem Kumar can do it in within a one and a half hour. He's a boss. But the other persons, it is it becomes difficult. But the you have to choose the procedure, what is best for that particular patient at that given point of time with the expertization of the surgeon. That is the most important thing. It should be a tailored approach always for every hernia. Thank you so much, Chairpersons. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful session. So next, we're going to move on to the panel discussion. Uh, can I invite the... One second. So we're going to have a panel on inter ventral challenges in Bayon. Uh, again, the moderator will be Dr. Rahul Bahadur. The panelists are Dr. Jignesh Gandhi, Dr. Pramod Shinde, Dr. Prem Kumar Balanchandar, Dr. Deepak Subramaniam, and Naveen Alexander. Can you come along to the stage, please, all of you? Rahul, it, Rahul, uh, it's a post lunch session, so don't ask difficult questions. <laughs> My questions will be very basic questions. So Absolutely. it is a uh, Learning for the new uh, candidates, and it is not, it will not be a <laughs> exam. So, now we are talking about the ETF for ventral hernia repair. What are the troubleshooting measures or what troubles it can cause? And in that, I am going to ask first. Is ETEP procedure is ergonomically better than the other procedure, laparoscopic procedures, frames? Uh, that's, right. that's actually a trick question uh, because, I mean, see, uh, it is not a very ergonomic operation and uh, it depends on the quadrants that you're operating upon. So it's just, a, uh, you can make it more ergonomic by increasing the number of ports. 
but uh, having said that it's not the most ergonomic of operations yeah deepak you are taking i think this. you're asking specifically about ventral correct not about ingoy yeah. okay so ventral i think it is i think you get used to it over time it is not something immediately you will be able to start off with with a very perfect ergonomics especially the crossover part and other things that you were talking about needs a camera change probably if you need two monitors also sometimes so it is tricky but i think over time it it is quite comfortable to get uh, with experience jignesh your opinion so uh, ergonomically it is uh, there is a learning curve and i always would say that start off doing your ipom and ipom plus first get a mastery by and large four out of your five patients will require an ipom plus and go away but that one patient who will require an etap rs is where you'll have to practice the suturing skills on the roof and that's where ergonomically it gets challenging so learn your way and then do it shinde sir your opinion well actually etap was touted and advocated as a more ergonomic procedures because most laparoscopic surgeon we spread our hands and operate so it takes a toll on the shoulders for etap we are actually operating within the two semilunar lines so our hands are much more closer together so theoretically it is more ergonomical practically the ergonomics become difficult because we are standing on one side of the patient and we have to move a lot it's not like an ipom plus we are sitting on a stool and doing it only at one place so from go, moving towards head end towards foot end and prolonged times of suturing make it more difficult and then it does not feel like being more ergonomic okay navin your opinion yes sir so being a person who teaches basic laparoscopy so triangulation number 1 is something that we are very very uh, uh, you know persistent about so the initial steps definitely triangulation is not there it is achievable but with only practice and that practice comes when your team does not change this is something i feel i as a person who's teaching in a medical institute i always have a problem because every month the post graduates are rotating so for them to grasp it itself it's it takes time and another thing is the need for especially in larger hernias the need for more than one monitor changing positions all these do matter i am doing a study uh, <laughs> which uh, we will be presenting at uh, yt regarding the ergonomics of awr so that uh, a questionnaire will be coming to you as well yeah. and uh, we will we will give our final results on that <laughs> yeah so you can see here we started the ipom procedure by lateral ports first and with that lateral ports going inside after while doing this roof suturing it was become quite difficult for the ipom plus procedures but here for in case of a etap procedure what happens is your port positions is above in the midline medial to the lateral border of the rectus on either side and because of that the suturing becomes quite easy but nowadays with uh, many of the surgeons they have shifted the ipom uh, procedures also while doing this particular port positions and that becomes quite easy for the midline hernia defects as uh, rightly mentioned by dr jignesh gandhi still ipom is not dying it is there it is the indications have now come down that is the only thing because for up to 3 cm of hernia ipom is still better procedure than doing a etap procedure for them so for suturing of the defect on roof or at the floor how this etap procedure is helpful in terms of the patients sindhe sir for the patients you said yeah patients i don't think it will matter it will yeah. it should matter actually to the surgeon yeah. who is taking all the trouble to do the suturing yeah so in terms of patient as well as in terms of a surgeon how it is going to help in long run giving good results to the patient rahul the principle of any hernia i would not know i let the principle of any hernia repair is restoration of the midline yeah we know that linea alba because very simplify skull has got a protection in the front and the back chest has got a protection in the front is a sternum back is a spine but abdomen the only thing in the front is a linea alba so i think by doing an eta paris you are restoring the midline continuity yeah. which is physiological and that's why there is a great benefit to the patient yeah yeah 
सो आई वॉन्ट टू मेन्शन दिस पर्टिक्युलर आस्पेक्ट ओनली शिंदे सर कि वी आर नाउ रिस्टोरिंग द functions of the anti abdominal wall by closing the defects and why i agree yeah yeah and while closing the on the floor also and the roof also what we are doing is we are now maintaining or maintaining the functions of the anti abdominal wall and that can lead to a good results in this now on one point in etap do you agree that with these particular positions in a infra umbilical hernia you can suture these particular defects and for the upper abdominal defects if you are standing in down in between the legs of the patient and doing the suturing that becomes quite easy now do you agree with this yes yes yeah. ergonomically now, it becomes ergonomically easy it becomes quite easy midline. so Except for positions that, that is most important uh, roof has a little different learning curve and that technique has to be relearned yeah again okay. now i want to see i have already shown these particular port positions in the, my previous talk but still i am going to talk about this how we are going to maintain the ergonomic position with this particular now if we are dealing with the umbilical or infra umbilical defects then how we are going to maintain this particular position now just see first this particular video and then you can uh, make a comment on this whether these particular port positions are good for doing this particular operation now you can see here we are going directly into the left retrorectal space putting a 5 mm trocar and then after doing a dissection in the uh, left retrorectal space again going down and then putting a another trocar and then shifting this particular uh, optics into this particular trocar and doing a midline crossover with these two instruments even though it is not ergonomically uh, better thing because the optics is not in the midline but you can change this particular trocars that after without putting a 5 mm you can put a 11 mm there and you can put 5 mm here and then you can do this midline crossover so uh, for doing midline crossover do you feel these particular port positions are good for this particular operation jignesh i think uh, etap rs is an operation where you do more of sectorization than triangulation so i would probably be very happy with this jumping from one port to the other port but you have to be a master of sectorization technique because you have to unlearn the triangulation technique when you are doing an etap rs so probably this would be a good approach having said that looking at this particular location i would even not mind going in from below because the only thing is there that i will be standing between the legs it gets a little technical challenging initially but i think ergonomically it works better because you can do a better triangulation Uh, right but in this particular patient the umbilicus to symphysis pubic distance is just 11 cm okay, and okay. in that case it is not possible you have to do a midline crossover in the upper abdomen prem your comment on this yeah I, <clears throat> excuse me i follow the same method of crossover like start from the le left subcostal clear up the entire interrector space and i jump around between the 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 ports like you do yeah Deepak, you are same. I mean, uh, similar. Only thing is, maybe the optics can be in the middle also. If you are very comfortable only with optics in the middle and two instruments, still that's still possible in this setting if you wanted to do. It. But how uh, do you feel regarding the cramping of this particular space uh, while doing this midline crossover? What precautions do you take during this midline crossover? So when uh, for see any any midline crossover. one retrorectal space has to be fully cleared so you actually get a full space you can't go with you know 3/4 of dissection on the left side and then attempt the crossover and i think um, most important thing is once you clear it i think the other thing is you have try to have your monitor uh, to the head end of the patient or the lateral at least to the lateral side right shoulder at least when you're doing the falciform uh, crossover because it's very difficult when you're looking at the lower end many many centers i know do it with only a single monitor uh, but it's sometimes very difficult at least try to change the same monitor would at least in the initial stages will really help in making the crossover much simpler shinde sir your comment i think that surgeons are very witty and uh, they can make get used to any position that they want like for example i don't put the optics down at all my optics remain up and in that limited space with these two instrument depressing the posterior rectus sheet with my left hand and that 5 mm port i could do a crossover the cameraman struggles because there is very little space from which he has to cross over the falciform and show me but surgeons get used to things 
which may not be technically right. If you talk about ergonomics and triangulation, that's not right at all. This is a better way. But as surgeons, we do get used to some of the compromises and we are still able to perform it very well as long as we know what we are doing and we are achieve a good technical excellence in that. Okay. But while putting this optics in the first stroke art itself, do you, uh, after while you are taking the incision or the posterior rectal shade, don't you feel that you are getting the fogging of this particular uh, lens fogging and other things and your vision get lost because of that? Because you are very, using monopolar current, very right? Minimal, very minimal cutting current and one port partly open down so that, okay. that gas goes out this way. Okay. Now so, you are technically expert, yeah. so you can do that. But for the beginners, I think this, this is better. This is the this better is, in position. fact, the optic can come to the second. Yeah. Point. In the so second that, port also, that, that is also is possible. It's a better triangulation also. Yeah. So, the, so Jignesh, can you please comment on what precautions do you take regarding doing the midline crossover in this situation? So point number one is uh, ergonomically, I always sit and operate when I'm doing this crossover. Because when you are sitting and operating, you can easily do it. Because when you're standing and doing it, you will be seeing that you'll be in a very odd position. That is point number one. Point number two, keep on dissecting the PRS as high as possible. What happens is that the rectus muscle sometimes at the middle part gets a little sticky to the PRS. If you don't dissect till the apex, you will just cut it and you will leave a big chunk of PRS onto the root. mode at 30 or a blend mode rather than using a coagulation mode because I want just that cut in the depth. That is the way I will do it. And once I have dissected that, create a small window of falciform, go there and then only I will do my further steps without creating that window up and down of 5 centimeters not to proceed with any kind of crossover. Okay. Now you are done the crossover and you are dealing with these particular port positions and just one minute. I, uh, you can come. Regarding the crossover, I just have one uh, suggestion to any all the beginners. Whilst we are crossing, crossing over, our direction of dissection should be on the horizontal plane. Yeah. The moment it becomes like this, as you have rightly shown, we will go across the linea alba and injure it. If it goes down, then we are going to go into the peritoneal cavity and cause a pneumoperitoneum. So, we want the falciform ligament to come down from the roof. Yeah. So we have to be horizontal and sail across being almost horizontal all the time. Yeah. So when we are horizontal and we are depressing with the left hand, we are sailing across the falciform. Again, the opposite posterior rectus sheath. The direction is again going to be absolutely horizontal. So as long as we are, this direction is maintained, the possibility of injury becomes less. Yeah, this is a proper good point that is mentioned by Dr. Shinde, sir. Now, after doing the midline crossover, you are dissecting in the midline. You can shift your uh, trocar positions here above, optics above. And then while after uh, complete uh, dissection, you want to close this particular defect. So what with, I will show first, these are the port positions. How differently you do or how differently one can do, you just tell me. Now, this is the midline where I'm switching from below up first at this level, at the level of this particular lateral trocar, I stop with this particular port position. I shift it to this particular port position again. Now the optics is shifted here. And then I start from above down like this. And then it join in between. So this is how this is how I'm doing now your take on this. I completely agree with what you're saying, sir. I think one of the key points that any eater person needs to remember is to be adjustable. So if it is not working out, if things are getting too close and your vision is getting impaired, you already have other ports in place. Move to another port, see which works for you best and achieve the final outcome. That's what it should be. Okay. So you go. I mean, yeah, but I, I don't think, I mean, even if this is difficult also, there's no harm in putting a couple of other ports even in the lower yeah, uh, midline. Absolutely. And uh, do the suturing because this might be a little tr tricky to do it from the top up to this level. So I wouldn't mind putting a couple of more ports to the lower, lower yeah. midline. I yeah. think this is one surgery 
where the surgeon should not worry about putting that extra port exactly. to make life more easy. So extra putting an extra port is again is a surgeon choice. Not necessary. You should put it, but if you put it, it doesn't harm to the patient. Now I want to ask Shinde sir whether I have done an ETEP RS for umbilical hernia and the divarication was around the umbilicus three centimeter above three centimeter below in that area only. But I have started from epigastrium to almost at the level of a symphysis pubis. Whether I need to reconstruct entire linea or I have to just reconstruct the, the defect part only and the divarication part only. What is your take on this? No, the principally we need to reconstruct the linea alba to the extent that it is disrupted. So divarication above, divarication below and the umbilical defect. But in order for the suture line to hold, we have to go few centimeters above the divarication. We have to go a few centimeters below the divarication. Now in order to achieve those two centimeters above the divarication closure, our ports also have to be go above that and therefore the dissection is going to be at least 7 centimeters above. So in order to reconstruct that midline, the amount of space dissection is going to be much larger. The suture line is not going to be restricted to that area. It is going to be above to below. So as far as ETEP RS is concerned, whether we put just a 12 by 15 centimeters mesh or 25 by 15 centimeters of the mesh is not the issue. We need to cover the space and reconstruct the midline. So there we do not have a miserly attitude. So therefore, it would be incorrect and leaving the patient open to recurrence and the suture line opening up if we restrict ourselves in the approach. Once we have done a retrorectus dissection, then we should not worry about millimeters. We should reconstruct it fully and we should put this mesh enough to cover the space which has been dissected, not just that 5 centimeter root. Okay. So that's my take. English, you have take on this. I think Rahul, <clears throat> wherever you're going to disturb the PRS from the linea alba, all that has to be restored. So there is no second thought. You have to restore the entire midline. Whatever you have cut has to be resutured. So there is nothing no. like just doing a small part of it. You have dissected till the epigastric, the falciform, you have to restore everything. Now, this is the take home message that you have dissected entire linea. So you have to reconstruct entire linea. So you should not reconstruct only the defect part, the entire dissected part or entire linea that needs to be reconstructed in case of an ETAP repair. That is the take home message here. One minute. Now, the ergonomic port position during the supra umbilical port. See, this is again a port positions I have already shown. You can cross over, the crossover is done in the hypogastrium like this after putting the ports. Now, what are the tricks while accomplishing, accomplishing this, this particular maneuver from below up? What are the difficulties what one can face while doing? doing this particular operation bottoms up etep rs frame yeah the first thing is ergonomic issues so yeah. you can't do this by standing from the side you'll have to be between the legs number one. Second thing is uh you can go in the wrong plane like yeah. between the peritoneum and the transversalis and you may not go into the retorectus plane so these are the most two most common mistakes that can happen okay deepak pretty much it and um, I think uh, the, the at the level of the arcuate line, one has to be very careful again uh, because that it it can be very close. Sometimes the arcuate line is a little lower, and the port positioning where you're uh, having might make it much more difficult to go up into and dividing into the PRS. Okay, Jignesh, now you tell me for which type of hernias do you hmm. do a midline crossover in hypogastrium rather than in epigastrium? So all these hernias, which are uh, supra umbilical epigastric hernias, I would like to do that. One of the tricks which I do is I would keep a lithotomy position, keep the knee down, and I initially start the case as if I'm approaching the ETEP inguinal. 
So I will be standing onto the left side of the patient because these ports are exactly like you put it for a taping vinyl. The moment I put the 12 mm port, I have created a spacer, I have created a supra pubic space. Now I will go turn around and stand between the legs of the patient. My life becomes very easy because if you start up front, standing in the midline and then trying to approach, you will struggle. So start as if it's an e taping vinyl, create the space, come in the pelvis, and now you start looking up. It makes your life very easy. Sir, your take on this? What Jignesh has said is very true. The initial hypogastric, both Cooper's ligament, cave of Redzius, and Bogros space on the left, and part of the Bogros space on the right also has to be done a lot as exactly we would do for an e-taping vinyl. That makes life easy. Secondly, in the position, the having a table which can give a leg, leg split and also get the knees down is not possible for every patient because the knees, some tables have only leg split, but the knees don't go down. So we have to check out the ergonomic position because the, if the knees do not go down, the thighs are not completely gone down, then these lower ports are going to hit against it. Okay. So we have to look at what other surgeons are doing. There are some surgeons who put stirrups upside down and actually hang the legs down so that the thighs are down, legs are down, and they don't come in the way. One of the things which, you know, because when I was in uh, my private practice, I've got a yellow fin retractors. But when I'm in a teaching institution, I have the conventional gynec retractors, the lithotomy. So what you should do is if a lithotomy retractor is like this, completely turn it around and face the end downwards. So what will happen is your legs automatically come in a right angle position and they will not come your way. Because if you try to give the position like this, like it is given in a lithotomy for fistula, hemorrhoids procedure, you will struggle. You will struggle like anything. So, but the moment you will change your lithotomy and make an angle like this, your legs will go down. You'll be very, very. Only thing is the patient has to be strapped well, even to the lithotomy retractor, given DVT stockings, because this process can take time. So taking that precaution is also very important. Remember all ETAP RS procedures, please give them this thing because the last thing you want is a pulmonary embolism after 48 hours. Yeah. Now, the, another thing is while doing the suturing for this particular, after completion of this particular dissection, and then you start suturing. Now, suturing is started from this particular port and you can start from above till the level you can get at this particular port position and then you can change your uh, uh, the uh, needle holder, you can change it to down and then you can complete this particular procedure down. Any tricks or tips for this particular suturing in the room? Yeah, so uh, see, unlike your regular laparoscopic suturing where you have your nice ergonomics, you can take your C loop and more of the movement from the shoulder, here you should be able to work with your wrists yeah. because you're operating in a very narrow angle. Yeah. So the more wrist movement actually will be much better in this kind of suturing. And reverse suturing, you got to know how to hold the needle exactly to form, go all, along the direction of the needle. Okay. Deep Sometimes up. counter pressure from the abdominal wall really helps in these things. Yes. So when you give counter pressure and you the, the curvature of the needle goes around and then you're able to take this suture very well. So that actually really helps a lot. Okay. So what are the crossover challenges? Jignesh. I think the most important crossover challenge is to read your CT scan. If you read your CT scan well, what's important is to know the retro rectus distance between both of them. If you are dealing with a divarication which is W2, W3, anything which is bigger, the moment you will do the crossover, you should have it in your mind, the 3D map, that the distance between the two recta is about 4 to 5 centimeters. I will have to travel that much distance pre-peritoneal and then only I will see the PRS on the opposite side. So if you have not read your CT scan well, it's very easy to get into the subcutaneous plane. So don't pick up a W2, W3 when you want to do the first ETEP RS of your life. Pick up ones which are W1 because if you're doing a W2, W3, you will struggle, you will get frustrated and suddenly your instruments will be seen in the subcutaneous plane. So that is one thing which is very, very important. I think in the initial case uh, cases, it's also sometimes better if on table and ultrasound, if you have, you can mark the edges of the rectus and you can actually in, do it. In fact, in the radiology talk, I would mention that one of the indications for ultrasound is to mark it preoperatively. Pre and we tattoo it because in a teaching institutions, we have a long waiting list. So we use it with the HENA. So what happens is that the marks doesn't go. Otherwise, if you mark it with that, next day patient will take a shower, it's gone. But if you the Mehendi, what happens is that it remains at least for next three to four weeks. Because in teaching institutions, the patient is seen today, the, the list is after one month. So this Chindra is one sir, practical point. Your, your take on the crossword challenges. 
one of the common crossover challenges is to get an early pneumoperitoneum because beginners, we want to have that posterior rectus sheath quite long. We can't do it through a small window. Yeah. So we go right towards the umbilicus and sometimes the falciform ligament is small. So as we are cutting that, we obviously get a pneumo right there and then the whole abdomen swells up and then the crossover becomes more difficult. Yeah. That happens more often than the linea alba injury. Yeah. So for that, then what I do is then, or anybody can do is put in a viris needle on the opposite side because the abdomen is absolutely tense. And in case if that doesn't help, the, the flow of uh, outflow is very small, then we can use a 3 mm or a 5 mm uh, trocar at the level of umbilicus, which later on, if it is near the linea semilunaris, it can be taken inside the retrorectus plate. Okay. So pneumoperitoneum is a common problem which hinders while crossing early pneumoperitoneum. Okay. Navin, what you will do? Yes, I want to appreciate this photo first. The fact that you have gone past your topmost trocar to expose. That is number one thing I would like you all to see. Second thing is... Um, can you see the lower part where the PRS is still covered by a little bit of tissue that needs to be bared completely so that you know in which line you are going to be uh, going in. And uh, where you have marked the straight line and the dotted line, that 5 millimeters is very, very important. In fact, what I used to do for the initial, I will be very open about this. Initially, I did have a few pneumos. I think the first three cases, all three were pneumo. Once I ended up going too high, as Jiggy said, uh, I ended up in the subcutaneous space. So the, all these things are part of your learning curve. You cannot deny it. It is going to be there. But uh, over a period of time, things have smoothened out. What I do, like your dotted line, I actually make dots on the, yeah, I, I mark it with the uh, uh, spatula or the hook. But you accidentally opened this, in, gone into a subcutaneous space like this, and you have made a rain. Like this, what you should do in such situations. Now, this is the rent. So I convert it. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, that is exactly what I did. I didn't want to, I, I, I was actually froze first time when it happened and I didn't know what else to do. So I said, you know what, let me get back to what I know. So I opened it up, then I identified it, I repaired it and I was able to then go back into the uh, by open approach. I had created some amount of the retrorector space. So I finished it with the uh, retrorector repaired by open. Jignesh, I want to ask you whether I am putting a trocar laterally and I made a rent in the posterior rector sheath and pneumo has occurred. Already I have dissected on the left side and now I have done this particular mistake and now the space is not there. So what to do in such situation? So, and I, I want to do a midline crossover. So in such a situation, uh, the rescue is that get out all the pneumoperitoneum, try and close that opening. Sometimes that does work. If you take a locking suture, it works. If not, I always tell people that when you want to start any UTEP RS, start it with two but bilateral ports. Three ports on left side, three ports on right side. Gradually start removing one, 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 one ports and then you will standardize to four ports. So I will probably close that. If not working, go to the opposite side, which is virgin. Start from there and then you can always do a crossover from that side, which is very safe, doable and no egos. Yeah. I would say that even that opposite side 10 mm port, even that port when we depress it, that gives us an idea of where that posterior rectus sheath. So with the existing pneumo and the left-sided ports and one port you which you have put already from the opposite side, you can use that side and still cross over. Oh, yeah. So that is what is I want to show you here. That if you go in this direction also, then to get into this particular space, you have to go to the opposite side, put a port on the opposite side, and then you can get this particular uh, thing. And how to close the PRS? Now, what is your stake on this frame? So uh, I always save as much sack as I can right from the beginning with an intention to keep as much laxity to the posterior sheath as possible. It is not compulsory to close. I don't know what's the general thought, but it is not compulsory to approximate PRS to PRS. If you've got SAC, if you've got the thin fascia, closure of that alone is also enough. Only thing is you have to make sure that there is no tension. And I use continuous bob suture 2-0 for closing it. Deepak? 
Yeah, more or less everything is the same except that uh, maybe I'll also reduce a little bit of new more to help me a little bit if required. New more, new more. New. I mean, uh, tone down on the gas a little bit. Preserve sack as much as possible, as Doctor Prem said. Um, yeah, pretty much. I don't see any other. Navin. In fact, I would say this is one of the most satisfactory parts of suturing in any surgery because everything is lying down below. You have a nice big space. You play around with it nicely and. Uh, I have been using uh, 20 PDS lately, but uh, Bob was my initial thing. More for my my own postgraduates to allow them to suture as well. Because this is one thing I allow them to do. Sir, you are staying. Sometimes if the posterior rectus sheath defect is slightly larger than what I would comfortably want it to be, 4 centimeters, 5 centimeters, I have not been incisional hernia and sac has not been able to save so much, then I would close the anterior defect first. That sometimes helps the entire abdominal wall come together. And then that helps me close the posterior rectus sheath better. In general, in simple easy cases, closing the posterior rectus sheath is obvious and simpler. But in when there is difficulty, I would rather close the anterior rectus sheath first. And then come back to the posterior rectus sheath closing. But here, the point I want to mention is... While doing the dissection, you are, it is necessary that you should maintain this peritoneum as much as possible. Absolutely. Get down because that much of linea, you are separating the peritoneum from linea. So Absolutely. that much peritoneum, if you keep, because what happens is if these cut edges, if you see here, these are the cut edges and in between is the peritoneum. Is this sufficient for holding the mesh or you need to always close these ends together no, and what fact, will happen if you do if do, in do fact, so in fact posterior rectus sheath is already deficient by 5 to 6 mm on both sides yes yeah. pneumo has enlarged it yeah so closing posterior rectus sheath to posterior rectus sheath is not advocated because of the imminent danger of putting it under tension and causing post op posterior rectus sheath rupture yeah. Which will call so, a... there are many videos I have seen mm. on uh, YouTube and many uh, surgeons, they advocate that you should, you know, close the PRS to PRS and that causes the disaster in the, this situation. Jignesh, your take on this. So, uh, PRS closure is a very tricky situation. PRS closure with a hole, PRS closure without a hole. With a hole means that everything is gone. There is no peritoneum flimsy tissue and you are in trouble. So here the rescue measure would be that probably you will go down, purchase more of the sac in the lower part, try to create the space of Red Sea as Bogoros so that you can get it comfortably. And the closure need not be always vertical. Again, we have published this in the JMAS. You can do a transverse or an oblique closure. The idea is to close that. Another scenario is PRS closure without a hole. Here, I have seen a couple of videos in a lot of conferences where people just go and snap out the peritoneum out. And there's a big peritoneal sac lying in the hernia sac. Guys, please let us save the peritoneum. Because that peritoneum will be your rescue. It is an additional sheet covering your bowel. And on top of that, your mesh will be very, very protective. So I quite often jokingly say, as surgeons, let's save the peritoneum. Saving the tigers will be done by government of India. But we should make a plea that we should save the peritoneum always. So two scenarios and PRS to PRS is not required. It causes tension and there is a high chance that it can rupture. You have told me and I have also seen a couple of videos where there is an attempt to do it. If you can, it is fine, but it's not required. Yeah. Now, suppose this much of defect is there. You can uh, close this particular defect, this much defect only, and you can save this particular peritoneum and then you can put a mesh into this particular area. While suturing the peritoneum, uh, PRS complex, you should see that this laxity should be always there to close it out. If it is uh, it is under tension, then it is difficult and it can cause problems. It, it should be a hanging PRS like a tent which you should close but it should not be like a carpet TRS PRS. So if now, you have a carpet closure like a PRS, then it's under tension but if it's like a tent, you're good. Now, same thing uh, in a live conference ETAP RS was shown and he has preserved the peritoneum and still he can uh, take the sutures and everything but on the same day evening patient coughed very and she, he, she sneezes out and she got sudden pain in abdomen and then this was the picture when we go on inside.
and this surgery was done by Dr. Jignesh Gandhi. I myself was there for this particular case. This has happened in the, after live operative workshop. So this particular patient was operated in a workshop. We both were coming back and we got a call that something has gone wrong. So we said, okay, fine, get the patient here because we had already been there in the OT where the surgeon X was doing that case. And then when we reached there, uh, this is what we found. So I think you can pause there and ask opinion what to do. Prem, let's start with you. So see, there are two, two takes on this, on when this uh, rupture was found. If it's on the first post-op, I mean, no, actually I wouldn't uh, take a risk to close the PRS at all. Because once it's broken, it'll be very adiamatous and friable. And the more you try to close it, it's go only going to break more and more and more. So I think I will just go and eye palm that defect. One minute. Yeah, no attempt on closing the, trying to close that defect and maintaining it. I think release the additions, release the pull out the bowel and just put an eye pump. Nothing else. I was there, so I know what I was done. So you... <laughs> Can you please see again? Whether it's coming? No, he's. So, whenever there is a posterior rectal sheath rupture. Here it is not coming. Uh, basically, the posterior rectus sheath cannot be repaired so easily as Jignesh and uh, Deepak has and Prem has already said. So now once we get the intestine down, because the intestines herniate between the posterior rectus sheath and are directly lying in contact with the working proline working. mesh. But here it is so working. we need to protect these intestines from the proline mesh, and they need another cover. So the commonest option that is used is a dual mesh. Now here you can see what has happened is there is a disruption of the PRS and this bowel has gone inside. In such situations, sir, what is your take on this? What should be done? Whether you again reconstruct this PRS or you are going to put another mesh on it? See, the posterior rectus sheath, by now the intestines are distended. The posterior rectus sheath has become edematous. I have faced this situation once and uh, the closure is next to impossible. This hole needs to be patched by something that will protect the intestines. Yeah. So the option, first option is having a dual composite mesh and using it and tacking it to the abdominal wall so that the absorbable surface of the dual mesh will protect the intestines and will salvage the patient. The problem that comes here is then the dual mesh and tackers both add to the cost. And many times this procedure is being done because probably the patient may not afford these kind of things. But in an emergency, costs do not matter. There is, if there is nothing else, we have to use a dual mesh and close the effect uh, securely. Yes, I are. have used other options also. Yeah, uh, in in a situation where a dual mesh was not feasible, I have used a vicryl mesh uh, to patch it up completely. But even the tackers just go through that posterior rectus sheath and they don't fix so well. So it is difficult situation in reality. Yeah, more yes. a technical thing. I mean, uh, because this patient probably had even an obstruction. It's it's not easy to actually put the eye palm and tack it also. Because you have a dilated bowel sometimes and you also have created the uh, retrorectal space. So mostly the PRS would, uh, with the rupture would be, you will not have much space to actually put the eye pump and do that as well. But it's a tricky thing to do. This is another case shared to me by Dr. Ramana. This umbilical defect was around 3 by 3 centimeters wide diastasis recti. He did a nice ETEP RS repair. His, it was his own case. And after... Three days, the patient came. See, this is what he has done, the ETEP. And then the, the mistake he has done is, you can see here, even though it's just lax, he has closed this PRS to PRS completely. He has not conserved the peritoneum in between. So it is a tight closure. Her linea is reconstructed well. And then 
She readmitted with nausea, vomiting, febrile, stable hemodynamics, tender center abdomen. She did again CT scan abdomen in this particular patient. And what he found, the most important thing is if you feel a tachycardia, tachypnea with pain in abdomen in the immediate post-operative period, it's in a dire situation. Immediately you have to go ahead and do a CT scan abdomen. So CT scan abdomen, you can see here what you can see as you go down see now everything is looking fine here but once you go down here now you can see there is a line of demarcation Now, as you go down, see, this is the PRS and there is a herniation of the bowel into that particular defect. So, this is a disruption of the PRS and it is it is one of the interstitial hernia, what we can say, after this particular procedure. So, immediately he took this patient for... Uh, Diagnostic laparoscopy is done first. What he found is the bowel is gone into this particular defect. And you can see very well the mesh lying properly. But the uh, intestines were very good condition. So this much big defect was there. So what he did is tag this particular PRS to the previous mesh from all the sides and then put a mesh. It's a IPOM is the rescue procedure for this. So in conclusion in this case, these type of cases is patient who develop signs and symptoms of bowel obstruction should be high index of suspicion that small bowel may have herniated into surgically created potential space between mesh and PRS and it's a surgical emergency. So I just want to add one, two points to that. Number yeah. one, as you it's said. It's a surgical emergency. Yeah. Act fast. Don't that wait on it. Yeah. Always a CT with contrast. Because you don't know which part of the area has given way. So you need to plan your uh, intraperitoneal ports as well properly. That is one. Second thing is you will find that many times this bowel is stuck quite well to the mesh. But it looks appear, appears quite stuck. But if you use the adequate tension, it does come off very easily. And also be very aware that sometimes the barbs also cause a little bit of adhesions. So you need to be careful to separate the intestines from the barbs as well. Yeah. If the PRS complex is not closing without tension, what next? PRS is not closing. You can take a purchase from all the areas as we have rightly mentioned. And then you can close it comfortably. If not, then today we all have options of uh, putting in a biosynthetic mesh. Uh, there are papers which are talking about physics, which can be kept com very comfortably in cases where you have a PRS disruption. Having said that, I've even got away by putting in a vicryl mesh or composite mesh. So these are my options when I'm doing it. And as I told you again, vertical restoration is not required. You can even do a transfer or an oblique one. Before I complete, just on the previous case scenarios, guys, when you do your first ETEP RS, just don't throw away your gloves and sit outside for a coffee. Wait till the ex patient is extubated. Hold both the recti together till the patient is coming out because if your patient comes out violently while extubation, the first disruption will happen there. So this is just a technical point. Now, another thing is, uh, even though after doing that, I have already done the space of radius dissection and space of Bogro dissection, still it is not coming. Then we can do a just uh, the inter internal oblique aponeurosis from bottoms up, up to level of the umbilicus, you can cut down like this. This is actually bottoms up tar which started, but not the complete tar what we are talking about. It is just the uh, internal oblique aponeurosis release 
in the lower abdomen and then you can see here it is possible to close the defect so here you are not dealing with the transverse abdominis muscle anywhere you are just cutting the internal oblique upper neurosis on either sides and then you can close this particular defect horizontally you have opened it vertically but you can close it horizontally like this and it will reduce the tension over the prs and then after closure of this particular prs you can put the mesh now now you can see here and you can put a mesh would you consider even using the omentum as a bridging sir yeah you can use the omentum as a bridging also so what are the challenges of mesh deployment yeah so usually when you're doing an etep rs ventral you're talking about meshes of like 13 to 15 centimeters so the challenges will be when you're deploying the mesh uh first of all you you lose pneumo and then you're actually pushing it in blind so the way you roll the mesh the way you deploy it and also these meshes may not go through a 10 mm so you may need to take off the top flange and pass it through the channel of the scope alternatively you can use a 12 mm to pass the mesh inside measure always measure before you actually size the mesh it's very important because uh, sometimes your mesh can get curled up on the sides especially in the right upper upper right and the upper left so i think measurement of how big a mesh you want is put with anything even a, in a sterile scale you have or whatever it is is pretty key rest of the points with as well as whatever dr prem shinde sir we can use two or three different tricks one is if we have dissected up till the cooper's ligament we put in the mesh partly sutured so the flap which is free we can first suture it to the cooper's ligament so that unrolling becomes easy the other is that unrolling proline thread trick which i don't know how to describe it yeah, if you have a video, video so, yeah. now there are, i'll show that particular Switch technique tool, uh, technique so retain the co2 pressure to the normal polypropylene mesh has a memory so proper measurement of the mesh as deepak has already mentioned and use of 12 mm disposable trocar for putting the mesh that is the most important thing and unrolling of the mesh now for unrolling this is one of the trick that has been first uh, shown to us by dr raman and this is a, his video he has shared now what he did is he has sutured this particular mesh in the middle and it is like a swiss roll carpet uh, spreading method you can see here he can he is now fixing this particular mesh at the uh, cooper's ligament and then after that what you can do is you can pull this particular thread so that it gets completely spread like this so this is one of the method with which you can put a mesh into this etap rs jignesh you want uh, your take on this yeah so so i've been using this very frequently the way you would do it is can you hold this so so you will fold the mesh like this okay once you have folded the mesh like this you take a two or vicral stitch and then just keep it long from here once you have kept it long from there just tell your assistant to maintain this traction and then keep on rolling is this way once you have done that what is happening is now that same thread is gone till down over there and it is hanging till here once you have done this take one stitch here and one stitch here to keep it in place once i have done that i will keep one end long one end short because once i am inside i should know where exactly the mesh is once it is inside i will flip it like this this is my end at the pelvis i'll put one suture or one tack here at the cooper so my mesh is stabilized i have a hanging thread here right the moment i'll hold that hanging thread and pull this is what is going to happen got it so it's a very easy technique representatively you can do it and it just works up very very well so try now, to use this it works well now last question for everybody is the tar a survivor for uh, in these situations where you cannot you know close the prs complex uh tar is should be your last resort there are other methods like you know uh, peritoneal flap preservation corneal sac preservation um maintaining the peritoneal layer along with the prs tar definitely is a savior but it's the last resort 
Except for yeah, it's the last resort. I think if you're, if you should know this before you do the surgery by doing seeing the CT and other things of the patient. I don't think TAR can be the first resort to close the peritoneal PRS. Naveen, your take? If you are going to resort to TAR, means that means you have not planned the surgery properly. First of all, <laughs> so if you're planning for a TAR in the beginning itself, it makes sense. But yeah, sometimes it does require something extra. So sometimes we do use it. Retroactive dissection in home posterior sheet cannot be closed without tension. Likely needs unilateral, not bilateral data to prevent the breakdown of the posterior sheet. So here, actually, it is not a tar. It is just release of internal oblique aponeurosis below up. And Additionally, the patient of a lateral defect of the prior subcostal incisions or stoma side likely required tar, at least so on the ipsilateral side, to allow the sufficient lateral mesh overlap. So mesh overlap is the most important thing. Here we end our this particular debate. Thanks all uh, participants for uh, your great uh, encouragement and good uh, exposure to all this topic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rahul. Just a uh, uh, way you build up your process. So I, I was I told in Raipur as well. Make a team of two people. One person does the dissection. Second person does the suturing. Next time, reverse your role. So you will not have a fatigue, exhaustion. And as a team, you will build up better and you will be safer for the patient. So that is my message to all of you. I have developed that team. So do that. One is for dissection and one is for reconstruction and change the roles. Thank you. Go back tomorrow. Friends, we have two more talks. I think uh, we are as going on time, maybe another 10 minutes or so. Uh, we have Dr. Shinde, sir, giant hernias. Uh, I'm sure all of you will have your share of having giant hernias. What are the two ways out? Uh, Dr. Shinde will be addressing to that. And uh, there is one thing called tissue traction device, the facial tense, that will be done by me. It depends on your interest. So I have the honor of calling upon Dr. Professor Manikwell, sir. Rangan, sir. Sir, Manikwell, sir. I think I will handpick the senior professors. Ragmani sir, Vanga. So this is going to be on loss of domain hernia. So we have none other than uh, Dr. Shinde sir to address that issue. We'll be having separate courses for loss of domain as well as component separation. 
so that will follow after three months and based on your interest all right so chairpersons so welcome to the topic please thank you thank you respected chairpersons so this is just a brief overview of what is loss of domain and how we can manage it so in fact one of the delphi consensus had trouble to decide what do we call as loss of domain but to be absolutely short the commonest definition which most surgeons arrived at the delphi consensus was if more than 20% of abdominal contents reside outside the abdominal cavity in the hernia sac then it is loss of domain now when we look at patients like this we don't even need a ct scan to tell us that this is loss of domain there is no way that this can go back inside the abdomen and we can close the abdomen but not all cases are such obvious so how do we diagnose and manage a loss of domain what are the consequences first of all what happens in a loss of domain is that the abdominal wall becomes non compliant and therefore there is reduced intra abdominal pressure poor bowel function decreased satiety leading to obesity and its related morbidity reduced diaphragmatic excursion resulting in decreased pulmonary pressure so these patients have poor pulmonary reserve you know because there is no support from the abdominal wall alteration in spine curvature leading to backache because all the abdominal content are outside and they cannot uh, support their spine okay there is a chronic mesenteric and visceral edema and this along with obesity decreases the peritoneal cavity volume further and further so loss of domain keep on keeps on increasing and the peritoneal cavity volume goes on decreasing there is skin stretching atrophy and breakdown and obviously poor quality of life so what happens is not just the spine and the skin suffers even the lateral muscle become contracted because whenever a muscle is not given a due tension to act it will contract it will fibrose and it has been scientifically proven that the muscle dysfunction is physiological lengthwise morphological and even histologically you will find increased fibrosis so they can't be stretched easily they cannot be brought together like you can stretch them as well so the difficulties there are problem are that you will not be able to accommodate these hernia contents inside the abdomen because if you try to push them they will not go inside and the the defect is going to become wider then obviously because the defect becomes even bigger than that you will not be able to close it and sometimes a surgeon can be left standing there not knowing what to do now because the, all the intestines are out and nothing to go inside respiratory complication if you force closure the patient will develop respiratory compromise you will not be able to put him off the ventilator most dreaded complication is raised intra abdominal pressure and abdominal compartment syndrome if this patient is taken to the icu and not nobody realizes that his urine output has dropped and it is abdominal compartment within 24 hours you can lose this patient the intestines can become ischemic and gangrenous and there is nothing that can be done so this is one of the most dreaded complications if you miss loss of domain or raised intra abdominal compartment uh, abdominal compartment syndrome so what are the ways in which we can measure loss of domain the commonest one is tanaka index we also have the sabag index we have a component separation index and obviously in today's day and age when some of our young surgeons like vinayak rengin are taking help of artificial intelligence to tell us actually what is the loss of domain so tanaka published this paper almost two three decades back where he discre he just did a simple calculation of an ellipsoid where he had one was a the other was b and the other is c so this is the hernia sac and he did the same thing with the abdominal volume the uh, height from the diaphragm to the symphysis pubis that was a the transverse was b and uh, this was c and then he calculated the ellipsoid and just divided hernia sac volume by abdominal sac cavity volume and this percentage gave us the tanaka index a component separation index was also a very intelligent way of knowing that when these two edges are separated there is an index if you take this index at the upper border of the aorta you can see that there is an angle okay so this angle can be measured 
and this angle divided by 360 as the denominator. So computer, the component separation index is this angle divided by 360. Another person was above, okay, who also calculated the hernia sac volume and the abdominal sac volume. So both of them calculated the hernia sac volume and abdominal sac volume and divided it. So in Tanaka's method, if the hernia sac volume divided by the abdominal sac volume, okay, and what Sabab did was he added, he calculated the whole value. Hernia sac plus abdominal cavity is the whole volume. And only the hernia sac volume divided by the entire volume. So ultimately, if you measure it by Tanaka's index, it becomes 25, 0.25. Okay, if you do it by Sabad index, it becomes 20%. So the same hernia sac volume is 25 by Tanaka and 20 by Sabag index. So basically, hernia sac volume divided by peritoneal cavity volume, how much percentage of bowel are outside and what is the remaining cavity inside the abdominal wall? So 20% is taken as anything which is more than 20% outside the peritoneal cavity is loss of domain. And one cannot take this patient for closure just like that. Ki ho jayega. Okay. Then these patients will need some form of component separation or preoperative ways to increase the intraabdominal volume before even we touch this. And what are the predictors? First of all, morbid obesity with 10 centimeters, 10 centimeters hernia in a postpartum female patient where you can bring the edges together with hand, although the defect is 10 centimeters, she does not have loss of volume, but obesity can make it as a loss of volume because it will not allow closure. Very large defects, non-reducibility, obvious a large hernia when it is not reducing, you must suspect loss of volume, uh, loss of domain and Tanaka's index or more than 20% is loss of volume. So this loss of domain has been studied extensively and various methods have been studied, but the component Christie's index is, if the index is above 0.21, Tanaka if it is above 25, and Sabag if it is 20%. But commonly, my friends, Tanaka is the commonest index being used. CT scan centers have their own volumetry. They can do a volumetry on the CT scan and tell you how much of the hernia sac volume is outside the abdominal cavity. If the hernia sac contents is more than 20% outside, it is loss of domain, whichever is the method. So now, what do we do for this? So the problems during difficulties, you will not be able to reduce. There will be difficulty in adhesive lysis. You will not be able to close the defect. The midline will not come together. We will not be able to achieve cover of the bowel also sometimes because uh, and a good mesh overlap will be difficult. Post-operatively, the patients will land up in ventilatory support, respiratory insufficiency, paralytic ileus, pain, surgical site occurrences, pulmonary complication, abdominal compartment we've already seen. There could be rupture of posterior rectus sheath, intestinal obstruction, and obviously recurrence rates will be very high. So, this I think we've already discussed, okay? Let me tell you, just a routine closure of incisional hernia repair also increases the intra-abdominal pressure by few millimeters of Hg. So a small increase in intra-abdominal pressure is supposed to be physiologic. But when it is more than grade one raise of intra-abdominal pressure after the post-operative period, then these patients are at risk. And we don't measure all these patients routinely. So it is better to be careful rather than to risk abdominal compartment syndrome, okay? So how do we know this on the table? So what do we do is, whilst we are closing the abdomen, if the hernia is borderline, okay? And we know that we have closed it with tar, with a huge mesh. What we do is we bring the edges together with Ellis forcep, ask the anesthetist to look at the change in airway peak pressures or airway plateau pressures. So we all have workstations. So if the airway plateau pressures, peak pressures are 20 to 23, when we close the midline, if the airway peak pressures raise by 6, it's okay. From 22, if it goes to 28, it's okay. 
if this change of plateau pressure goes to 8 or 10, that means there is raised intra pressure. These patients need to be on ventilator for 24 hours. If this difference is more than 12, then these patients are at risk of intra-abdominal compartment syndrome. So in that situation, either we do something more or we do not close the midline completely. So we remove the ellis, we start our closure, we come from one end, we come from the other end, we leave the midline open, again check the airway plateau, plateau pressures. So if the difference is less than 12, then we stop there. If we try and close it completely and if the airway peak plateau pressures go above 12, that means that this pressure will need to be taken to operation theater in an emergency and the midline will have to be opened. So on table, our anesthesia workstations and our anesthesia colleagues and it is our responsibility to look for the change in pressure before we start closure during the closure and at the end of closure. Okay, so this is one way that is it is done during surgery. Then, how do we manage this loss of domain? Now we have a patient who's got 40% of contents outside and he has come to you for surgery. Patient needs that surgery very much because there's no way he's going to improve or he or she is going to improve. So we need to optimize the comorbidities. We have to advise these patients weight loss. Because weight loss is one of the main contributory factors towards loss of domain. Even weight loss is going to reduce that loss of domain by 5, 10 or 20%. Okay. Secondly, Botox is one agent that we can use and progressive pneumoperitoneum. Obviously, component separation itself increases the peritoneal cavity volume. So that is going to be our next strategy for uh, this. And... As a last resort, you've done everything. Still on table, we are not able to achieve the closure or keep the peak pressures in normal. Then sometimes we need to do visceral resection, resection of momentum. In rare cases, right hemicolectomies, even that has been done. I've done it in one of my patients just four months back. So facio tense is another thing which we may not get time to talk. But let's talk about botulinum. So botulinum is a toxin. It acts on the blocks of presynaptic release of neurotransmitter. It actually paralyzes the muscles. And this paralysis is reversible. Now this action, when we give a Botox, the dermatologists and cosmetologists use it all the time. The action starts almost immediately within a week and reaches its peak in third to fourth week. So surgeons have start, used this for a decade almost by using Botox for the lateral abdominal muscles. So what do we do? We use 300 international units, units of Botox. Minimum dose is 200 to 300. We dilute it in 120 to 150 ml of saline. Then we take three points on each side like this. Okay. On lateral anterior axillary line, mid axillary line, three points. And on the other side, three points. And then we start injecting this Botox at these three points. The commonest way to do it is under sonography control. So if you see that this under sonography probe, you can see the external oblique, the internal oblique, the transverse abdominis. So what we need to do is we need to put in a needle inside the TA, inject four to six ml here, then withdraw the needle, inject in the internal oblique, then withdraw into the needle, inject in the external oblique. This we do at one, two, three, and four points, maybe six points, okay, on one side. So this 300 cc's that we have prepared in the saline, okay, this we have already prepared. So we use 150 cc's on one side and 150 cc's on other side. So six sides, sides on one side, one, two, three, into three muscles, okay. And the same thing we do on the other side and we use it actually live. The sonologist comes and helps us. We actually look at the muscles, put in the needle, start from the transverse abdominis, internal oblique, external oblique and inject Botox inside the operation theater. The patient does not need any anesthesia. The patient is awake. At the most, a little tiny local prick. Botox has got the, one of the properties of Botox is producing some amount of analgesia. So patient is admitted for 12 hours for observation. 
And once this is done, then the patient is sent home with an abdominal corset because slowly over a period of time, the patient is going to develop relaxation of the abdominal wall because the abdominal muscles are going to get paralyzed. So this is how the patient then looks afterwards that the all the abdominal muscles are paralyzed, the abdominal hangs down, the patients have difficulty in breathing. So whenever we see these patients for loss of domain, the planning starts in the OPD on day one. The patient goes home with nutrition advice, dietary advice, exercise advice, and respiratory spirometer. Because after Botox, these patients will need respiratory exercises, using of corset for support, and DVT prophylaxis. And they need to be mobile all the time, and they need to come for follow-up every week. Once that is done, then sometimes these patients may not do just with Botox. Okay, so they will need many times a procedure much more than them. You can see that this was a huge hernia and even the lateral muscles were contracted here. And therefore, we had to give this Botox. So once we give the Botox, the muscles actually stretch. And after three to four weeks, when we do a repeat CT scan, what we can see is that part of the hernia has gone inside. The hernia of sac volume has reduced. This defect size has reduced. And actually the muscles become thinner. The CT scans can actually give us the dimensions of each muscle in millimeters that from 12, it has come to eight kind of thing. So once that is done, sometimes if the loss of domain is more than 40, 50 or 60, then we also need to do pneumoperitoneum. Now, mind you, progressive pneumoperitoneum can be used as a procedure as a stand alone when Botox is not available when Botox cannot be afforded by a patient because Botox costs anywhere from 50 to 60,000 rupees because it's 300 international units. So this procedure was introduced almost 60 years ago and it just means progressive introduction of air into the perineal cavity. And this also elongates the muscles, improves the tolerance to raised IIP. And this was the method being used for more than four decades now. So how this can be done is you can do it by just percutaneous technique, by doing it under sonography, asking your radiologist to put in a percutaneous, either veno, venoclath or your CVP line or even a dialysis catheter. But what surgeons generally do is we do a diagnostic laparoscopy and then put in a catheter, maybe a simple Rides tube also. And then at that time, obviously when we are doing a laparoscopy, there is a general anesthesia. So we introduce air, not CO2 because CO2 is going to not remain there. So although we use CO2 for laparoscopy, after desufflation, we again instill air. Then we have to call the patient every day for its installation of 800 to 1500 cc's of the air. The patient comes walking to the hospital and the end point is discomfort. Again, during this time, the air can start going into the uh, hernia sac volume. So you have to instruct the patient to use the corset properly and DVT prophylaxis has to be given. Respiratory exercises are must. The duration is for 10 to 14 days. So we put in a scope from here and then put in a rise tube. And then once we start instilling the air, this is the end result of the patient when the patient is taken for surgery. So again, you can see this change. Now, not all patients will have this kind of a magical change. Let me tell you that most of the times, the air also is there and the intestines are also there. So to achieve this result, it needs cooperation of the patient and proper use of a corset also. So what happens on the table is there's a huge air there. And then we have to take our incisions. We have to plan them properly. And once we start taking this incision, obviously, we, are, we have planned this patient for a component separation as well. And sometimes... As I said, the bowel needs to be prepared because in case if we need to do, we would already have taken consent for visceral resection also. So I'm not going to show the entire video, but this is how the abdomen becomes flat. Intraoperative strategies. We can't rely on component separation. We have to preserve the entire sac for cover. Okay, so peritoneal sac has to be covered. We have to develop peritoneal flaps. We have to plan for component separation, either an anterior and posterior one either one of them, visceral resection and posterior rectal sheath closure also. Sometimes if the sac is all gone in adhesions or a previous mesh, then we have to have a 
vicryl or uh, dual mesh ready. Okay, here you can see that we've used a vicryl mesh because there was no posterior rectus sheet left there. And obviously the skin closure, abdominoplasty, we sometimes use ICG also to see the skin flap color. And we definitely can take help of a plastic surgeon to close this because this kind of an abdomen closure can develop necrosis at these ends. And these patients can then have SSIs and then obviously the mesh is much below, but these patients can then of course need back dressings and all. So post-operatively, respiratory management, thromboprophylaxis, and if at all, if we have today in India, patiotense was introduced by Dr. Ramana, and it's a new concept based on the difficulty in closing, basically used for retraction of abdominal wall in an open abdomen edges, and this can stretch the abdominal muscles right on the table when the patient is giving anesthesia, the facial tense is applied for 30 minutes and this kind of a large defect, the edges can be stretched by using this machine and the closure can be done right away. So I think that's the last slide of my talk. So thanks for a patient listening and if there are any questions, we can take. Oh, this is an excellent uh... <laughs> This is an excellent presentation of the very difficult topic. Uh, how do you, I mean, uh, do we have to repeat the Botox? Uh, how often we have to repeat it? And another one is uh, in uh, pediatric surgery, there is a entry wall, uh, defective formation of the entry wall. Uh, how is the physiologically, is there any similarities between the this condition and the... In? Uh, pedi in pediatric surgical... Pediatric, surgical the fellowship and... Uh, yeah, and... Uh, yeah. Anterior abdominal wall defects, and at the time, what are the physical, physiological uh, changes you encounter? And uh, another one is how do you uh, prepare the cases, and how many number of cases you encountered this? See, loss of domain and these kind of cases are not everyday occurrence. We do moderate size hernias and large hernias day in and day out. But when we start doing this as a specialized center, then we do get patients of about three or four patients per year, sometimes two. Okay. Obviously, there could be very large loss of domains where the patient has got multiple comorbidities, patients are above 60. There, what there is a concept called as end stage hernia. There are some hernias which cannot be treated without endangering the patient's life. So we cannot treat every loss of domain, we cannot treat every patient. But all those patients whose comorbidities can be controlled, who can be safely returned to their normal quality of life, we would attempt this. The second question is Botox is generally not repeated. There's no harm in repeating Botox, but it can, it, one has to wait for eight weeks. And once the initial effect is gone, then it is like using a new drug, you know. So whatever the effect that happens is between the first two and four weeks. So we have to use that window period to close the abdomen. Now, these patients will also have less pain because of Botox. And after that, then pneumoperitoneum can be used in not all cases. Sometimes if the loss of domain is about 30%, we can just use Botox. If it is 80%, then Botox plus PPP plus whatever. Sir, Thanks. sir one question. Uh, okay. Okay. Dr. Pramod's flight is uh, scheduled and Dr. Rahul is having palpitations there. So. Sir, <laughs> one last question. Yeah. Sir, in edema and paralytic ileus scenario, uh, what is your take on use of so-called pagoda's bag and zipper laparostomy? Have you used pagoda's bag and lip zipper laparostomy and intraoperative bowel decompression, something like savage sucker? Have you resorted to these things, sir? In paralytic ileus. Yeah, but that that is definitely has been used in the past, but to do it with hernia patients because the mesh is going to be there. So we would rather not use in a, if we are going to do it in a post-op patient who develops compartment syndrome and the mesh is there, the patient needs to be opened and the mesh needs to be divided or removed and the patient needs to be converted to open abdomen laparostomy with a wound back or whatever. Because survival of the patient is important, the hernia repair can be done later on. 
but most of the times even opening the abdominal wall and anterior rectal sheath leaving the mesh intact and putting a wound back can make these patients survive and the defect that remains can be repaired later on so that is in fact laparoscopy intraoperative bowel decompression sir. something along the lines of uh, decompress preparing the bowel through appendicular stump uh, are we, are the, is that only right? only problem is contamination of the bowel or the mesh otherwise decompression of bowel is one of the known methods to decompress to deal with abdominal compartment syndrome so acceptable in a non hernia situation thank you sir thank you, thank thank you very you. much thank you so much sir one more. I will request Balam Morgan to come up to the stage, whom we missed in the morning. Bala, are you here? Oh, Tirumu Veliliyar Garga. Vanga Bala. So I think I will not uh, touch or uh, take much time. So I am going to touch upon something very unique, uh, which we have some experience in uh, sharing with you. I think Deepak was there, uh, Kumaran was there when we did it the first time at Chennai. And few, I think Kannan sir was there and a uh, few of the surgeons could come make it there because that happened to be HSI somewhere in Ahmedabad or something. So many could not make it. Deepak had to abort something and fly, take a special flight to come for this. So I take blessings from my teacher. Once again, I reiterate, this is our baby. So baby is just on the process of making. So we want everyone to be part of us. It's our show. Take blessings from my teacher. The man who introduced the concept of AWRC to India, of course, many helped to grow. None other than uh, Dr. Ramana Balasubramanian, who has definitely, I would say, the world of hernia has been revolutionized in India. And India is now placed in a global platform where people look upon our publications and data. So I will take jump into the directly topic. W3 is defect, which is more than 10 centimeters. I, evaluation is as good as normal evaluation, clinical, imaging. Imaging in our department, we follow only CT, dynamic CT, where we have robust reporting systems. Logistics. When you are doing a large hernia, you need to have your anesthesiologist, your cardiac team, your critical care team. These follow the multidisciplinary team. They We take minimum three to four months to pre-optimize these patients uh, whenever we are taking these type of operations. Logistics, we have gadgets. Secondly, mesh a minimum of 55-50 mesh. Minimum of two or three is required. Suture materials, and you should have the best of the instruments. Ramana sir used to say transplantation box. So that has the best of the gadgets, most of the hospitals. But of course, I have my own sets. Every surgeon has their own sets. And then you should have somebody who's robust. Your energy level should be fine. Your core strength should be fine. These surgeries take easily four or five hours of your time and you have to be robust. You cannot become tired. So there are enough evidences here. With the permission, I can quote Dr. Prem, Dr. Christopher, who spent at least, uh, I don't know, others do spend uh, off the record. These two people I can quote on the record. Uh, I'm sure Naveen cycles 40 kilometers a day. Uh, Prem spends two hours in the gym five days a week. Christopher inspires me every day with Facebook message. I don't know, somehow he posts only 10 seconds, but it looks uh, very uh, stimulating. So your fitness matters. Anesthesia is always general anesthesia with epidural supplementation. Now we move on to the other things, one after the other. This is the glimpse of the gadget which I'm going to show. It does not look, uh, don't worry, it looks complex. The sutures are taken from this side and connected to this side. That much you uh, take a message now, then we will take it further. And this is a case I'm uh, going to show. So this big was the defect. Uh, I do not have a stand-up video. This is a case of CA pancreas, which leaked in the post-operative phase. And then patient ended up uh, being in the hospital for almost three months. And this patient, the problem is every time she sits up in the chair, the weight was pushing and she became respiratory distressed. That's how she landed up with me. 
seven years post whipple she was like almost a hernia cripple now this is the imaging uh, this is happened to be a pet imaging because the whole body uh, thing where you can see uh, this much is the defect you can see there is nothing from end to end the entire thing is floating out again we have now started doing lateral position ct scans patient in valsalva ct scans you can see this being you can see the entire thing is staying out with the thin sac now we move on to the positioning can I have a hand mic please so this thin is the sac so very meticulously you have and uh, if you could see we are preserving the sac as much only the skin is entered here one should be able to uh, preserve the sac go slow scissors holding this way is much easier i am sure the seniors will agree to hold the scissors like that but this helps because this minimizes the peritoneal injury so you can see very carefully this in fact was helped by dr amala sir and myself can see hands of deepak at some time or other but then principally done by our team you can see the sac is so well mobilizable i am sure all of you will agree next time even when you are doing a small hernia try mobilizing the sac sac is the savior sac helps you to bridge as much as possible defect nowadays sac you can very slowly take time to do having scissors in this direction not the conventional direction because it stays close to the abdominal wall this is totally a extra peritoneal dissection in your case very easily the laparoscopic ventral tap that is the plane what we are talking about but see there is definitely it is not difficult at all if you would like to see that go to your surgical oncology department watch one peritonectomy site reduction in one case you will learn on the nuances for them the advantage is the peritoneum is thick for us the advantage is peritoneum is thin so any surgical oncologist will be glad to show their um, bravo of doing a peritonectomy spend time with them two cases then you get to know you can see very meticulously the peritoneum is separated from the muscle this is on the diaphragmatic side where every layer you fairly see you don't have any geometry in the abdomen you have from the xiphoid to the pubic symphysis but your upper dome of the diaphragm is at least 10 cm 10 cm above the xiphoid and your lower bone dome of the pelvic diaphragm is 10 cm below the pubic symphysis and then it is okay to have here and there peritoneal damage or peritoneal tear but only thing is you meticulously suture if you could see the suturing is done on the sides if you do lateral to lateral it tears up can you see that the suture is taken along the edges not across the edges so this way the peritoneum is a very flimsy layer and you can effectively suture it without much see generally like a purse string also is sufficient peritoneum is very very flexible you can take a wide purse string and suture it up that is also is fine but ensure we have a robust peritoneal closure see this is the mesh this is what is 50 by 50 please understand we have two sides of mesh the one which is yielding should be vertically from above down one which is less yielding should go side to side so please ensure that you can see a 50 by 50 it is like our granny's uh, purse you know all of that that surkupai we have something like that the process now you can see the entire thing is taken into the abdomen this is a bmi of 27 patients so if you have a higher bmi you may recur even larger mesh so the end of extra peritoneal mobilization is up till the diaphragmatic tendon or the aortic ivc hiatus down you go up till the bladder sides you go up till the lateral border of the psoas that is how you mobilize now that we have placed the mesh we keep a wet pad so that we prepare the facial traction you can see the defect how much we are having and then you don't need to dissect the tissues tissue plane between the anterior sheath and the subcutaneous plane you just see we have safeguarded the placement of mesh has to be done prior 
the tissue traction is done afterwards. So mesh, everything what is inside the abdomen gets completed. This is a fairly, anybody who is capable of doing a good laparotomy should be very easily be able to replicate. No complex ETFs, no complex accesses, no complex releases are required. It is pure and pure extra peritoneal dissection. But then it gives you a lot of confidence to move to a open tar which Dr. Shinde and others were sh showing. See now that we are just releasing the fascia, you don't go beyond the lateral border of the rectus sheath. Up till that level you dissect the subcutaneous plane. That's about 5 to 7 centimeters maximum. But then all through retain the sac should in case you have difficulty in closing. So now that we mobilize, keep watching. You use again a transverse suture. You don't do a horizontal suture. In a moment you will see what I mean. From bone to bone, you can see the anterior sheath cleared of the subcutaneous tissue. I will save some time here. So you can see the stitches being taken. So if you could see through and through, anterior rectus sheath alone, one centimeter from the fusion line, other one centimeter from the linea alba, if it is existent, if not one centimeter from the possible edge. Don't go close to the tip. Don't go into the muscle. If you could see, can you see that? So it should be one centimeter across. We have taken eight plus eight stitches on either sides. This is the assembly. This is like our Thompson retractor. All of you would have heard a Thompson retractor. This becomes very easy, even though still better than Thompson. So this gets easily attachable with any standard theater side railing. You can see this is the first A clamp. We have very easy mechanism. This is the A bar. Then comes the B bar in a moment. So tighten it at every step because it is going to give you almost 18 kilos of traction. So you need to have a very robust sidebar. The sidebars have to be tightened before using this because the entire weight is going to go on it. This is the bar B. See bar B will helps you to reach about two and a foot above the sidewards. If you are using a BMI of more than 35, then you should have bar C, which has higher height. So this is very easily assemblable. So the company team comes and helps you if in case these are all purely physical things. Once you learn to do, it is very easy to do it. So that's where you get it assembled. And every step is so robust. This instrument is constructed at no point it should be relaxing or losing its tensile strength. So then goes the feeding clamp. It's like typical Thompson retractor. This is the assembly which is going to be positioned at the midpoint of the potential closure defect. So this is where it goes. It takes time for you to adjust. It's not at all difficult. So once you do it, anybody can easily do it. So this is the ball and socket joint. All of you will know. So this is the holder number one. That is bar A, bar B, bar C. We'll use bar A and bar B here. This is the holder or the ball and socket. Usually 15 centimeter from the uppermost edge of the defect, it is placed. And then this is the socket, otherwise called the equipment number three, where you have the connection and the weight distribution goes. You have the socket and this can be retracted. So you gently retract, open the socket. It's all like our hip joint only. So open the socket, loosen it up nicely and take the device into the socket and then as easy as that. There ends it. That's all you have assembled it. Once it is done, then you have the the tissue traction tray. That is the equipment number three, device number three. So bar device, fixation device number one and two, ball and socket is the number three. Now we go to the fixation tray. It will be, so that's, that's freely mobile. It's no, comp, it's very simple telescopic device. 
no big great technology only thing you ensure there is no friction and the height is adjusted well and it's very easy to adjust at any point of time once again i am ensuring 15 cm is the lowermost thing you titrate it and then once this is done now you open the traction tray this is a traction tray everything comes in a pre sterilized thing all this uh, this device alone is single use whatever device which you have been using earlier are all reusable one this is made of acrylic this is a single use one again it is very easy very very simple to use we use number 1 vehicle probably your full length vehicle can give you only two stitches across so you yield minimum of 40 cm length from the device to the hemostats so now that it is so easy pull the red knob out and the tray is connected all right so now i have used a eight system device you can have 12 system device you have 16 system device depending on the length of your defect so this was a 17 cm defect whatever we have used so we can see one after the other Already I have made the sutures in place. Now the job becomes very simple. I need, see the left side of the instrument should have the right sutures coming in. Right of the instrument should have the left of the sutures coming in, facial sutures. Right? At no point of time, this is a very freely mobile thing. And this can be used either up or down. There is no fixed side that one thing should go cranial, one should go caudal. But then the defect positioning should be at the midpoint. So now that we are starting with the hemostat, you always start from upper, lower, upper second, lower second, third one, fourth one like that. You don't go from one end. So that you can see the first one, we have crisscrossed. It is as simple. It's only the device which is open and lock the device and go around as simple. This is no rocket science at all. Anybody, any one of you can easily understand. It locks it. Once the thread is gone around and it locks it. Once again, this is not needed, but in our case, we want to be extra safe. So we use the hemostat there. So like that, once this right side is done, the same thing on the left side needs to be done. So there is no real tension which is required. At snug fitting device is what is required. So I will run through this so that we can save some time. So the same thing is repeated till the end. So all these devices are done. Now that the devices, all the devices are fixed, we are going to for the tissue traction. We normally stay it from eight kilos. Eight kilos traction, hold it for seven to eight minutes. Each traction goes above two, 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 two kilos up. Normally, 18 kilos is the maximum, but for this patient, we limited only to 16 kilos. We started from 8 kilos. So, the entire traction time takes 40 to 50 minutes time. Each traction is for 10 minutes at the gradation of 2 kilos up per traction. Now, what happens is, after you assemble from below up and above down to the midline, there will be some laxity of the other suture. So, before going to the traction, it is like guitar wire. People who know the stringed instruments will understand what I'm telling to so All the wires should be of equal tension, something like that. So the entire thing is appropriately done. Now the process of traction is going to begin. So the traction is being started. The tightening of the weight. Do you have a calibration of the weight, how much it is mentioned. Let me try and show after some time. So this starts the process. The first initial part is not at all a struggle. So it is only 8 kilos. It's no tension at all. Then you need some robust assistance. The main thing is the sustenance of 2 kilos increase increment every 10 minutes is the most important principle behind this. What really happens is microscopic tissue fracture happens from the external oblique lateral at every level. If you do at this speed, there is no tear of sheet. If you are going to go 4 kilos or 8 kilos, 
it gets torn and you end up having trouble. So, 2 kilos increment every 8 to 10 minutes in a sequence. So, you hold it. Somebody needs to keep a time. There is a bar chart how to keep time. So, hold it, hold it, hold it. If you could carefully observe, the device defect is so big now. As you come to the end, you know how much wonder this instrument has done for you. You need to be little strong. You may need to continue that traction by yourself. So this is complete, oh, sorry. This is the completed thing. I've removed the devices. Now you see there is no tension at the defect and we have started suturing. I think I will remove this. Now that we have started closing, we have 8 centimeters on each side. This sack has also helped. And from now on, it is a fairly standard closure. And then this is the post-operative six months follow-up. I'm sorry, four months follow-up for this patient who has landed up with that big defect. So the message is very loud and clear. People who are comfortable with open operation can do this. You need to be meticulous. Everything has to be extra peritoneal. At this point of time, care should be taken. You do not have bowel injury or entrotomy. Care should be taken. The dissection is complete. Preservation of peritoneum is very important. And once you are done, tissue traction device easily in, uh, I think in whatever two cases we did, we did 17 centimeters and 15 centimeters, both of them. But in India, so far about 15 or 16 cases have been done. The largest is 24 centimeters we have done so far. So at this point of time, the problems which we have faced, at least in one of my patients, patient had respiratory, mild respiratory distress in the first two days. This lady did not have any distress, but across the country of the 16, 17 patients which have been done so far, we have had report of three patients going in for temporary non-invasive assistance of ventilation, which has recovered in the post-op. But principally, please understand, they have other comorbidities. It doesn't look like it was because of this gadget. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is one device which is very promising. I am sure will be of much benefit without any great technical skill which is demanding, a defect of 17-18 centimeters can be easily brought up to the midline without any of the dissection. The advantage is you keep all the planes intact. If you, this device, the failures are very rare, but even this failure is there, you have not violated any of the anatomical planes. You have not separated any component. You have not violated the retrorectus plane and entirety the mesh is sublate. So that is the most optimal position where you can do. You don't need a composite mesh. You need a large mesh, but entire thing is covered extra peritoneally. I think, thank you for your attention. Oh, how much they charge for the device? Sir, at this point, sir, that uh, uh, carrier is the one which is costed, sir. It's about 1.9 lakhs right now, sir. The bar and other things the company people are giving, sir. Uh, we, do, we don't charge anything for the bar. The carrier is one use, sir. After that, what happens is they say there is microscopic fracture in the carrier also. So they don't advise. Actually, we tried using for the second thing. It broke in. It shattered in a few minutes, sir. It cannot hold that 18 kilos weight uh, for the carrier. So it is single use carrier. Carrier is around, built around 1.9 lakhs, sir. That is the only cost. How long is the... Uh, you give traction, you say, every 8 minutes, right? Sir, every 2 kilos increment, 8 minutes, sir. So, it oh. takes 10 minutes per 2 kilos, sir. So, it takes 40 to 50 minutes for us to complete from 8 to 16 kilos, sir. Thank you. Any other questions from the floor? Oh. Sir, at this point, at this at this point, we have not faced any tear, sir. We have, I have directly personally two case experience. I think both of us, Prem and Deepak, we had a course at Kolkata. We saw Todd Henicode himself and Ramana himself operate. Sir, we have not faced that, sir. But if you are ex 
in a hurry to do that there will be tissue tears sir this itself sir they give time 8 minutes itself is a slow mode people can have tried 4 minutes also but 8 minutes is the approved thing by the companies uh, which uh, surgical has got in uh, here in chennai this uh... sir at this point we have experimental approval for this instrument sir the european fda has approved us fda is yet to approve hmm. but then in india we have we have to enroll our center in the trial it is in the final stages of approval sir but if you are going to sign up because how we got consent was we took approval from the ethics, ethics committee of the hospital but this does not have any internal implants sir so we don't have much of a problem if something is biological and goes into the body then we have very robust thing but i think in a month or so it will be fully approved sir it is already approved for selling i don't understand why it is approved for selling and medical approval is still finally pending they have asked for some additional information the same thing he was asking what is the rate of tear they said when they said no tear government is unwilling to accept so they have asked to produce animal experiment for about 60 animals i think it is already submitted so it's only matter of time it's surprising last question yes sir uh, so, so much of stretching nothing happens to neurovascular bundle or no, sir, flap no, necrosis we, we, they have done studies the nerve traction does not uh, affect at all sir because sir, the nerve runs between the external oblique and the sorry internal oblique and the transverse abdominis nothing happens at that level at all sir the traction happens only in the anterior sheath so nothing nerves does not have any problems sir closure thank you chair persons for your time uh to with this we come to the end of the day because there's another wedding reception happening in this very hall this evening so we promised them we will give them the hall at 4 we are already running late by about 25 minutes i think it's only fair we end the show thank you all for coming along thank you the industry sponsors especially who helped us conduct this course without any flaws and i appreciate the help and uh, cooperation which we received from the chennai hernia society and the ars art surgical community thank you all